Brett Fitzpatrick, The Dark Galaxy Series Book 1 Galaxy Dog A book stream audiobook Narrated by David McCran Chapter 1 Captain Batcher, a tall, slim woman with light brown skin and her hair in dreads, was standing on the stage with the eyes of the whole room on her. What idiot ordered an assault on this ball of ice? The captain grumbled. She was pointing at a large holographic projection of their objective, a moon orbiting a planet called Phaeton 7. The auditorium was at the heart of the spaceship, easy for the command crew to reach from the upper decks, and equally easy for the lower ranks to get from the bowels of the ship. The briefing chamber was large and tall, and there was ample room to fit the entire crew inside. The room was designed as an amphitheatre, with the holograms of the target centre stage and semicircular rows of surprisingly comfortable seating. The spaceship was coasting through hyperspace, with all systems on full autonomous, so there was no reason for anyone to be anywhere else. The ship's computer would alert them if any threat was detected along their route. There were a couple of hundred humans in the room, of all shapes, sizes, colours and creeds. Nave, a muscular young man with straight hair and epicanthic folds, was sitting unobtrusively at the back of the ranks of seating with the other slugs. The infantry were called slugs because their units, even a swift grav drone with a top speed of a couple hundred miles an hour, tended to be the slowest things in any tactical arena. Nave watched as the leader of ground operations stood up from the first semicircle of seats, attracting the captain's attention. There seems only to be one structure on the entire moon, he said, atop the mountain here. Yes, the captain agreed but there are defensive installations dotted around the nearby surface. There are atmospheric units and space defences too. It won't be an easy mission. Surprise is the key. As always, the captain nodded in agreement. We have to be inserting dropships before they know what's hit them. What can we expect on the ground? One of the dropship captains asked. Don't know exactly, the captain replied. It looks like some kind of experimental research facility. So defences could be virtually non-existent or impossibly heavy, depending on whether they're developing a new kind of spoon or if they are developing some top-secret superweapon. What I love about your briefings, Captain, is how helpful and information-rich they are, the dropship commander said. You're welcome, the captain growled, and she went on to start talking about some other important aspect of the mission, but Knave didn't hear her. Henrik, another slug, and a gaunt white man in his middle years with salt and pepper hair, turned to him, whispered in his ear, making it difficult to hear what the bigwigs were saying. This is such bullshit, he said. What do you mean? Knave whispered back, intrigued despite himself. Nobody knows why the buzzers do what they do. They could be on this moon for some important strategic goal, or they might like R&R &R on ice moons. We don't know. So? So this mission doesn't really have an objective. They sent us out here to try and take the buzzers and their mountain and they'll see if they defend it or let us have it. If the buzzers defend it, they'll know the evil alien mechanisms think it's important. So we're bait. More like we've been sent to poke a hive of dangerous aliens with a sharp stick to see how sleepy it is. Henrik's attention was drawn away by the discussion going on at the centre of the room. The captain was getting to the meat of her presentation. The buzzers are concentrated at this feature, she said. She walked up so close to the hologram of the moon that it engulfed one of her shoulders. A ghostly impression of her shoulder could be seen through the holographic surface of the moon. She raised her arm and used a laser pointer to highlight a section of the moon's surface. The moon then dissolved, leaving just this tiny chunk behind. The chunk enlarged to show a section of crust centred around some kind of tall, craggy mountain. Mount Sabretooth, the captain said, and the buzzer's structures get real numerous here in the foothills. Okay, a voice from the seating, 
Knave didn't see who or recognise the voice. So what's the mission? Easy, said the captain. While the bulk of Tarazat forces drop right down their throats here, she pointed at the foothills. We'll drop a bunch of slugs way out here. She pointed vaguely at an area away from the mountain, to make sure they get some warning of reinforcements. That's it. Easy, Henrik said. Nothing's ever easy. I don't know, Knave said. It looks like they're planning for us to be pretty much a sideshow. Henrik turned to him, a smile on his face. It's just because they don't think our crappy equipment will last ten minutes as part of the main assault, he said. And besides, sideshows have a way of turning into the main event. It's being so cheerful that keeps us going, Knave said. As soon as this briefing wraps up, Henrik said, we should get down to the racks and spend some time with our drones. Make sure none of them have rusted away. They get the standard checks, Knave protested weakly. Standard checks aren't worth shit, Henrik said. All they do is a tight beam laser handshake to see if the drone is going to wake up when we need it to. I'm talking about pulling them apart and putting them back together, make sure nothing has gone to shit. But I've got 20 drones in my pack. It's your call, but I'm going down to the racks. I'll call round, Knave said. We can go down to the racks together. Smart boy, Henrik said. Knave was walking the corridors of the huge ship on the way to pick up Henrik and head down to the drone hangar. He should really have been jogging. He was falling behind on his exercise quota, but he didn't care, and he was a health nut in relation to Henrik. Henrik could spend days at a time in his quarters without moving his skinny old carcass further than the drinks dispenser. There was nobody to see if he was keeping up with his exercise anyway, or care. The Galaxy-class drone transport called Galaxy Dog was so huge and had so few crew that it may as well have been deserted. Knave was pretty much alone, walking along the empty corridors. He passed people in the corridors from time to time, but they usually didn't even bother to greet a lowly slug. It was a long walk from Knave's berth to Henrik's, and Knave was in no hurry. He decided to take the scenic route, to see where his feet took him. After a few minutes, he found himself in the nose of the carrier, walking towards the huge forward viewport. The blast cover was supposed to be kept shut, but, of course, it had been left open in defiance of Navy regulations. If anything gets close enough that we need the blast covers, we're already toast, Henrik had explained once. Knave didn't argue, even though he suspected Henrik was entirely wrong. He just liked being able to wander along the corridors to the nose and stare out at where they were going. Knave walked right up and stood right in the centre of the viewport, arms crossed behind his back, legs slightly akimbo. Right here, right now, watching the stars slide by as he raced towards the objective, he couldn't help thinking he was heading towards something special, glory, fortune, destiny. A hand fell on his shoulder. Knave span round and saw Henrik. I thought I'd find you here, he said, but where you should be is the racks. The racks were huge. All the drones and pilot units were stored there, and the Galaxy Dog held thousands. They ranged from huge orbital superiority fighters down to the lowliest two-legged ground unit, the real slugs. It was down in these lowest levels of the racks that Henrik and Knave were standing. They were in an aisle between hulking war machines, racked nose to tail, and one on top of another. The platform they were standing on had a grav engine to allow it to glide between the metal warrior robots and was plied with heavy-duty plastic and metal canisters of tools. A crab-like repair droid was going through the tools, sorting them into the most logical arrangement for general drone maintenance. Henrik brought the platform to a gliding stop alongside the nose of one of his drones. You go over my drones with me, he said, and I'll give you a hand with yours. It always helps to have two pairs of eyes down in here. Deal, Knave said. 
Henrik slowly brought the platform into contact with the side of his first drone and dropped the safety handrail on that side of the platform down into a recess in the floor. Henrik grabbed a marker and unceremoniously scrawled a big X on the drone's access hatch. Knave raised an eyebrow. They'll need repainting after this anyway, Henrik said, and I don't want to check any of these things twice. Have you ever seen a buzzer? Knave asked. A couple of times, Henrik said. Dead ones, or soon to be dead. Though they're just robots. It's not like they're really alive. Not like an organic. That sort of talk isn't cool, Henrik, Knave said quietly and simply. What? Henrik said. Oh, look, what I mean is... Henrik stopped to think, putting his hand on top of the repair droid. He was rewarded with a friendly beep from the little machine. Sure, our robots are alive, the ones with AI anyway. It's just, he went on, they, the buzzers, aren't like our robots. Even the smartest of our AI have emotions, sort of, if you know what I mean, or goals or values or something. I don't know, but I looked into the face of a buzzer not long for this world, and it was blank. I could feel its intelligence, its malevolence, but nothing human. It was more like a zombie than something living, but it was no simple machine either. Did it say anything? Knave asked. Not a word. That's what I'm talking about. Didn't yell, didn't beg, nothing. And that buzzing. I heard it. It was right at the edge of perception, like I could feel it on my skin rather than hear it. It was creepy. Henrik paused for a second. What are you doing here anyway? he asked after a moment. What do you mean? You aren't like most of the rest of us slugs, he said. You've got brains, book learning. No common sense, unfortunately, but lots of book learning. And you talk like a professor. Er, uh, thanks? It's not exactly a compliment. Chapter 2 Altea was entering the drifter system, and it never failed to take her breath away. The most obvious feature, of course, was the light sail. It had been visible for hours as she approached a unique landmark within the galaxy. The sail was an enormous self-supporting artificial construct, the product of megascale astro-engineering. It was positioned next to the star, Drifter Prime, at a position chosen by its architects to balance gravitational attraction towards the star and radiation pressure away from the star. This made the radiation pressure of the star asymmetrical, and this created thrust. The star was essentially tethered to the sail, being pulled along on its own solar wind. The thrust and acceleration was very slight, but the star's fuel was enough for billions of years. Drifter Prime had been travelling for a very long time indeed. That wasn't all, though. There was an entirely artificial planet in orbit, which had been dragged along by its parent star, constructed to be carried through the galaxy forever, or even journey between galaxies. The entire artificial planet could be thought of as a kind of passenger compartment in a galactic-scale vehicle, the Drifter, but a passenger compartment that could carry billions of passengers. Altea's transport, a small science ship called Panotto 5, dove towards the artificial planet, which grew to fill her forward view screen. The government of Tarazet was doing its best to learn about the entire site, but their efforts were focused on one single location. This area being investigated by the science ministry was the largest feature of the planet's surface, the rift. It was a kind of canyon that was cut two kilometres deep into the planet's mechanical crust. Panotto 5 descended on Gravitix towards a complex of buildings, the grey of the human architecture standing out against the bronze of drifter architecture. From a distance, the human buildings looked like nothing more than grey fungus on the face of a bronze sculpture. Panotto 5 was directed to a landing pad jutting from the side of one of the larger human structures and touched down. 
Through the viewports, Altea could see that Brax, her second in command, had come out to meet her. Brax was an AI encased in a humanoid body. Hi there, Brax, Altea yelled as she descended the ramp of Panotto 5. What's been happening here while I've been away? Haven't you been reading my reports? Brax said. His face didn't have as many muscles as a human's, but he was unmistakably smiling, teasing her. I like it when you give me an executive summary, Altea said. I like the sound of your voice. Then come with me, Brax said, and we'll do some show and tell. Brax and Altea wandered through the Science Ministry installation and then out into the tunnels below the surface of the artificial planet. They had to pause briefly for Altea to put on an environment suit. The tunnels were not pressurised and there was no breathable atmosphere, but Brax didn't stop talking. The tunnels they were walking through came from a median period, according to current theories, and represented what Altea considered the pinnacle of drifter culture. We have found more evidence that this planet was a holy site, Brax said. I'm increasingly of the opinion that the drifters used it as a centre of pilgrimage and worship. Usually it is the pilgrims who journey, Altea mused, not the temple they visit. And the scale of it! An entire planet as a holy site? It is mind-boggling. The lighting in the corridors was human, switching on as they approached and switching off again as they passed on to the next area, where Brax wanted to do a show and tell. We believe this area, Brax pointed, is an attempt to repair damage. Notice the lack of hieroglyphs. There are some, though, Altea mused. Yes, Brax allowed but all the other surfaces here are covered with them. There must be some reason that this area is smoother. Brax took her to another area, happily explaining all the newest developments as he led the way. I know you are very interested in the drifter language, he said. Languages, Altea corrected. Brax nodded. He knew Altea suspected that the hieroglyphs carved everywhere represented more than one language. The same symbols, she thought, had very different meanings depending on the language using them, and the languages were probably all jumbled up together. A drifter would be able to recognise immediately which language was being used. The way she could distinguish between Trader, Tarazine and Banathan, even though they used essentially the same set of symbols. I have found an ancient symbol, Brax said. Another of the basic root symbols. That's wonderful! Altea couldn't keep excitement from her voice. Could be another breakthrough! We can only hope. They reached the point in the corridor where the new symbol had been discovered. Altea bent to examine it. It's in a dark corner, she said. Brax projected a large hologram of the area of the wall they were standing beside from a projector on his chest. The robot turned the projection and zoomed in on the symbol they were interested in. Altea reached out to touch the hologram version of the symbol, though, of course, there was nothing physical beneath her fingertips, just the immaterial surface of the hologram. She traced the edges of the symbol, thinking about why that symbol had been chosen to sit on this innocuous-looking patch of wall. Interesting, she said. The closer to the root they are, the less abstract they are. The symbol looked like waves, and she had the idea of flow, though she was aware this was just a subjective notion that had occurred to her human mind, and might not have anything remotely in common with the life of the drifters. Fascinating, isn't it? the robot mumbled. Altea went over to the patch of wall, bending it to the waist to examine the actual physical symbol in its context. The robot didn't take its eyes off the hologram in front of it. I wonder what these conduits in here were for, Altea said, pointing at some structure in the wall of the tunnel. We know so little about their technology. They could be for power, life support, or, or delicious snacks for all I know. 
There were three heavy conduits right next to the symbol. Flow, she mumbled to herself. Altea stared at the conduits and at the symbol. The conduits were dead, serving no purpose. Most of the planet's systems were inert, with only maintenance online. But whether they were in operation at the moment or not, there would be a certain direction to their flow. She stood back and tried to trace the flow with her mind. Then she saw it. After years of her life spent studying this long-dead language, she saw it. She understood. She turned to Brax, who was still examining the holographic enlargement of the symbol. Brax, please project architectural schematic oblique 4 for sector gold 9, she asked him. A spider web of blue lines representing walls, floors and ceilings sprang into life, projected from the robot's chest, slowly turning. And overlay that with character set G60, she said. Spidery green lines appeared, outlines of a subset of the alien hieroglyphs superimposed on the floor plan. Altea's face lit up. There was the correlation she had been looking for. The hieroglyphs with the longer bars were in longer corridors. The variation in size of elements of the characters weren't to do with available space or with graphic design. They held meaning. A whole new level of meaning that nobody had guessed was present was mapped onto the dimensions of the writing. Have you found a connection? Brax asked. I think I have, Altea said. If we could decipher these hieroglyphs, Brax said, it would help us immeasurably in working out the secrets of drifter technology. Yes, it would, Altea said with a smile. Yes, it would. Over the next few weeks, Altea found much more meaning modulated within the dimensions of the characters. She saw a numbering system, indications of position, status and relationships. The language rapidly unfolded itself to her. But she still couldn't assign a meaning to any of the characters that would be like a word, except perhaps the word flow. The more she thought about it, the more convinced she became. The history of the language was there in front of her. She could see early root forms develop into more and more complex forms. The drifter scribes would write in any direction, pending on the space available, and wrote left to right, right to left, up to down and down to up, and combinations of these. The only way to determine which way to read a text was to look at the asymmetrical characters. She more and more began to suspect that these asymmetrical characters represented life forms. One in particular reoccurred over and over. She wondered if this one character might be a representation of a drifter. There was already a huge amount of data on the patterns and interrelationships of the language, but the only item of vocabulary she had discovered was the word flow, which she was becoming increasingly convinced was her first drifter word. But with just one word, a whole language could be decrypted. For an entire week, she focused on similar characters and discovered another, its opposite, blockage. With these first cornerstones, she went on to build outwards, gradually unlocking the meaning of the language. She was so happy with her progress, so confident that she was right, that she had to share it to get news of her discovery out. First of all, though, she wanted to tell her superior, Shavia. Altea was sitting in her office, in a temporary building bonded to the floor of a large chamber deep below the planet's surface, when she decided to make the call. Shavia's holographic avatar appeared in midair in the centre of the room. It was a simple departmental logo crest with her name and rank written below. When Shavia accepted the call, this logo went fuzzy at the edges and was replaced by a hologram of Shavia herself, standing life-size on the floor a few paces away. Altea, Shavia said. Hello, Altea replied. What's this about? Something huge. I think I've taken the first steps towards a decipherment. Shavia didn't reply. 
Shock could clearly be seen on her face, despite the poor resolution of the field-grade military hologram communicator. Have you gone mad? Nobody has made progress in a hundred years. I hesitate to make this call, but I'm convinced. I will come to you, Shavir said. The line went dead, Shavir's hologram replaced by the departmental crest, slowly turning in the air. Altia shut off the communicator. If her boss was coming to see her work, she'd better have something impressive to show her. She noticed that her diary was being remote accessed. The diary opened up, displaying all its little boxes, with each little box representing a time slot, and they were all colour-coded and full. Altia saw all her appointments being cancelled, all her time slots going white, then one slot in ten days' time coloured red, the words, Meeting with Shavir appeared. It looks like I have ten days to get my ideas together. Shavir must have been off-world. It was the only explanation of the length of time she had allowed before the meeting. Altia was grateful for all the extra time she could get. She spent the entire ten days decrypting texts collected from around the artificial planet. There was so much information, her vocabulary was filling so fast. With each new translation, correlations could be made that allowed further translations. By the time Shavir arrived, she had pages of deciphered text to show her. The text had gaps. It was often difficult to interpret, but there was no doubt it was real. Shavir arrived unannounced via the largest of the corridors leading off from Altia's campsite. She was brought by Gravsled from wherever her spaceship had landed. She was accompanied by a team of scientists and a pair of armed guards. They didn't have heavy weapons, and they weren't wearing combat armour, but it was odd to see armed personnel down on the planet, although they were common enough up in orbit. Well, hello, Altia, Shavir said, emerging from the grav sled. I've been hardly able to sleep for wondering at the marvels you would have to show me. I hope you aren't disappointed. I hope for the same thing, Shavir said a slight menace to her voice. The sled door closed behind her, leaving the other scientists and guards inside. This way, Altia said. She led the way through the encampment, a handful of temporary buildings and crates of supplies, until she reached the building she used as an office. Altia plugged a memory stick into a screen and gave it to Shavir. It's raw text, not formatted, with a gap length indicated by dashes, Altia said. And there are still a lot of gaps. Very well, Shavir said. She looked around Altia's office space and selected a comfortable chair. She shrugged off her cloak and sat with her legs crossed and the screen balanced on her knee. She swiped her finger from the bottom of the screen upwards, the motion to turn the page, then again and again. She sat for two hours, swiping backward and forward without saying a word, comparing original symbols with Altea's translations. Altea stood in front of her, forgotten. This is incredible, Shavir said at last. Yes, Altea said. Shavir pointed at a section of the text and Altea looked over her shoulder at the screen. We are remnants. The power has been taken away. The cold sleep. They abide, the tablet said. You think this is important? Altia asked. I do, Shavir said. That gap at the end. I'm sure you will find that those symbols are coordinates. Decoding that is your new priority. Shavir abruptly stood up. As she was walking to the door, leaving without a word, Altia asked. Can I share my findings? Oh no, this must remain a secret. Chapter 3 The worst thing was not knowing. Knave was buttoned up in his power armour and only information he needed for his mission was being relayed to him. This did not include an overview of the super-atmospheric battle, even though the assault ship he was on was caught up in it. 
He could feel concussions transmitted through the hull, but had no idea if they would be able to clear a window to insert his unit or not. Just then, he felt an acceleration tugging at him. The slamming concussions being transmitted by the hull increased in frequency and intensity. The mission status icon inside his helmet display grew to three times its usual size, the other icons shrinking to make room, switched over to ongoing, written in red, and shrank back into its usual place again. Here we go, Henrik muttered. How long before that door opens? Nave asked. An eternity, Henrik answered. But you're never ready. However long it takes, however much you brace yourself, you're never ready. I guess, said Knave. I guess, Knave said. Just remember two things, Henrik said. You go left. And? And what? The second thing, Knave prompted. Shoot anything your targeter paints as the enemy. That's it. That's our job. How good is the targeter at spotting the enemy? Knave asked. He'd asked about this before, but never gotten a really satisfactory answer. About 50-50, Henrik said. Use your best judgment. Knave felt the galaxy dog lurch downwards like an elevator with the cables cut. Here we go, Henrik said. You already said that. The metal head of Henrik's power armour turned to look at Knave. There was a visor strip across the front of Henrik's eyeline. The transparent armour of the strip was dark. There was no way to see the look in his eyes, but Knave could guess. Which way are you going? Henrik asked. Left? Which way is left? Knave took an armoured hand off the front handle of the mass driver, offended a little that Henrik obviously assumed he didn't know his left from his right, and pointed to the port bulkhead. Well, OK, Henrik said, the irritation in his voice carrying clearly over the communications channel. They both turned their heads to stare at the door. Now is about time for our change of objective, Henrik said. What do you mean? Control usually changes our objective just before the doors open. They're cutting it a little fine this time. I've never had my orders updated so close... Knave was interrupted by his heads-up display. It showed his assigned position moving from the periphery of the mountain to a position on its flanks. The projected landing position of Galaxy Dog moved too, away from the mountain. What? Knave said. Always happens with planetary assault, Henrik mumbled. Never goes according to plan. But we'll have to run for hours to cover that distance. This is nothing, Henrik said. I've been dropped in the wrong hemisphere before. There was a jolting series of shocks that would have thrown them around like so much loose cargo if they weren't anchored to the decking by their armoured boots. Hard landing, Henrik muttered. The door was dotted with a sprinkling of green and blue indicator lights, which all suddenly went red at the same time. Then, the door hinged down, more slowly than in the simulations, accompanied by a grinding noise. Very hard landing, Henrik said. As soon as the door was open wide enough, Henrik clambered out, jumping to the ice before the door had fully deployed. Knave did the same a moment later, and they were both followed by a pack of wolves, their drones, forty strong, half of them under Knave's control. Knave was immediately running left. He had expected to be taking incoming fire already, but everything was eerily quiet. Then he heard it, the first corrupting sounds of buzzer interference within the communications, swelling and receding noises, sometimes taking the form of human voices. Go back, his communicator whispered in an unhealthy version of a human voice. There was precipitation too, he hadn't been expecting that. Ice crystals ejected by an ice volcano off to his right. He took a good long look at the volcano, drinking in its beauty, and some of his wolves glanced at it to see what he was looking at, then went back to scanning for targets.
The volcano was so tall he could see it as a thorn sticking out of the horizon, and he could see the plume of ice it was ejecting like a dragon breathing straight up in triumph at the sight of fresh victims. The snow, for want of a better word, was coming down hard, reducing visibility, but it wasn't the graceful crystals of water ice. The nitrogen snow was more like closely packed salt, like rice thrown at a wedding. Along with the snow, there were banks of fog. Although the moon's atmosphere was tenuous, it was very cold and therefore very thick. The thick fog came and went. It appeared very gradually, obscured visibility almost entirely at its thickest, and then gradually subsided. Combined with the gritty snow rattling on his faceplate, it was like being in a sandstorm of dirty snow. Even through the snow, Nave could see that fighting was intense at the base of the mountain, with clouds of ice being kicked up and the flashes of explosions visible within. Nave kept running until he reached a shallow ravine. He gave the bottom a quick scan with his sensors to make sure it would support him, and then he hopped in. Two of his wolves followed him down, and the others started fanning out. It wasn't good to bunch up too much, because of the risk of having the whole wolf pack taken out by a single missile, or maybe a mine. Nave glanced back at the dropship, and sucked a breath in sharply between his teeth at what he saw. He knew a thing or two about spaceship maintenance, but he'd never seen damage like it. It was battle damage, deep scars in the hull, trenches where armour had been chiselled out. The landing gear on the port side had collapsed, and that side of the spaceship was resting on its underside like a beached whale. The impact of the landing had obviously been hard and had cratered and cracked the ice around the spaceship. The landing had gouged the spaceship into the ice crust of the moon. Units were still disembarking and fanning out, the majority heading for Mount Sabretooth, or Fang Hill, as Henrik had taken to calling it, enormously high and smooth, the objective. Remembering the objective, Nave forced the dropship from his mind and turned towards the target. He popped his head round from cover. Then, seeing as it didn't get blown off, he continued his headlong charge for the foothills of the mountain. As he ran, he got more of an idea of the surrounding conditions and terrain. Apart from the volcano, there was only one other obvious geographic feature poking out of the cratered and ravined expanse of ice. It was Mount Sabretooth itself. It was located right at the centre of the massive impact crater, where the dropship had made its hard landing. It had an escarpment along part of its perimeter which rose kilometres above the surrounding terrain, and the crater floor lay several kilometres below the rest of the surface of the planet. This basin consisted of undulating terrain and a central mound, almost 200 kilometres in diameter, which rose 22 kilometres to the base of the mountain. The crater was staggeringly huge, and the impact responsible for creating it had evacuated about 1% of the planet's volume, leaving some nearby asteroids as products of the collision. What little atmosphere the moon had was concentrated in the crater, swirling around the central mountain. Nave's wolf pack had spread out so far now that he could only see the drone to his right and the drone to his left. Then, contact. Ice dust started kicking up around him and a burst of incoming fire came close enough to slap his suit with fist-sized chunks of ice. He was sent staggering backwards as he felt the bruising impact of them, but his armour kept its integrity. His targeting unit, as if just waking up, suddenly painted a handful of targets against the white terrain ahead. Better late than never, Nave grumbled. The hostiles fired again, and one of his wolf pack of drones detonated. The explosion was shocking, strong enough for Nave to feel it through his armour, the first loss of one of his units, and it could just as easily have been him. 
he felt an almost overwhelming urge to tighten his finger on the trigger of his mass driver to send a return volley of rods at relativistic speeds to chew up his enemies, the creatures trying to kill him, but he didn't. Save your ammo, knave, he said to himself. If his wolves were taken out, the last thing he wanted was to be running around on the surface of an ice moon with an empty mag. Come on, puppies, he muttered, willing his wolves to acquire targets and return fire. And the ice around the enemy icons was starting to boil and be thrown in the air. One of the enemy icons winked out. His drones were returning fire with their deadly accuracy and inhuman composure. Then one of his wolves staggered back, armour thrown into the air in ribbons, but it kept firing and the other enemy units winked out. Yes, he yelled into his helmet. Well done, my proud beauties. He carried on running to his objective, the legs of his armour eating up the intervening distance. His helmet bobbed up and down at each lopping low-gravity stride. His knees, actually the knee actuators of the power armour, were pumping hard, but his mass driver stayed level in his arms, no matter how much he was moving held in place by virtual gyroscopes and targeting algorithms. He took a detour to bring him close to the nearest place he remembered seeing a buzzer icon wink out. He wanted to look at a buzzer in the flesh, or whatever was left of it. As he ran, the ground got rougher. His wolves had pounded this location good, leaving craters and smooth areas where the ice had been liquidized by the force of the mass driver rod impacts and refrozen in the frigid atmosphere of the moon. The surface surrounding the dead buzzer was particularly twisted. Several spurts of ice had been semi-liquidized, thrown into the air and frozen before they could hit the ground again. They looked almost intentional, like the contorted columns and arches of a small ruined settlement. The illusion was only aided by the obscuring banks of fog and driving cryovolcano snow. At the centre was what was left of the buzzer. Nothing complex or volatile remained, only the larger plates of its armoured hide, still held together by the exoskeleton of its limbs and thorax. The head was completely missing, and whatever weapon it had been using was vaporised. Buzzers had four arms and four legs, but only three arms and fragmentary remains of the legs were left. Knave looked away and kept running. His targeting systems lit up a constellation of unaccountable buzzers up ahead in the far distance. Nothing to worry about right now. The interference coming over his communicator swelled again, forming, or seeming to form, words. Don't trust your targeting data, the distorted voice. Knave toyed with the idea of just switching the communicator's audio off. He knew that plenty of other slugs did, but his orders were to keep it open no matter how creepy and distracting it was. Now he had to choose between the optional objectives in his mission route. Some were obviously more well-guarded than others, judging by the targeting data he was receiving. No need to be a hero he said to himself, and selected a low foothill that seemed to have much fewer buzzer targets than any of the others. He locked it in as his objective and reported it to command. His display flickered and blanked out for a second. It was engulfed by the word override. Command declined his suggested target and replaced it with another. It was a hill, swarming with buzzers, if his tactical readout was to be believed. Shit! he yelled. But it could have been worse. There were much more heavily defended hills. He'd gotten off easy. He headed where he was told, a screen of three wolves in front of him. The foothill he had been assigned was in shadow, a giant shadow cast by Fang Rock itself. The nearest firefight was just up ahead, so Knave slowed down. His role was to ensure that the buzzers were not reinforced. He was to engage any buzzer flanking units. He was not to just charge into any combat he happened into. In the more enclosed environment of the foothills, his wolves were starting to bunch up. He could usually see three or four of them at any one time. 
It was funny calling them wolves when they looked for all the world like giant headless ostriches, their long legs kicking high over the terrain to ensure they didn't get entangled in the snow and the ice boulders. The surface itself was much less smooth here too, with ridges and craters easily tall enough and ravines easily deep enough to hide buzzers at every turn. Nave watched the plumes of ice crystals kicked up by his wolves floating so high in the low gravity that they escaped the shadow of Fang Rock and twinkled in the dim sunlight from the system primary. There was a cloud of ice crystals hugging the ground up ahead where the real fighting was going on. Nave had a pretty good idea what was happening inside, relayed to him in the form of little icons superimposed on the impenetrable cloud of ice. Each icon represented a unit of Tarazet ground forces or buzzers. He could see glimpses of both Tarazet forces and buzzers through the snow. The Tarazet forces up ahead didn't seem to be doing so well. Nave saw a trooper hit by a blaster fire, evaporating a chunk of his or her armour. The damage to the trooper's armour must have caused a breach. There was a moment of mixing, as the oxygen in the suit mixed with the surrounding atmosphere of the planet, followed by a detonation that blew the suit apart. It was a shocking sight, but whatever combat drugs the Navy had him on deadened the impact of it. Nave already knew from experience, however, that the effect was only temporary. The full shock of seeing a human life extinguished would come back to hit him later. Nave was confused for a second at the size of the detonation, but then Nave remembered from the captain's briefing that the mix of oxygen and local atmosphere was explosive, so Nave thought, with a wry smile, he didn't have to worry about asphyxiating. Any suit breach would cause a detonation that would rip him limb from limb. Up ahead, the buzzers had formed into a wedge, broken through the Tarazet lines, and were now expanding out from the middle, making the icons for Tarazet units wink out of existence in his display. Things weren't going well for the Tarazet planetary assault. Nave bit his lip, felt an urge to run and help, but his orders, relayed to his helmet display as text, were sending him another way. He kept running the ice ahead clear as far as he could see through the snow, and was almost immediately confronted by a buzzer head-on. The surface of the ice exploded upwards as it emerged, explosive charges Nave suspected, and then came crashing down, catching two of his wolves under tons of ice. The buzzer that was revealed was no ordinary infantry buzzer either. It was the size of a tank, with their thick armour and flexible skeletons, he suspected the buried drones were still operational, but it would take hours to dig them out if anyone ever got round to it. They could easily end up entombed on the moon, just two more chunks of discarded military hardware. But Nave couldn't worry about that. The huge buzzer was already acquiring targets among him and his drones its weapons twitching into position to fire. Chapter 4 Our orders seem a little too specific to be part of a simple recon mission, the Sky Dancer's ship computer said. Why don't we just give the planet a quick scan and move on? Let's just do as we're told, Merital said. We will investigate the planet and report back. Aye, Captain, the spaceship AI said. Skydancer made a series of small course corrections and headed for the jungle planet. It's of no strategic importance that I can see, Skydancer said to the captain. It doesn't even have a name. Would you like to name it? the captain asked. I would. Go right ahead. There was a silence while Skydancer thought. The captain was pretty sure that the AI already had a name picked out, but she appreciated the theatre of the long pause for thought. Jade Stone, Skydancer said at last. Let's call it Jade Stone. Jade Stone it is, the captain said approvingly. 
she turned to a communication screen and sent out a general call to the crew. Everybody to the bridge, she said simply, then hit a button to have the message repeated three times. Her crew appeared a short while later, one after the other like students slinking late into a classroom. When they had all arrived, the room was feeling a little crowded. All the acceleration couches were full, and people were standing pushed up against the back wall. The front wall was transparent armour, and only one or two of the crew chose to stand with their backs to the stars. Welcome all, Captain Merrittal said. She stood in the middle of the room, between the acceleration couches, framed by the big transparent armour window. She kept turning her head slowly, to make eye contact with the whole crew as she spoke. The planet you are looking at, she said, indicating the planet looming in the view, is Jade Stone. We don't know anything about it, but our mission is to investigate it. The investigation will include a deployment of satellites from orbit and scramjets operating from two airstrips that will be established by dropships. We'll be sprinkling the surface with some random drones too, but not too many, because we may not have time to pick them up. Any questions so far? She was rewarded with a few half-hearted grunts in the negative. Well, OK, that's the spirit, people. Let's get a few slugs ready to go down and keep an eye on the drones and scramjets, and the real crew can handle the satellites. The South Continent Scramjet Base was operational in just two days, but was very utilitarian. They had a fence, an airstrip, a hangar, some scramjets, and a sprinkling of temporary buildings, all carved out of the primeval forest of jade stone. Keen and Punter were the only humans on the base, the slugs who had been selected to keep an eye on the scramjets and the drones. They were responsible for searching half a planet with their handful of scramjet recon drones, their phalanx of combat drones, a few engineering drones, and a set of the vaguest orders Keen had ever seen. Keen was the veteran soldier and a sergeant, while Punter was a simple soldier who had never been promoted. He was a lummox of a man who had to be shoehorned into his combat armour. Keen was walking the perimeter of the base, a habit she had picked up way back on Debelor. She had been in charge of perimeter security on a base among a hostile local population. She had been taught then that a base with a secure perimeter was a thing to be treasured. The site for this present base on Jade Stone had been blasted from the verdant jungle by the first dropship. The patch of blasted jungle was roughly circular, but the ground had been left churned up and strewn with fallen trees. The engineering drones were still methodically gathering up the trees, ripping out those whose roots still had a hold, and carrying them outside the perimeter to be piled up more or less haphazardly in the forest. Keen watched one of the engineering drones nearby. It was a huge machine, bigger than the trucks used to load and position goods in the hold of a starship. It was at least twice as tall as Keen, even in her combat armour, and towered over her as it went past. It was carried along on four legs, each with multiple knee actuators and shock absorbers to deal with most any non-vertical terrain. It had some of the massive remnants of the local tree-like fauna in its two giant forward-facing claws. It regarded Keen with numerous compound eyes as it came near, making sure to keep all dangerous edges and heavy weights away from the delicate human. Keen was wearing her combat armour, of course, and was far from delicate, but that made no difference to the drone's programming. It gave her a wide berth and carried on manoeuvring between the temporary buildings towards the base's only gate. There were two drones positioned at the gate doing sentry duty, 
their eyes simultaneously watching the engineering drone as it traversed the gate and scanning the surrounding forest for threats. Keen was quite happy with her drones. They weren't cutting-edge, special operations drones by any means, but they were good, solid machines with heavy armour, a versatile set of weapons, and pretty up-to-date firmware and programming. She was confident that they would make short work of any of the local megafauna that might decide to get nosy and investigate the base. A few warning shots would send even the largest predator, an ungainly tripod with a cat nine tails for a face, stampeding off through the forest. The honour of naming the creature had gone to the other scramjet base, where they had decided on the evocative name of Lashmug. Keen heard a couple of lash mugs blundering around nearby, but they must have seen the engineering drone coming because they made off through the trees to get away from it. Keen smiled. They had built an octagonal fence around their structures and around the scramjet VTOL pad, and it was at the corners of the octagon where the fence came nearest to the ragged edge of the blasted forest. At those points, the forest seemed to be reaching out for the fence, the branches of the trees like sinuous but jointed headless snakes, looking for something to twine around, seeming to sense the proximity of the fence. She went to the main gate, then went out through it, under the watchful eyes of the sentry drones. She walked round to the nearest corner of the fence, where there was hardly enough space to pass without the branches brushing her armour. The tree's branches had to be growing an arm length per day. She put in a call to Exploration Base North, to her counterpart, Maskin. Her signal found a likely satellite, recently seeded by Skydancer, and started bouncing a wide stream of information from it. Maskin's hologram appeared beside her, projected from a camera in Keane's own suit, looking incongruous in the forest because she was standing in exercise gear, probably in the gym back at her own base. Keane kept walking around the perimeter, and Maskin followed, although the legs of the hologram didn't move, smoothly repositioning to stay in her eyeline. Hello, Maskin said. Hello, it's Keane. Yes? I'm walking the perimeter, and I notice the local flora is very fast growing. It's two days at most away from touching our perimeter at the closest point. So? So we don't know what forces it can exert and how quickly. Keane stopped to gather up a discarded length of metal. She held it against a branch and watched as the branch wrapped round it. It took about four minutes before the branch had a firm grip. Are you seeing this? Keen asked. Yes, Maskin said. Can you pull that piece of metal away from it? Trying now, Keen said. She started with just the strength in her arm, but although the branch did bend, she wasn't able to wrestle the metal free. She started incrementally adding strength from the elbow and shoulder actuators of her armour. She went to 10%, then 20%, and then, finally, the metal ripped free. It takes an enormous force just to move one, Keane said. All right, you convinced me. I'm going to walk the perimeter, Maskin said. Chapter 5 One of the buzzard tank's guns was pointing directly at Nave. Shoot! he yelled over his communicator. Shoot! 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 But he didn't transmit the audio to every drone. He had a plan. The tank-like buzzer was among them, and that was a big problem. Their weapons were so powerful that if they all started shooting at the tank-like buzzer in their midst, they were just as likely to blow each other to smithereens as to take out the tank. Nave turned and ran, zigzagging as best he could. A blaster bolt caught his shoulder and sent him face down into the snow but his armour held. His suit wasn't punctured, and he was pretty sure his arm was still attached. 
He ordered the other wolves in front of the tank to run too, while he ordered the drones behind the tank to start firing. The ice and rocks around him were kicked into the air by blaster impacts, and a very heavy mass driver left a lightning track above his head as its payload roared towards one of the fleeing drones. He didn't see exactly what happened, but there was an explosion and the drone's icon disappeared from his display. Then the fire around him slackened off as the tank turned to engage the drones that had opened fire on it from behind. The engagement was at such close range and the machines on both sides were armed with such heavy weapons that there was a brief maelstrom of fire. Another drone icon winked out, but fire from the buzzer tank creature had almost stopped. The remaining drones concentrated their fire and blew it apart. Debris from the buzzer tank creature rained down around Nave, burying itself deep in the snow. Nave just lay there for a moment, his remaining drones beeping in concern through the distortion in his communicator. Nave felt spent, like he could almost go to sleep, but instinctively he knew this was a bad idea. Even so, he couldn't bring himself to move, until his suit computer reported a friendly approaching, a friendly that outranked him. A female voice came over his communicator. This is Captain Heldin, slug. Do you read me? Uh, yes, Nave said. Don't worry, I'm alive. He struggled to his feet. The new arrival, Heldin, was standing over him, her drones mingling with his. They were larger, more advanced. We're going up the mountain, Heldin yelled. Me too? Nave asked. That's right, Buster, she said. Is there a plan? Henrik asked. Yes, Helding said. She pointed at the mountain. Climb upwards and shoot buzzers. It seemed that Nave had been reassigned to frontline duty in the assault on the buzzer positions. That's just great, Nave muttered to himself. Heldin and Nave soon caught up with the back end of the advance on the mountain. The Tarazet ground units were climbing the slopes in waves spread out along a wide front. No matter how much the technology of war had advanced since the days when cave people threw rocks at each other, High ground would always be an advantage, and Fang Mountain was high, very high. The main influence on the shape of the mountain was wear from the wind and falling snow, making the mountain much smoother and more regular than a mountain on a planet where temperatures allowed liquid to form within the rock and then freeze to shatter it. It was also thickly coated in ice, which meant that climbing it required crampons and wrist axes. Even with the assistance of the actuators embedded in his armour, it was hard, tiring work. It was impossible to climb and shoot, so Nave climbed a little way, found somewhere secure looking to wedge himself, fired off a few shots, then carried on climbing. Climb, shoot, climb, shoot, over and over. His wolfhound drones were at the very edge of their terrain envelopes. They all had all four of their secondary manipulator arms deployed, delicate-looking snakes of metal that were usually hidden away under armour panels in the belly, giving them six legs to climb with, the four manipulator arms and the two main ostrich legs. It was very ungainly-looking, and Knave was sure not all would reach the target. Along with climbers like him, there were units with grav boosters flying up towards the buzzer positions, and units with grav chutes dropping down on the buzzer positions. Some were being deployed by dropship, like he had been, while others were being inserted directly into the atmosphere, and some heavy units were falling all the way from low orbit. With so many targets and attack vectors, the hope was obviously that the buzzers would be overwhelmed. To Nave, it looked more like a turkey shoot. Then he saw a proximity warning in his faceplate, followed by an impression of something large and mechanical dropping towards him. Was it one of his own drones? 
finally losing traction on the ice with its ridiculously inadequate pincers, or was it the carcass of a dead buzzer? He didn't have time for a better look. He just dug his crampons and axes into the ice and squeezed himself in as close to the mountain face as he could. There was a massive impact above him, very close. Then minor impacts as rock and ice debris hit his armour with the scrapes of metal mixed in from the falling object. Then, nothing. It had bounced past. Knave gingerly looked down, but, even with the view in his faceplate magnification set to maximum, there was no sign of what fate had befallen the machine. Knave looked back up, planned the next stage of his ascent, and kept climbing. He reached a ledge, anchored himself as best he could with one hand and aimed his mass driver upwards with the other. Symbols appeared in his faceplate, warning him that accuracy would suffer if he didn't use two hands, but seeing as he needed the other to anchor himself to the cliff face, he just ignored them. He peered upwards, and at extreme magnification, he could pick out dark shapes among some structures clinging to the upper slopes. His identify friend or foe system had them all lit up red for buzzers, and he didn't see any green friendlies nearby. So he designated a target. He felt the actuators of his armour start to subtly influence his aim. It was mostly the shoulder actuator, but wrist and torso actuators were slightly shifting too. He squeezed the trigger and saw an ice and rock fountain at the impact site. When he adjusted magnification back to normal, he was disappointed to see that what had seemed a huge explosion of destructive force was, at normal magnification, just a small puff of ice among thousands of others, soon lost among the flurries of falling snow. Knave had no idea if he had hit his target, but that wasn't of vital importance. It was more of a question of producing suppressing fire until the range closed. But he did know that he was at the most vulnerable point of his climb-shoot-climb routine just after he had fired off his weapon. A mass driver didn't have the same muzzle flash as a blaster, but in the moon's thick atmosphere it was drawing a ghostly line of ionised particles that projected a very considerable distance. He had just made himself a conspicuous target, and he now had to move, keep moving, onward and upward. Knave shouldered his mass driver and climbed three handholds before plastering himself flat against the ice and rock face of Fang Mountain. The rock face around him, mostly above him thankfully, started to erupt into spurts of ice and rock as the enemy returned fire. Some of the rocks blasted from the cliff face were easily big enough to dislodge him if they hit him. And, needless to say, a direct hit by a rod from a buzzer's mass driver or a bolt from a blaster would cook his goose. He felt a medium-sized rock clang against the torso of his armour with enough force to dislodge his left foot. He quickly stamped his foot back into position, dug the crampons on his left boot back into the ice and held on. He was soon surrounded by a cloud of ice crystals and rock dust, masking him almost completely to the enemy above. Incoming fire started to slacken off a bit, and it was time to climb again. As he was climbing, he pinged his drones to see how they were doing. He had lost one since he last checked in. Had the falling machine been his drone? Had it looked like a wolfhound? None of the other drones had any record of what had happened to their comrade. They were, most of them, a little higher up the slope than he was. Their weapons were mounted on stubby flightless wings on the sides of their torso and could fire upwards if the drone just paused in its climb. The drones did not have to stop and dig themselves in just to fire a weapon the way he had to. He was keeping a very hands-off approach to the drones. They had their target. They had mass drivers. How they got within range was up to them. 
He was just checking in to make sure none had chosen a ridiculous route that would silhouette them or have them suspending all their weight from vulnerable overhangs of rock. Everything seemed to be within parameters, so he dismissed the link to his drones and concentrated on his own climb. He climbed for ten more minutes, pausing to shoot twice, and then he saw something looming out of the mist and fog. Up ahead, he saw a structure that seemed to grow from a small plateau of rock, jutting from the side of the mountain. The structure looked military, a guard post or drone hangar, or something similar. Nave sent off a request for an alteration in his orders so he could attack a target of opportunity. He received, in return, the message he had been expecting. Control network unresponsive. Cause enemy interference. The buzzer singing in his earphones was loud and he wasn't surprised it was drowning everything else out. He could only communicate with his drones by a daisy chain of direct laser light communication links. Nave sent the request to the offline orders of Battle System, which was just a glorified database integrated as a subsystem of the computer within his own armour. It made strategic decisions predetermined by control for use when communications were down. It agreed his suggested change of objectives. Engage target of opportunity. I thought you might say that, Nave whispered to himself grimly. He pinged his drones again. Damn, another one missing. They were taking a pounding. He designated the building as a new target, causing the drones to start climbing directly towards it. No, he muttered. Let's go in by the back door. He instructed the drones to climb above the structure and approach from further up the slope. He also told them to stop firing for now. The drones were very smart. A fuzzy instruction like, for now, was perfect for them. It constrained them, but also left them some leeway to target adversaries if there was no other option or if there were no further instructions. Nave and his drones were within short range of the building now, and a little above it on the face of the mountain. Nave could see detail in the building. It seemed very newly constructed, with only three or four windows piercing the exterior wall. Obviously buzzer architecture. He relayed a message to his drones. If this is at all well defended, he sent, get ready to bug out. But for now, a slow advance. He crept down the mountain with his drones, and, about where he expected, they came under fire. It wasn't mass drivers or blasters, though. It was missiles. The roof of the building had unfolded in four places, each sighted near a corner of the structure, revealing four dark circular holes. Then, a moment later, a pop-up missile battery had slid smoothly into position at each corner. Luckily, their position must have been within some preset minimum distance in the missile's hardware or software. The missiles couldn't come zooming directly at them. Instead, the missiles arced upwards into the air, turned round, and then descended towards his position. You, he said to the nearest drone, via the line-of-sight communications, take out the missile launchers. Everyone else, defensive fire! He was already pointing his mass driver skywards and pumping out rounds. The drones around him did likewise, blasters and mass drivers filling the sky above them with blaster bolts and mass driver rods. Nave was suddenly glad they had all gotten bunched up. The likelihood of being able to generate enough volume of fire to defeat an incoming missile was slim without a mass of guns. As it was, the first missile got perilously close before being detonated by their fire and dumping its load of shrapnel and explosives, great gashes were carved out of his armour and he saw a nearby drone lose a weapons pod, torn off by a flying piece of jagged metal. 
The detonation of the missile filled the sky with so much shrapnel that the next missile immediately detonated a little further away, and then the next and the next, each one a little further away. OK, Nave yelled, we can do this! As if in answer, he received a message from one of the drones that unpacked and scrolled across his visor. Capacitors depleting fast, situation unsustainable. Nave glanced at his power readout. His weapons were drawing power from the suit's giant capacitors more quickly than the power plant could replenish them. When his power readout reached zero, that capacitor would cut out for half a second to recharge back to minimum, and if he kept firing, it would cut out again soon afterward. And the drones were designed the same way, with lousier capacitors if anything. All their guns would soon start to stutter, and, if only one missile got through, they would be just a charred collection of scrap metal strewn around the side of the mountain. Nave took his eyes off the missile targeting for a moment to look at the drone he had assigned to destroying the missile emplacements. It was scoring hit after hit. One missile battery was destroyed and the second had been forced to reduce its rate of fire. There was obviously some kind of energy shield around the building or the drone would have reduced all the missile batteries to smoking ruin by now. The rate of missile fire had dropped, however, so he detailed one more drone to missile battery targeting. Just then, things started happening real fast. One of the drones had a mass driver jam. A rod had caught just a little too much friction as it was accelerated down the track in the drone's nose. It dug into the side of the barrel of the weapon. The resulting explosion tore off the entire nose of the drone and sent it staggering around, spraying the hillside with blaster bolts. This mechanical failure would have meant certain doom if it not for the fact that two drones concentrating on the roof was more than the building's energy shield could cope with. One missile was caught square on by a mass driver rod just as it was exiting the launcher. It detonated, blowing an enormous chunk out of the corner of the building furthest away from the slope of the mountainside. The missile stopped coming. All the launchers, even the intact ones, fell silent. There were three more missiles in the air, but they were dealt with just as the drone's capacitors were reaching zero. They had survived, and could draw breath for a second. Nave watched his capacitor readout climb from 2% to 40% to 100% in a matter of seconds. It was very impressive how quickly his power came back, but it wouldn't have been quick enough if they hadn't dealt with the missiles. His supply of heavy metal to spin up mass driver rods was large, but not inexhaustible. Even if his capacitors could be designed to last forever, the ammo would have been depleted eventually. Once the mass driver fell silent, it fell silent for good, or until he found another block of heavy metal. All in all, it had been a very uncomfortable encounter. But they had survived it. Good shooting, team, he said. He was rewarded with some approving beeps and whistles, carried to him through the nasty soup of noises his communication had become because of the buzzer interference. Then he went over to the drone with the damaged nose. He could see that the armour of the nose had been torn apart, exposing the machine's delicate interior. Some of the components inside were still glowing with the heat of the continued firing, and everything was mashed and torn. There was a single eye still in place, and it was turned on by Nave. The machine beeped forlornly, but did not send any messages in human readable form. Nave looked to one of the other drones. I want you to look after this one, he said. Make sure it gets home, all right? The drone replied, two beeps for yes. Nave then turned towards the building. Follow me, he said. Let's go inside. I'm pretty sure it's empty, otherwise one or two buzzers would have poked their heads out of those windows and started taking pot shots at us, wouldn't they? The drones beeped and whistled unconvinced, but followed. 
with the rear brought up by the drone with the severe nose damage and the drone assigned to mind it. As they approached the building, the ground levelled out in one place until it was horizontal. This was where the building's main entrance was. It was a large, imposing-looking structure now that Nave had gotten right up to it. Let's pop this open, Nave said. He levelled his mass driver at the locking mechanism of the large door and fired. He kept firing till there was a hole clear through the wall of the building in the place where the lock used to be. He lowered his mass driver and nodded to the nearest couple of drones. They walked past him. He had to spread himself against the wall to allow them past, and then they extended their general-purpose arms from their belly hatches. They dug their strong metal fingers into the hole Nave had made and pulled on the door. It only took them half a minute to drag it to one side. On the other side of the door was a corridor. The building was built to buzzer dimensions and tastes, which meant two drones could walk down the corridor side by side. The two drones that had opened the door went on in, their eyes and blast amounts swivelling to cover as much of the corridor as possible. In you go, Nave yelled. Like I said, nobody's home. Nave was next to enter, followed by the rest of the drones two by two. The drone in front of him on the left turned its torso just enough to allow a laser communications connection and sent him a question. Which way, boss? Left, Nave said. There was no sign of occupation and a curiously empty feel compared with human architecture. The chambers of the structure had very little furniture and the corridor walls sloped inwards at the top. After investigating a few rooms, Nave was starting to suspect that the structure was a scientific facility. He also noticed that very few doorways had actual doors in them. It seemed that privacy wasn't a huge concern to buzzers. The doorways were large too, more like an archway in relation to human scale. A drone could walk through one without bothering to fold in its weapon pods or stow the communications array sprouting from its upper surface like a tuft of metal grass. There were also three-dimensional models of strange interlocking shapes here and there, like monumental sculptures towering over him. It was hard to tell if they were something scientific. For all he knew, they might just as easily have been works of art. Soon, the entire ground floor had been investigated. They went upstairs, via a winding spiral ramp, and saw the damage done to the upper floors by the exploding missile battery. The walls were bashed down in places, and there was smoke damage and debris everywhere. Next, they descended to the subterranean floors, further down the spiral, below the ground. Down on these floors, things started to get more cluttered. There were strange machines at each corridor intersection, and the walls were covered in readouts. Nave had no idea what any of it meant, but the symbols were so bright as they danced in their displays that they were reflected in the smooth and featureless walls of the buzzer structure. Strangely, the interface in his radio channels disappeared. It was a weird feeling to have silence in his ears again. Your communication's okay? he asked the nearest drone, tapping the side of his helmet. The drone nodded its body upwards and downwards in a yes. Nave nodded and turned his attention back to the walls, but he was the only one interested. The drones weren't the slightest bit interested in the dancing symbols. Only tactical considerations ever occupied their minds, at least as far as Nave could tell. They went down to the second basement floor, which was decorated in the same dim light and dancing symbols combination, but something was different. Some of the symbols were unchanging. Holes were cut here and there through the display of dancing symbols to expose the bare wall beneath. In these places the wall was carved with a symbol. 
in each place a different symbol scratched into whatever the surface of the wall was. Nave couldn't tell if it was rock or metal or something super advanced that just pretended to be an inert wall covering. There was something about it that made him suspect it was beyond human engineering capabilities to produce. One of the drones stiffened, its weapons twitched. It sent a message to Nave over the now crystal clear radio channel, just a series of beeps and clicks quickly translated into text in his faceplate. Did you hear that? No, Nave said, whispering now. What was it? Movement in the next room. Okay, Nave said. We better get in there before they get their heavy weaponry set up. There is no evidence of heavy weaponry. It was a hypothetical, Nave murmured. Understood, the drone said. Then, do we go? Follow me in, Nave said. Back me up. The human operator taking point is contradicted. I'm the boss, Nave said grimly, and if I want to go in first, I'm going to go in first. He walked brazenly through the doorway, his mass driver held at his shoulder. The room was cluttered and dark, but Nave immediately saw the room's occupant, a huge buzzer, bigger than any he had yet encountered. It was bigger even than the buzzer tank creature that had taken out two of his drones and buried two others. The buzzer was occupying an entire corner of the room. It was crouched down on its legs, as if preparing to spring. Its arms were fanned out around it. Lots of arms, and the sinister, empty eye sockets were pointed right at him. Nave aimed the mass driver, shadowed by the weapons of the drone which was following him through the door, its weapons slaved to his, aiming at the same target. The drone was quickly alongside him, followed through the door by another, and in his peripheral vision he was aware of gas vents opening. The ones on the armour encasing the mass driver in the drone's nose, in anticipation of venting waste heat from firing the weapon. The buzzer rose up on its legs, its head mere centimetres from scraping the low ceiling of the chamber. The drone with open gas vents started beeping a combat proximity hazard warning and the silence in his communications was replaced by increasing levels of buzzer interference, words among it in that alien accent. Shoot, shoot, kill. Nave ignored it, concentrated on what he was seeing and relaxed his finger on the trigger. Hold your fire, he yelled at the two drones. I don't think it's hostile. The room was as if frozen. Nave didn't know how long the moment lasted. Then the buzzer seemed to relax. Its outsplayed arms drooping a little, its legs bowing a little. The buzzer noise in his communications receded slowly to nothing too. Nave lowered his weapon slowly. His two drones kept their weapons raised. Anybody speak buzzer? Nave asked looking from left to right. The drones didn't reply. I understand you, the creature said. Languages are my area. Nave was shocked. He'd never spoken to an alien before, and he had heard rumours that buzzers were unable to speak human languages. They certainly didn't have mouths on their helmet-like heads. OK, so what are you doing here, cowering in the basement? Nave asked. I am working. Why are you alone? There was a call to evacuate. I ignored it. Why are you speaking? Buzzers don't speak. The members of my genus that you have most often encountered are likely to have been from military fields. Their field does not require this of them. I see, Nave said. Like the military personnel accompanying you. The massive alien's voice hissed in his communicator. They do not require me to answer questions. You mean the drones, Nave said, glancing to the side. I guess they don't. But you're quite happy to chat with me, are you? My field is languages, and it is gratifying to encounter a live subject with which to test my theories about human language. 
Life subject, Knave yelped involuntarily. The giant creature was silent. It looked robotic. There was definitely metal interlaced with the organic material of its chitinous shell. But it breathed, shifted and fidgeted in a way that true robots didn't. The drones flanking him were still as statues by comparison, just a couple of indicator lights and a twitching antenna, constantly searching for the lost contact with control up in orbit, to betray the fact that they were even active. It's just a figure of speech, the alien said at last. Here's a language tip for you, Knave growled. If you're going to lie, don't take so much time coming up with a good one. The pause gives it away. Truly, the alien said, I meant live as in not documents. Mostly, I learn through documents. Look. The alien moved to the side, unsplaying its arms, which it had been using to try to protect one of the displays Knave had seen earlier. But this one looked different. There were more squares of display removed, replaced with carvings in the wall, intricate and deeply carved symbols. It's beautiful, isn't it? the creature said. The most highly evolved language I have ever encountered. It looks pretty, Knave admitted. What is your field? the creature asked. Do you have the capability to appreciate this? My field? Knave paused. I'm not sure. Why don't you try explaining it to me? I will give you an overview. At that moment, a message arrived from the drone to his right. The drone had sent it by line-of-sight laser, probably without the buzzer even noticing. Operations are ongoing exterior to this building, it reminded him. I'm in no hurry to get back out there. I think a talking buzzer is more strategically valuable than getting our asses shot off, don't you? Agreed. Nave turned his attention back to the alien. It seemed to enjoy talking about its project, seemed to welcome the chance to speak about it. We only know the language from wall carvings, and I haven't the slightest idea how this language could be transmitted via sound waves. Both my language and yours evolved from spoken words, you see, and the grammar. After a lifetime of study, I have only the haziest of ideas about how it might fit together. It's three-dimensional. I've been trying to model it. Knave was reminded of the sculptures he had seen on the way in. Okay, he said, so it's complex. Hugely. The alien nodded its head in a curiously human gesture. The drone's blasters followed every move of the alien, twitching from side to side and swivelling up and down. The drones would never take their eyes off the alien, watching it with absolutely implacable concentration and patience. So what? Nave asked. The complexity alone isn't what is impressive, though it is extraordinary. What is impressive is that this complexity is combined with operators. Operators? Yes. The buzzer turned its head from the flashing symbols and carved areas to look directly at Knave. For example, if you yelled kill, your two friends here would pepper me with blaster fire and mass driver rounds until I stopped twitching. Knave didn't answer. This is not an order... The order has already been given. You have already told these two mechanical myrmidons what to do when such a word is yelled. It is not a transfer of information either. They have all the information they require and are only awaiting your word. Your one single word unleashes a cascade of consequences ending in my death and the creature looked over its shoulder might even do some irreparable damage to my work. This is an operator. How can a written language contain operators? That, my tiny human friend, is an excellent question. Perhaps this is your field. Why are you telling me these things? They seem to me to be of strategic importance. Strategy is not my field. Neither is diplomacy or espionage. My field is languages. 
If you are interested in languages, I will talk to you about them. To me, that's strange, Nave said. He found himself liking this murderous-looking alien half-robot thing with empty eyes. Why are you so much bigger than the buzzers fighting out there? Nave asked. The determination of optimal size for each unit is not my field, the creature said evenly. But the use of the term buzzer is pejorative. It is intended to make the enemy seem subsentient, to make it easier for you to be a good soldier. I see, Nave said, and I am a good soldier, here to die for my betters. You are considered expendable? Exactly. That is excellent. Excellent? The buzzer had stopped talking. It was now staring at him. Its background humming noise had gotten louder. Ah, look, it said, pointing at a range of displays. The computations are reaching completion. This is why I could not evacuate. It will be the first decrypting of a complete sentence, including a conditional clause and operator. It is a small part of the decryption process, but it is an important part of my life's work. The symbols were moving more slowly now. A symbol kept being repeated in a position towards the bottom right of the screens. It changed shape slightly, then froze. Then the screen was surrounded by light for a few seconds. The screen went dead, displaying flat black, and the buzzer removed it from the wall. A freshly carved character was left in its place. Congratulations, Nave said. Thank you, the monster said. You know, Nave added, without my drones, the operator, Kill, would not be much use at all. Yes, exactly the point. So what is carrying out the operator here? The building we are in, the buzzer said. The structure around you. Nave started to get a bad feeling. If he had understood correctly, by carving this symbol, the monster had entered some sort of command into the walls of the building. So this building is some sort of machine? That's right, the buzzer said. It was disconcerting to talk to the buzzer. It had no mouth, and his suit sensors were telling him that it didn't use sound waves to transmit its words. They came exclusively from bursts of static heard over his radio, like the disembodied voices of faraway broadcasters. But the monster was right there, in the room with him. So the room is a machine, Nave said. That's a gross simplification of the character of this site, but yes, in a way. What does it do? Nave couldn't help gulping in trepidation at the end of his question. I am one of the foremost experts in this field, the buzzer said, but I don't know. How can you not know? You built this stupid thing, didn't you? We built the upper floors containing, I might add, important records and equipment that you destroyed. The buzzer had turned its empty eye sockets on him again, but these lower levels, they are older. How much older? They date back to before either of our cultures emerged. This place was in operation before our planets had assembled themselves from the warm dust circling our respective stars. This place was built by the Drifters? That is correct. But they were huge, bug-eyed psychopaths that tried to melt the universe down for spare parts. It's not a good idea to go messing with their stuff. I've seen a bunch of documentaries about it. Fairy tales and taboos. Stories to scare away the credulous. We, the monster said, generously including Knave, are beings of science. We investigate and learn, no matter the risks. I'm no scientist. I'm just a slug. The term slug is pejorative. You should say ground combat specialist. Shut up, will you? What is going to pop out of this machine, and where is it going to take us? Relax, the monster said. I doubt that anything significant will happen at all.
There was a blinding flash, and Knave was thrown backwards. He tried to stay on his feet, but he toppled onto his back, the suit cushioning his fall. He wasn't hurt, but he was prone on his back, looking at the ceiling. He heard the drone's weapons open fire, heard the buzzer scream over the intercom. The drones kept firing. Until it stopped twitching, Knave found himself thinking, the words coming unbidden. He tried to lever himself up on his elbows, opening his mouth to shout at the same time. Hold your fire! Hold your f- And then there was another flash, and Knave lost consciousness. Lying on his back, he had a perfect view of where the flash came from. The ceiling of the room was very complex, crisscrossed with technology and systems. At the centre was a large iris valve that was gaping open. It had opened so silently and so slowly that nobody had noticed, not even the drones. Within the ceiling, there was a writhing network of snake-like cables, connecting and disconnecting, all wrapped around some organic-looking central structure. The stamen of some worm-ridden, rotting mechanical flower. The iris valve was already sliding closed, hiding the hideous worms and the stamen as Knave's eyes closed. Chapter 6 Shavir's personal spaceship left the Drifter megastructure and joined the group of spaceships waiting in orbit. Their destination was the Ice Tomb and the latest Drifter discovery. The configuration fits, Shavir had said. It fits with your translation. The galaxy is full of cryovolcanoes, Altia had said. Shavir asked the room AI to project a screen. True, but we received more information. The most recently received video of the assault on the moon makes me certain there is something of interest there, Shavir told Altia. But prepare yourself. This comes from a war zone and is difficult to watch. The video showed the view from a camera mounted in the armour of an infantry soldier, male from the sound of his voice. There was a timestamp and the word Knave, the soldier's name. The soldier had his weapon aimed at a buzzer. But he didn't fire. Instead, the alien was explaining his research into the language of the drifters. Altier was captivated by the alien scientist's words, even if the soldier's questions were banal. Then came a flash. The camera tilted. There was a shot of the ceiling, more flashes and the sound of gunfire. The video froze. Altier turned to look at Shavir. You can go, Shavir said, and I'll come and pick you up later so we can have something to eat. Altia went back to her suite and sat in her study. A study, the idea of having a whole huge study assigned to her when she was being transported, took some getting used to. Her suite also had a bedroom, lounge, dining room with a food synthesizer and a bathroom. It was like something she had never seen before. The decoration and interior design was tasteful and comfortable, and the food produced by the food synthesizer was delicious. It was the closest thing possible to luxury that could be found on a military spaceship. She also had large transparent panels in every room. Transparent armour was much more expensive than opaque armour so windows were usually faked with holograms and screens, but the windows in her quarters were undoubtedly real. She had pushed her desk in the study up against the floor-to-ceiling transparent armour panel, and she had a wonderful view of the stars. She had also instructed the sub-intelligence in charge of her room to highlight the other spaceships of the convoy that were visible through the window. The sub-intelligence was so advanced that Altia suspected it was right on the boundary between sub-intelligence and full AI. It was such an intelligent machine mind that she felt a little uncomfortable ordering it round as if it were a simple maintenance droid. 
When she had ordered it to highlight the spaceships, it had done a beautiful job. It drew little oval hologram frames in the air just in front of the window, one for each spaceship, and projected live pictures of each one within the frame, along with some useful metrics on speed and distance and the spaceship's name in an attractive font. The effect was so pleasing that Altea hadn't needed to customise this default setup at all. None of the spaceships were visible to the naked eye, and the distances between them were so wide that even the computer-generated images in the frames were a little indistinct and pixelated. The number of spaceships visible from her study kept changing as the formation was changed and the spaceships drilled manoeuvres but there were four in their tasteful little frames at the moment, all large military designs. She tore her eyes from the view, went back to the translation, and was immediately engrossed. A few hours later, her doorbell chirped. Hello, Altea said. Hello, it's Shavir, a disembodied voice replied. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all. Could I come in? Of course, I'm in the study. The subintelligence was discreetly listening to their exchange of words and chose this moment to slide the entrance door to the suite open. Altea heard the soft sigh of whatever mechanism made the door move, then heard the thud of shoes on the firm covering of the decking of her suite. The footsteps came nearer, came into the study without hesitation. Shavir had visited many times before, knew her way and stopped behind her. Altea felt Shavir lean to get a better view of her screens. Interesting, Shavir's voice came right next to her ear. Altea didn't bother to look around. She knew what Shavir looked like, a tall woman with intelligent eyes. What's interesting? Altea asked. You are making good progress with the decipherment? Oh yes, Altea turned from the screens at last. Don't talk about it too much, Shavir said. We need to keep this breakthrough secret. I had to be quite inventive in coming up with a reason for diverting an entire battle group to transport us to a war zone. But why do we have to keep this secret? This is the sort of breakthrough we should be shouting from the rooftops. We should be diverting the best minds of Tarazat and beyond to the task of decrypting, reading and interpreting all of this. It's frustrating, I know, but it's the size of the breakthrough that's the problem. This is going to change everything. The drifter system will become the centre of a maelstrom of combat. It would tear Tarazat apart and possibly spell the downfall of human space as the other species unite to acquire our knowledge, or, at the very least, deny it to us. You're the boss, but I think you're underestimating humanity. This might unite all the petty little polities. Instead of fighting over this, we might unite to study it. Mm, I'll keep my decision under review, Shavir said. Have you found anything that might confirm my suspicions about our destination? I'm not sure what your suspicions are. Altea just failed to keep a note of sarcasm out of her voice. Shavir straightened up, walked across the study and sat in a chair near the door as though blocking escape. She brought her hands up and interlaced her long, delicate fingers before using them to support her chin. It might seem to you, with the information you have, that we are chasing shadows, she said at last. Altea opened her mouth to protest, but Shavir cut her off and kept talking. I, however, she continued, am the most senior member of the Ministry of Science, the government department with access to the most information and most sophisticated analysis of said information. I can assure you that, Although it is far from certain that we are journeying to the ice tomb of the drifters, I do have some hope that we might not be completely mistaken about our goal. I... I see, Altea stuttered. Now, do you have anything new for me? Anything to further strengthen my suspicions about our objective? Um, there is something, 
Altia admitted. Excellent, Shavir said, though I don't appreciate you making me work for it like this. All right, out with it. Um, we are quite certain now, assuming this text isn't just a fairy story, that the Drifter system was in contact with the Ice Tomb for some time after the Ice Tomb was established. OK, Shavir nodded. There is a record of a mutiny among the crew of the spaceship travelling to the Ice Tomb on what we think though their numbering system is still obscure, was the 300th voyage. A single spaceship? According to the records, but it could be that the text refers to a fleet, and that is why a singular noun is used. Interesting. Go on. What the mutiny was about is also difficult to interpret, but the text does refer to trials of summary justice, Perhaps executions, perhaps marooning carried out on the 300th journey, the 302nd and various others, though I am even less sure of when they occurred, contemporaneously or perhaps much later. This is juicy, Shavir said. You have been busy. It's all in the report, Altia said. I can send it to you, or could make a physical copy. Altia picked a data chip from a little alcove in her desk and held it up for Shavir to see. Shavir nodded almost imperceptibly and held out a hand to receive the data chip. Altia got up from her desk and crossed the room. When she was in front of Shavir's chair, she proffered the small chunk of plastic. Shavir took the data chip. She was looking in Altia's eyes as she did so. All perfectly fascinating, Shavir said. But how does this help me? We can just send one of the spaceships from the convoy to check planets along the way, Altia said. It's already happening, Shavir said. Already? Altia replied. Yes, I have sent spaceships to thoroughly investigate the surface of the planets along our route. We, however, are going to Phaeton 7. It's not a very evocative name, Altia murmured absent-mindedly, but I suppose I prefer it to Ice Tomb. Chapter 7 Nave woke up among a scene of destruction. His drones were completely unharmed and had obviously been the agents of all the destruction. They had behaved as the buzzer had predicted. Nave even wondered if the buzzer had put the idea into their heads. They had kept firing till their target, the buzzer itself, was reduced to a weird organic-looking metal mess. Also, as the buzzer had predicted, its delicate language experiments had been blasted to smithereens. There was hardly any trace of the monitors that had once displayed the beautiful and complex signs of the language of the drifters in ever-changing combinations. The wall behind the monitors had also suffered, with numerous craters, scorch marks and collapsed sections. Only one carved sign had been left untouched, the operator sign. Well, I hope you're proud of yourselves, my hungry wolves. It seems you've blasted this poor buzzer and his life's work to smithereens. The drone on the right beeped non-committally while the other remained silent. Whoa, whatever that flash was, Nave continued, I don't think he intended it to target me. Still no answer. Whatever, Nave muttered. He climbed to his feet and gathered up his weapon. I guess there's no reason to hang around in here, he said. Let's get out there and find out what's going on. When Nave got outside of the science research structure, back into the driving snow of the moon's atmosphere, followed by his little troop of drones, it was to discover from a new message scrolling across the interior of his visor that he had been designated a rear unit and was being recalled to the bottom of the mountain. He looked at the coordinates he had been given. It was a featureless stretch of mountainside. Control must have its reasons, he decided, and headed off in the direction indicated. 
His connection with control then promptly dropped out again, then came back, then dropped out. The buzzer interference was back too. But now, what had seemed to be just strange alien psychological warfare seemed to sound like the voice of the alien scientist he had just seen killed by his own drones. He climbed down the hillside. They were rarely under fire, though they were strafed once or twice by buzzer atmospheric units. They were approaching the coordinates they had been given when they saw it. Up ahead was a huge dropship, twice as big as the type deployed by the Galaxy Dog and carrying enormously more armour. It was more a hollowed-out slab of armour with flight systems attached than it was a spaceship. It was dark, and there were two gaping holes where a couple of its assault ramps had been deployed. Although only two were open, hinged down to form boarding ramps, there were eight giant doors in the base of the spaceship, each one facing a different direction. He checked his tactical map of the theatre of operations. It was zoomed in on the dropship he had just been given responsibility for. He and his drones were the only friendly units marked anywhere nearby, apart from a knot of Tarazat units and some hostiles nearer the dropship. There were flashes of light near the giant beached spaceship. The fighting, though, it wasn't heavy. Nave refocused his eyes away from the tactical map, back onto the landscape, and looked around again. This time he got a good look at the terrain. He saw that some of the things he had assumed to be rocks in the dim light were in fact the remains of buzzers and drones. He didn't see any human power armour among the rocks, but he assumed there were the carcasses of people too, mixed in among the mechanical remains, even if he couldn't see them. By the time he had looked back at the dropship, the fighting was over. A suit of assault armour reared out of the gloom. You, inside, a voice emanating from the armour yelled at him. But leave the wolves out here. Knave gratefully complied, climbing the ramp into the belly of the massive assault dropship. The figure was right behind him. There, it said. It was pointing to a position at the top of the landing ramp, where he would have some cover and also be able to see out. He went where the figure was pointing. Over the distorted communications, he couldn't tell if his new companion was male or female, and the armour the person was wearing wasn't giving anything away either. All he could tell from the armour was that this warrior came from a unit with much better equipment than his. The figure turned from observing the view through the doorway to look at Nave. Your job, the figure said, is to make sure no buzzers come up that ramp, understand? Knave nodded. The figure slapped him on the shoulder and ran down the ramp and out onto the broken icy terrain. Knave watched the figure running off, saw it joined by a drone he didn't recognise, sleeker and more deadly looking than his wolves, with bigger gun ports. Then he and his remaining five drones were alone. Completely alone. His tactical map showed the action moving away from him, and he started to relax a little bit. He told two of his drones to go dig out the units he had lost during the buzzer tank ambush. He couldn't abide the thought of leaving two functioning drones under the ice. The Navy told everyone that the drones lacked proper AI and that they should be thought of as expendable equipment. They would take a dim view of him sending two perfectly good drones off into harm's way. Knave shrugged to himself. He didn't care what the Navy thought. It would be half a day before they returned, but they were successful and his drone count went up from five to seven. By that time, Knave was feeling more at home with his new charge. The dropship was nothing like the Galaxy Dog. The Galaxy Dog was designed to drop off mobile units and come pick them up later. There were numerous flight crew and support areas. This dropship was designed for a one-way trip. 
It was just drone racking, rank upon rank of drone racking, all empty. All the drones and their handlers were out on the ice, climbing the mountain, looking for buzzers to kill and buzzer structures to clear. Nave spent as much time as he could where he had been told to stand, but even ducked into cover, Nave felt exposed. The door was just huge, big enough for six car-sized drones to exit side by side. To hell with this, Nave said to himself. He lowered his masked driver and started looking round for a way to close the huge ramp. He found the controls and pushed the large square yellow button that returned the door to vertical. The door immediately started to lift, very slowly. As soon as it was closed tight, he found a smaller access door. One of his drones was standing nearby, outside in the fog, ice and snow. Its torso was sweeping left and right, scanning the surroundings for hostiles. Can you get in through here? he asked it. The drone walked over and stopped in front of the door. Green laser scanners splashed out and swept up and down the door frame. The drone thought for a second, then seemed to come to a decision. It retracted the mass driver in its nose, folded down the weapons pods on its wings, doors closing on missile racks as the pods folded, and hunched its teardrop-shaped body down on its huge ostrich legs. It shuffled forward and, with a screeching of metal and some scratched paint, it was through. Great, Nave said. Tell the others to get in here. I don't see the point of centuries. We know they'll be coming after all. We just don't know when. And close the door after you. A second drone was already squeezing inside through the door. Oh, Nave offered his masked driver to the nearest drone. And hold on to this. The drone deployed a manipulator hand on the end of a snake-like arm of metal from a hatch in its belly and took the mass driver. It then stowed the weapon away in a bay that opened on its underside. Nave turned away while it was doing this and his eyes searched around for a viewport, somewhere high up where he could get a good view of the tactical situation. He saw an area above him that acted as a viewing platform above the drone racks. He could see that it projected outside of the dropship as well. There was a ladder up to it, wide and robust enough to support power armour. Nave climbed the stairs and entered. The space seemed to serve a multitude of roles. It provided oversight of the drone bay, there were windows with a good forward view, and there were admin areas and berths, too. Nave slipped out of his armour and sat down and stared out of the viewport he had found. He could see that the battle was raging. Looks like you're better off in here, Nave said to himself. Then he saw two points of light approaching fast. They streaked past the windows of Nave's view perch while the dropship was rocked by explosions. The shocks were strong enough that they would have thrown him off his feet if he wasn't in an acceleration couch. What the hell? he yelled. Missiles came from a soothing female voice. Nave spun round. The voice had sounded like it was right behind his left shoulder. More buzzer interference in the communications? It took him a moment to realise that he was still alone, that it wasn't buzzers. It was the spaceship computer. Missiles? Impacts registered at access ramp 4. Nave ran across the control area from the windows at the front that looked outside to the windows at the back that looked down on the drone bay. There was obvious damage at the access door, but it was still closed and it had held. Return fire, Nave yelled at the ship's computer. My weaponry is offline. Command is sending air superiority units to deal with the threat. Nave never found out if the air superiority units took out the attacking craft, or if the enemy had gone on to attack other targets with lighter armour. All he knew was that it didn't come back. And so the battle went on. Fighting ebbed and flowed, coming near and drawing away again. 
his orders didn't change. His display instructed him to hold the terrain around the dropship. Outside, and comfortably far away, fighting went on and on, and then came nightfall. Ship, he said, call me Fortress. Fortress? It's a nickname. Are you full AI? Yep. But you look, Knave said, then paused a second. You look as if you were designed to be disposable. Your engines don't look like they'll get you back into orbit. I'm an orbital delivery and recoverable structure. They'll come and get me once the fighting is over, and then I'll be dropped into the middle of the next mess. Do they often leave someone here to hang around and keep you company? Yes, usually three or four. These personnel were lost soon after planetfall. You're a replacement. Right, Knave said. It's just that I wasn't briefed for this. Is there something I'm supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be out there patrolling? I'll tell you if there's anything to do. Just get some sleep for now. Knave tore his eyes away from the battle and forced them closed. The fighting seemed to be higher up the mountain, which he supposed meant that Tarazat forces were gaining ground. He closed his eyes and went to sleep. He didn't know how long he had been sleeping when he was woken by an alarm. It wasn't coming from inside his armour. It was coming from the speakers and screens dotted around the bridge. As soon as his eyes opened, the noise and flashing lights stopped. Knave could immediately see a lot had changed. The fighting was much closer, though still too far away to see any detail. Just glimpses of explosions through the driving snow. Problems, Knave prompted. There are enemy units within striking range. You want me to take the puppies out and deal with them? Puppies? Wolfhound drones? Yes, the spaceship's calm female voice said. You and the remaining drones should ensure that they do not enter. That's what the other guy said. You should begin your defence immediately. The enemy units are approaching slowly and their weaponry is still at long range. If they approach much closer, your chances of surviving as you exit the vehicle will be significantly reduced. Knave ran down to the bay doors. He held his hands out to the drone with his mass driver, and the drone gave it back to him. OK, open the door, he yelled. The same ramp they had entered by started to slowly hinge downward. Knave climbed it as soon as the gradient was gentle enough, followed by his remaining seven drones. Fire at will, he said. The first billows of snow started blowing into the hold, and visibility was definitely worse than before. Mass driver rounds were slamming into the ramp now, so Knave dived into the snow, rolled to the side and came up firing. His drones were rushing forward, a much more inviting target to the buzzers. The buzzers concentrated fire on the lead drone, which had its armour torn and strewn around the ramp. Another drone was hit a glancing blow in the leg, but kept moving. The last drone out was the drone that had had its nose torn off by its mass driver malfunctioning. It was firing with its blasters, its only weapon system still online. Knave saw a very tempting target in his sights. The entire upper portion of a buzzer as it moved position from one piece of rocky icy cover to another. Knave pulled the trigger on his mass driver. He felt the weapon judder as rods were chipped off the ammo block and fed into the chamber, then heard the whine as they were accelerated at relativistic speeds towards the enemy. Long lines of lightning blue ionised atmosphere were drawn through the falling snow, and where they touched turned into destruction. Ice was plummeted apart and thrown around in head-sized chunks, snow billowed in clouds, rock chippings ricocheted and the buzzer dived for cover, somehow unharmed by all the mayhem. A heavy finger icon appeared in his field of view, 
warning him that his shooting had been uncontrolled, wild in its aim and wild in the amount of ammo he had expended. His drone's shots were much more accurate and their ammo use much more controlled. He had kept rolling thunder across the landscape to no effect while they were spitting little controlled bursts of fire and they were finding targets. One buzzer was struck at the joint between its head and torso, blowing its metal fruit bowl head off. Another was hit a glancing blow on the shoulder, sending it down into cover. Soon, both sides were in cover and there was a protracted firefight. Knave cursed as he lost another drone. Then he saw a rock explode just in front of his faceplate. The mass driver rod had hit his hiding place with such force that splinters of ice and rock were sent in all directions. Cracks appeared in his faceplate, but only, according to suit sensors, in the outer layer. It was cosmetic damage, but if the mass driver rod had been just a little to the side, it would have taken his head clean off. Knave rolled away from what was obviously a compromised position. He came to his feet and looked about for some other cover. Instead, he saw a buzzer, just a few steps away. It had a mass driver in each of its lower arms and a wicked-looking blade in each of its upper arms. Knave muttered another curse as the buzzer brought one of the mass drivers up to point at him. Knave knew what he shouldn't do. He knew he shouldn't just stand there and return fire. The creature had two heavy weapons to his one. He knew he shouldn't run away. He would just make a tempting target to get shot in the back. He knew he shouldn't run towards it. That would just bring him in range of the creature's blades. He took a good look at them. All the adrenaline in his system, along with a cocktail of combat drugs that they would only give to a conscript, somebody with no thought for future side effects, was slowing time down enough for every detail to impress itself on him. The creature's eye sockets were empty. They were more passive sensor pits than active eyes, and the blades were glinting in the cold light. Each was a bit longer than a knife, but shorter than a sword. The blades were complex too, with holes in to save on weight. Knave ran sideways, round from the creature's weapons, kicking up ice and dust at his heels while he ran. It wouldn't have taken long for the buzzer to adjust its aim for the running target, but just then it was hit by blaster fire. One of his puppies was firing blasters at the buzzer, while its mass driver was engaging another target. It was his own outdated and undergunned drone, but to him, at that moment, in this situation, it was an awesome and welcome vision. The blaster charges pounded the buzzer's armour and scarred it, distracting it, making it turn to gauge its new assailant. Knave spun round, dropped to one knee in the snow and snatched at the trigger of his mass driver. It started juddering and whining and lightning reached out for the buzzer and enveloped it. Limbs were sent flying and the robotic torso of the creature was ripped open. It slipped to the ice, its weapons dropped and discarded in the snow. It was still twitching and Knave had a compulsion to go and take a closer look. He trudged forward through the snow, toward the buzzer. He wanted to be there, though how watching the robot killing machine gasp its last breath would tell him anything, he wasn't sure. As he approached, the interference in the communications got louder, the usual whispering turning into a murmuring. He thought he could pick out words from the incoherent mess. He thought he heard something at least. Tomb. Grave sepulchre. He looked over at the drone which had helped him out. It had taken a few steps closer to the buzzer too. Its video sensors, it had eight, like a spider, were divided between monitoring him and monitoring the dying buzzer. I'm imagining these words right, Knave said to his drone. The buzzer isn't speaking, is it? He had been warned not to talk to the drones or to anthropomorphize them. 
just give them orders and evaluate their reports. But they responded to language, and it was all too easy to ascribe them the emotions and intelligence that he was told simply wasn't there. But then again, slugs were routinely lied to, so the drone could easily be piloted by the most sophisticated AIs ever designed, or some less scandalous truth somewhere in between, for all he knew. Whatever the reality, Knave had long ago decided it was best to play it safe and be nice to them. The drone sent a message via communications laser. The message unpacked itself in the corner of his visor. I hear nothing, the message said. OK, Knave nodded. Have we got them all? The drone's communications laser was flashing again. All accounted for, the message said. The drone left one of its eight eyes pointing in his direction, while the others trained on the buzzer. It now looked totally inert, and from close up, the fact that it was pure technology without much in the way of organic components was impossible to deny. It seemed to resemble the drone far more than it resembled Knave, which was an unsettling thought. On an impulse, Knave reached into the technology spilling from the belly of the beast. It was a more and more uncomfortable feeling with the drone watching, though Knave could only guess whether the drone felt the same discomfort, whether it felt anything at all while watching an animal reach into the guts of a mechanical life form it had just killed. Then the moment was broken. There was an intensification of the fireworks display in the sky and activity on the mountain above them. Knave used his visor's range-finding feature to increase the magnification of what he was seeing. The very top of the mountain came into sharply magnified focus. The buzzer structures at the top of the mountain were erupting into explosions and showers of debris. The structures took wave after wave of attacks, the attacking atmospheric units moving so quickly that Knave only caught glimpses of them. The attack went on and on, but then each successive wave started to produce less damage, with fewer and fewer ships involved in each strafing run. The buzzers were taking a toll on their attackers. Buzzer dropships, Knave saw, were now intermixed with Tarazat Navy dropships, both sides reinforcing their positions. This damn battle's never going to end, Knave said, to the drone, to the AI inside Fortress, to himself. He wasn't sure who he was talking to. If both sides keep feeding units into this meat grinder. It was the ship's AI that answered. It's termed a war of attrition. Get back in here, you and your drones. You're not needed out there at the moment. The buzzers threatening this spaceship have drawn back. They're probably going to join in that mess up there at the top of the mountain. Chapter 8 Altia had been invited to dine with Shavir again. They were sitting at Shavir's large table, while an attractively designed droid, its surfaces a subtle ceramic blue, brought them food and kept their glasses topped up. Shavir was running a hologram in pride of place against the wall opposite her window. Altia glanced at it and saw what she at first had thought was abstract was in fact some kind of tactical display of units. She realised that it must represent the Tarazat forces converging on Ice Tomb. The Tarazat invaders were coloured green, while the buzzer defenders of the planet were coloured red. They were very much in the minority, and for every red buzzer icon there were at least two Tarazat Navy dance partners. Shavir saw where Altia was looking. Wonderful, isn't it? Shavir said. The battle for the planet is pretty much over. We have units all through the structure, and between skirmishes, they have been sending back some very interesting information. Such as, Altia prompted. Altia was at least as intrigued by the alien structure as Shavir was. 
She would have preferred that it wasn't at the centre of ongoing military operations, but even the threat of the surrounding battle couldn't entirely dim her appetite for the fresh knowledge to be discovered. Is it really a drifter artefact? Altia added. I think there is little doubt, Shavir said, and it is even more extensive than we dared hope. Even the buzzer technology that has been overlaid on the drifter's artefacts' upper layers is interesting. It is more advanced than the technology issued to combat units. We may have underestimated our buzzer friends if this technology is anything to go by. I can't wait to see it, Altia said, taking a forkful of her food, but pausing before putting it into her mouth. But, Shavir prompted, but the circumstances, Altia mumbled. Shavir could see that Altia was a little unnerved by the fighting that was still going on. She decided it might be a good idea to try and calm her nerves if she was going to get the best work out of her. We are going in directly behind the invading forces, Shavir said. Altia could tell from Shavir's tone of voice that even the slightest trepidation about going to a war zone, especially one where victory was assured, was seen by her as some kind of weakness. Altia felt she had to explain. I've never been this close to a war zone, Altia admitted. There's no cause for alarm. We have an overwhelming force on our side. Shavir walked over to the transparent section of the wall in her quarters. The star they were heading towards could now be easily picked out with the naked eye. It was about ten times brighter than the surrounding star field. Shavir placed her hand on the surface of the glass. Her fingers were bunched together like the beak of a raptor. She then extended her fingers till they were fully splayed out. In response, the room computer overlaid a two-dimensional projection onto the window. Where the pinprick star had been was now an image of an ice moon. They wouldn't have to penetrate far into the system. The moon was well beyond the star's frost line. According to the text box beneath it, it was a typical ice moon with a subsurface ocean and a core of rock and silicate. It didn't have much atmosphere to speak of, mostly nitrogen that had evaporated from its icy surface, but there was enough atmosphere for some nitrogen cloud cover. And the atmosphere was so cold that what there was of it hung like a thick blanket, even though it didn't extend more than half a kilometre above the surface. There were ghostly arrows pointing towards the moon, each one with a group of spaceship icons attached. Look, Shavir said, here we have the 4th Fleet, the Tanaxar Exploratory Squadron, numerous elements of the Deep Space Fleet here and here and here. At the apex of the attack is the mighty Emperor's Claw Planetary Assault Group. The buzzer forces on the planet and the units flitting about within the system will be crushed before we even get there. I guess that's reassuring, Altia murmured. Altia took a sip from the delicate glass she held in her hand, a sparkling and lightly intoxicating drink that Shavir often served. Look here, Shavir said. This is one of the biggest buzzer forces in the local arena. It's surrounded by two, uh, no wait, three space superiority fighter groups. As they watched, the vessel's counter displayed below the buzzer group counted down from 257 to 256. What did I tell you? Shavir said. All resistance will be crushed by the time we get there. And it did seem that she was right. They were aboard one of the most advanced warships in Tarazat's arsenal, but as they approached the planet, they were hardly required to fire a shot lose off a missile or any of the other myriad of offensive actions the spaceship was capable of. They were surrounded by vessels, but they were all friendlies. Shavir's spaceship slid into orbit and a shuttle almost immediately detached 
taking Shavir, Altir, and an assortment of other personnel down to the surface. Altir didn't fail to notice, however, that the shuttle was a military design with two weapons turrets slung beneath its belly, even though there were thin-skinned and unarmed civilian shuttles in the bay. The surface and atmosphere might not be entirely under their control, it seemed. The view from the shuttle was breathtaking. Altea was used to arriving at densely populated planets, with surfaces encrusted by structures. This ice moon was featureless and wild. Well, not entirely featureless, she noticed. There was a huge crater taking up a good portion of the entire light side of the moon. At the centre was a high mountain, as was often the case, she knew, with such huge craters, and a nearby cryovolcano spewing snow and ice into the gigantic feature to be blown about by the winds of its local weather conditions. Where are we touching down? Shavir asked the pilot. The pilot pointed through the forward viewplate at the mountain. We'll be setting down there, the pilot said, highlighting a landing pad on a secondary buzzer structure near the buzzer structure on the mountaintop with a blue glowing square. I see, Altia nodded. Thanks. Her voice sounded nervous, even in her own ears. She lowered her eyes, embarrassed, and watched the surface of the moon scrolling by silently underneath them through one of the lower windows in the cockpit. The surface of the moon, ice tomb, was chiaroscuro, some areas in blinding light, some in impenetrable shade. Altea saw flashes amongst the shadows. The pilot caught where her eyes were focused. Combat, he said. But I thought resistance had been crushed, Altea said. That's what they told me. It's a statistical thing, the pilot said. Resistance is considered crushed when combat falls below a certain threshold. It can take years more for actual combat to cease. Great, Altea said. They were obviously descending towards the crater with its central mountain and the flashes of combat were most frequent in the shadows of the mountain's slope, and almost incessant at the apex. The most interesting structures left by the drifters are likely to be found at the summit, Shavir said. But the situation up there is still a little too hot. The buzzers have gotten themselves well dug in, and we can't just reduce the site to rubble with heavy bombardment because of the possible repercussions for the important artefacts that might be present. It's most perplexing. Starting final approach, the pilot said. We can, however, Shavir continued, at least examine that ancillary structure, the one we saw in the video. The one where the drones killed the alien scientist? Exactly, Shavir said. Most regrettable, but at least that infantryman had the presence of mind to interrogate the alien before the incident that resulted in its death. Altia watched over the pilot's shoulder as they approached the landing pad, still outlined in blue in their forward view. The pad was ringed by drones, and there were troopers too, Slugs, she had heard them called, wearing huge suits of power armour. The drones and troopers had their backs to the pad, their faces and their weapons pointing outward. Scramjets screeched incessantly overhead. To Altea, the drones forming the protective ring at the edge of the landing pad looked like some unclean cross-pollination between a flightless bird and an insect. The entire ugly form was covered in armoured plates, and two huge claws projected forward from the machines, except they weren't claws, they were guns. As if to underline that fact, one of the drones twitched to attention, realigning the gun claws and fired four or five shots at a target that Altea couldn't see. Then, two other drones joined in, followed by one of the troopers, then there was a moment of tense attention before they went back to waiting, being on the lookout. 
The troopers in their armour, Altea thought, were, if anything, worse looking than the drones. They looked like devils. The two giant legs, projecting much further than the human pilot's legs, which, Altea judged, were most likely encased within the armour's thighs. The legs ended in some kind of mechanical foot with two toes. It looked like an efficient design, allowing the foot to change configuration of the lower surface based on the type of terrain it encountered. But, almost unavoidably, it also looked like a cloven hoof. The torso of the armour was, more or less, the same dimensions of those of the human pilot, but they weren't form-fitting enough to tell if the pilot was male or female. The arms, however, were oversized, with giant mechanical actuators covered in sturdy armour, giving a lean, muscular look. Each trooper had a kind of oversized gun, requiring both arms to control, one hand near the trigger, one hand out towards the muzzle. From the configuration, Altea guessed it used a gravitic track to accelerate mass to a relativistic speed and spew it towards an enemy horribly crude, but probably quite effective, she guessed. The helmets were the worst thing. They were mostly featureless, apart from armour seams where the armour plates forming the helmet met, and the stubby bumps of communications antennas at the back of the head which meant the only real feature was a single dark slash across the front. Transparent armour, Altea guessed, useful to give the wearer visuals if their display systems failed. So that is what our troopers and drones look like, Altea said. Yes, Shavir said. What of it? Our buzzer scientist was confronted by a trooper flanked by two of those drones. It is little wonder the poor creature was so frightened, so worried that they would stomp his delicate experiments, which they did, Shavir observed, in the end. The shuttle carried on down towards the landing pad, despite the occasional exchanges of fire between its defenders and unseen attackers. Altea put on her environment suit helmet as the shuttle landed among the armoured figures, who parted to allow them, once they had exited the shuttle, to walk over to an airlock and enter the building. Altea took off her helmet after transitioning through the airlock. They were within the walls of the drifters. She recognised them immediately. Shavir, Altea saw, already had her helmet off and was breathing deeply. Altea followed suit and took a deep breath, only to find that the air was the dry, nasty output of a temporary human life support system. Where is the trooper? Altea asked, the soldier in the video. I'll arrange to have him attached to your staff, Shavir said, but for now, go and get as much science done as possible before the rest of the Ministry turns up to stifle our efforts with all of their red tape and stupid rules. But you're the head of the Science Ministry, Altea said, and I could get rid of all the paperwork and bureaucracy if I wanted, Shavir smiled. I think you overestimate my power. Altea looked round to see who might be able to overhear their scandalous conversation. Just she and Shavir were in the airlock chamber. Their privacy was secure. So, Altea said, what is the first order of business? Keep an open mind, Shavir said. I just want you to go and take a look around. See what catches your eye. See what science you want to do. Talk to the slug. Knave, Altea interrupted. His name is Knave, I think. Talk to him. See if he can shed any light on this amazing technological treasure trove. I have to go and deal with some bureaucracy. Shavir walked purposefully off, tucking her helmet under her arm. She had never been in the complex before, but seemed to know where she was going. She stopped as she was about to disappear down a corridor. In some ways, she said, I envy you, Altea. 
In your lowly position, you have so much more time to do science. And then she was gone. Altea tucked her helmet under her arm, then picked up a data pad, one of the many hanging from a series of hooks that had recently been glued to the wall. She called up a map of the complex, choosing 2D when the pad offered the choice of having the information displayed on the pad's screen or projecting it in the air above the pad as a hologram. There was a nice, helpful You Are Here icon displayed in the middle of the screen. Emboldened by the simplicity of the map, she went off to explore. There were only a few, seemingly randomly chosen, sections where the ancient drifter machines were producing a breathable atmosphere, and they were all on the higher levels. The lower Altea went, down ramps and wide, shallow staircases, the more often she had to put her helmet back on. Eventually, she was just wearing the helmet almost continuously. She just walked, looking left, right, above and below as she went, like a tourist admiring the architecture of a beautiful city. She saw structures that she recognised from her time studying the drifter system. There were machines that she knew the shape of very well, though she could only guess at the function, and there were structures that were completely new. The hieroglyphs looked similar but there were differences that she immediately noticed. It was all fascinating. As she walked, she came to a giant auditorium-like space. There was no seating, but the shallow steps, common in the structure, formed a semicircle around a central area. The central area was entirely taken up by a stone obelisk, with metal panels in every face, about three metres in height. Altea went to the centre of the chamber and stumbled for a second on the uneven floor. She looked down to see giant vents or drains in the floor. Each slit of each vent sealed by its own long, thin little door. Some were open, a light breeze coming from the vent, but most were closed. Altea had no idea what they might be for, and couldn't come up with even the wildest guess about why the room was designed the way it was. Was it something that meant the room needed to be hosed down after use, she wondered, but then discarded the notion, knowing better than to jump at lurid interpretations of drifter technology. Keep an open mind, she told herself, and look for evidence. She went over to the obelisk and attempted to read the hieroglyphics. She didn't have any of her databases with her or any other tools and she wasn't making much progress until she noticed one section that seemed to be specifically simplified, as if for a child. Altea made a note of her location and started to record some audio for a future report. This part roughly translates as something like, Altea paused, collecting her thoughts, and their punishment shall be by the chimeras they themselves created. Chimeras, punishments, simplified warnings. She looked down at the drains and wondered if there perhaps wasn't some lurid use that the room had been put to by the drifters after all. She stared at the obelisk, trying to unlock some more of its meaning. Then movement caught her eye. It took her a moment to realise what it was. A shadow. There was a large shadow on the wall opposite her, and it had moved slightly. She realised that the shadow must be being cast by something behind her. She had the irrational feeling that it might be best not to look. If she just ignored the shadow, whatever was casting it might just go away. But she forced herself to turn, to look over her shoulder. She saw a buzzer halfway down the shallow steps and moving slowly, creeping up on her. The buzzer recoiled, realising that it had been spotted. It drew a knife which looked dangerous, though more of a tool than a weapon. Altea threw her data tablet at it 
and ran. Chapter 9 The Tarazat Deep Space Navy had a firmer and firmer grip on the ice moon. More friendly spaceships arrived in orbit every day and the forces on the surface swelled and swelled. Their position was becoming unassailable. Life for a slug was becoming routine. Things had been following the same pattern for a while, sleeping on the fortress in Spartan quarters, being woken, sent out to deal with whatever buzzers had gotten too close, then back inside to eat and sleep. Fortress had repair droids, friendly little metal crabs, who looked after the drones between encounters, recharging, reloading and repairing. Even the most badly damaged of his drones now had a new nose and a new mass driver. They had been taking heavy casualties to start with, drone after drone throwing armour and debris across the landscape surrounding Fortress. But now they were well practised at getting out of Fortress in plenty of time to take up positions, set up a crossfire and mow down approaching buzzers. Their skills hadn't been developed a moment too soon, what with only seven drones left. Knave's favourites were the two that had been dug out of the ice. He drew teeth on the side of them in black paint. One set like a shink, a sea predator from his home planet, and one set like a banser, a mythical creature from legend. He soon took to calling them by these two names. Shink! he said to the drone he had drawn Predator teeth on. Move those buzzer carcasses further away from Fortress and see if you can hide them in a ravine or something. The piles of buzzers out there are giving me the heebie-jeebies. He turned to the other drone. Bansa! The drone turned a few eyes to look in his direction. You go out with him. Cover him while he works. The drone beeped an acknowledgement. It wasn't the first time it had vocalised, but it was the first time they had done it where Fortress could hear them. Up to that point, the drones had only ever used laser communications or radio in front of the spaceship AI. I didn't know they vocalised with you, Fortress said. I guess you've been accepted into the pack, although you don't have much of a pack left. The vocalisation means they like you. I've seen it before. It was two days later when Knave was woken by the usual proximity alarms. He had come to be very familiar with them. He, Shink, Bansa and the others had become a well-oiled team. They had been victorious in all their recent encounters. The worst thing that had happened in the last few days was that Shink had taken a little superficial damage, but mostly cracks and burning on the armour. Fortress was brimming with ammo and replacement parts, and it felt like they could carry on this way for days, or even weeks, though deep down, Knave knew his luck would eventually run out. OK, he mumbled, here we go again. No, wait, Fortress said, they're friendlies. A large monitor near the flight couch where Knave was resting sprang to life. It showed a suit of Tarazat battle armour of the type worn by lowly slugs like himself and three wolfhound drones. That looks like somebody from the Galaxy Dog, Knave said. At least the equipment looks right. Confirmed, Fortress said. The human is called Henrik. Henrik, Knave virtually yelled. He wasn't particularly fond of Henrik and their relationship had never developed to the point where he considered Henrik a friend. But he found he was suddenly very glad to see him. He went down to the bay and opened the huge ramp. His suit established a laser communications connection to Henrik, even though he was still out of sight in the driving snow. Welcome aboard, Henrik, Knave yelled. The voice that came back was distorted by lost packets of information as flurries of snow interrupted their laser light connection. Knave was quite glad. It sounded like Henrik was using some quite strong language.
Nave was alone on the bridge, watching the snow blow past the front viewports. The buzzer whispers were still penetrating into Fortress, just through his suit speakers, but he had learned to ignore them, to blend them out. The situation on the ground was becoming very quiet, with fewer and fewer attacks as Tarazat ground forces built up. The operation to take the moon was turning into a mopping-up operation. Heldin, Nave heard, was promoted, as both tiers of the military hierarchy above her had been wiped out during the descent and early fighting around Fortress. She was made a sector commander, with a newly defined sector as her own little realm, a chunk of the north slope of the mountain. Surface combat is almost over. Now we'll see if this moon is actually worth anything to the buzzers. As he joined Nave on the bridge, Henrik said, If they really want it, they'll come and take it back. Cheerful as ever, Henrik, Nave said. I'll leave you to it. I've got to go out on patrol now. I'm sure we can think of an excuse to get you out of it, kid, Henrik grinned. I'm saving my excuses to get out of even worse duties later on, Nave said, and left to go suit up in his armour. Nave had to go out on the snow patrolling, even though contacts were getting increasingly few now. Nave wasn't keen, but he knew better than to buck military discipline. He was out on the ice and patrolling, with minutes to spare, before his scheduled start. The atmosphere above him was full of dogfighting superiority craft, keeping buzzer units away from the descending dropships. It was like a rain shower of dropships, creating a settlement bigger than many of the cities he had seen. Each dropship was as big as an ore carrier back on his homeworld and there were a lot of huge ore carriers serving the routes from his homeworld. The snow was driving in sheets against his faceplate, but the light show in the sky was so intense that it penetrated through. Nave paused in his stride to watch a dropship descend. He wasn't supposed to, so he put his suit on full auto, suddenly becoming basically a passenger. This was frowned on, of course, but Henrik had shown him how to beat any oversight routines that might be looking for lazy slugs riding around on full auto. All you had to do was give the suit a secondary instruction, to count the dropships, for example. The suit would then move its head in a very natural way, looking around to get the best estimate of the dropships encountered on patrol. It didn't look entirely human, but it was good enough to fool any camp discipline routines that might be watching through a nearby camera. It wouldn't fool a full AI like Fortress for a minute, of course. But Nave didn't think the AI would report him. Henrik usually just slept as he was carried around by his suit, but Nave was looking up at the sky. Watching the dropships come down was a sight that never ceased to be spectacular. The one he was watching at the moment was a Wasoon class, a real monster, and it was coming down on Gravitic Drive alone. It was something he never got used to, seeing such a huge lump of metal just hanging in the air. A Wasoon class dropship could hold 50 grav tanks and still have space for some drones, an imposing lump of metal by any standards, just hovering a little above them. But most of the other slugs patrolling around and busy with various tasks were paying no attention to it. Nave, along with his two favourite drones, was guarding a marshalling area for tugs. These powerful spaceships, not as big as the dropships, but massive enough, would nose against any spaceships that had gotten out of position and nudge them back into alignment in the huge swarm of metal above his head. There was only one tug resting on the ground, while dozens of others were working overhead, and that was because its engines were splayed out for maintenance or repair. Nave had no idea which. Some vital fluid had leaked out of the grounded tug and stained the snow a vivid yellow. Too dark for piss, but close. It was the usual type of duty Nave was given, low responsibility for a disengaged slug who wasn't going anywhere, in terms of promotion, any time soon. 
the sort of duty you could do in your sleep, especially if your suit was on full auto. Knave was distracted from watching spaceships sliding gracefully over his head by the approach of another slug. The slug had a big communications array spouting from his or her back. There was a gold stripe painted across the upper body. That meant the person was a few rungs above him in the military hierarchy, but not one of the top brass. The higher grades had various amounts of gold painted on their helmets. I guess they're on to our dropship counting, Knave muttered. The figure approached and stopped in his path. Knave switched over to manual as gracefully as he could and kept patrolling till he reached where the person was waiting. Wake up, slug! Switch that suit over to manual, a female voice said. You, Knave? Knave's armour told him that the officer was pinging his suit, looking for handshake information. Knave gave the OK, allowing access to his name, rank and serial number. The officer could just have easily demanded the information, and it was strange to be asked. Officers didn't routinely bother, just taking the information they needed. Knave started to wonder what was going on. The officer told Knave to follow her. I haven't completed my patrol, Knave informed her. Forget the patrol, she said simply. You've been reassigned. Knave followed her to a grounded dropship, and inside she took him to a rack holding a suit of armour. Strip, she said. Your old armour goes with me, and you get this. Knave cracked the seals on his armour and climbed out and down. What is this? Knave asked. It's ultra-compact assault armour type 7. Most of you slugs call it a slim suit, the woman said. I know what it is, I just don't know why you are giving it to me. I don't need a reason, she said. Just put it on and follow me. Knave stood in front of the armour, a confused expression on his face. The armour split down the front and the lapels, just below the helmet ring, peeling aside invitingly. Go on, the woman said. Climb in. Knave did what he was told. It was entirely intuitive, and he was wearing the armour, all done up except for the helmet, in less than a minute. Don't put the helmet on unless there is a real and imminent danger the woman said. In her battlefield suit, she now towered over him. She picked a helmet off a rack, and it looked like a toy in the massive fist of her armour. Just hold it at your side in your non-gun hand. That way, if anything hits the fan, you can reach for your weapon with one hand while jamming on the helmet with the other. So I have to carry this around the whole time? Knave asked, taking the helmet from her. Yep, Control doesn't like helmeted personnel in secure areas. Oh, Knave said, the penny dropping. So I'm being sent to a secure area. It had happened before. He had once spent a very uneventful month guarding an admiral's collection of sculptures, though the sculpture park had been external, so they hadn't bothered to move him from battlefield armour. He just stomped around in the giant armour among the delicate sculptures until the kinks were ironed out of the automated guards that were being custom-designed for the job. It had been a cushy little gig. The thought that he might be getting another similar nice little duty led to a big smile spreading across his face. The woman didn't confirm or deny his guess, just carried on making sure he was assigned the right gear. Obviously, you won't be carrying a mass driver around during your new duty, she said. You'll be equipped with this. She reached into the racking again and brought out a blaster pistol. Well, let's hope I don't need to use this pea shooter, Knave said. She smiled. Sure, it isn't a mass driver, and I'd avoid long-range engagements. But book some time on the range and get used to it. At close range, this thing has got quite a bit of stopping power. If you can shoot straight, you can do some damage with it. OK, Knave said, but his voice was unconvinced. That's everything, she said. Go that way. There's a transport waiting for you. Your personal stuff is on board. Good luck with whatever it is they've got you doing. 
thanks, Nave said, and wandered off in the direction she was pointing. After a few wrong turns, he found a docking bay with a transport sitting at the centre. There was no crew and there was no other passengers, but it was the only transport in the bay. He walked across the floor of the bay towards it and was rewarded with the sight of a hatch opening and a ramp extending to receive him. He waited a moment, then walked up the ramp and inside, where he was greeted by a voice coming over internal speakers. It was distorted and metallic, but male. Nave guessed it was the vehicle's computer and that it would be piloting the transport, though he didn't know for sure because it didn't bother to introduce itself. Where have you been? Looking for this transport, Nave said. Why didn't you put your helmet on? It would have guided you. They told me never. It doesn't matter, the voice said. Just strap yourself in and enjoy the ride. It won't take long. Nave found the passenger compartment at the third attempt because the computer didn't bother to help him with directions. He found a seat by a window, just one of a hundred seats, all empty. He could see through the window that they had already left the docking bay and were travelling around the base of the mountain and slightly upwards. Up ahead he saw structures, buzzer structures he guessed, and the transport was heading for a triangular bay door in the side of one of the bigger buildings. The bay door split in half one half sliding upwards, the other half sliding downwards to allow the shuttle into the bay. The transport landed silently in the centre of a large space, empty apart from a second transport, over by one of the walls and a couple of small robots stacking crates. The door in the shuttle opened again and the ramp extended. Out, the vehicle's computer said. And then, go where, do what, Nave asked. No idea, the metallic voice said, and not my problem. I just know you get out here. Don't forget your stuff. It took Nave a while to find his personal things, again with no help from the vehicle's computer. It was a pitifully small selection of odds and ends in a big canvas bag. Nave shouldered the bag, checked his blaster pistol in its holster, and gathered up his helmet in his offhand. He descended to the ramp of the transport, which closed its door, retracted its ramp, and immediately lifted off using its secondary gravitic engines as soon as he was out. Nave looked around the bay. Apart from the huge door the transport had entered and exited by, there was just one other transport and the two robots. The bay itself was silent and empty. Nave waited a good ten minutes to see if someone would come along to collect him, then went over and had a look at the other transport. There were no opening doors or extending ramps this time, so he went over to one of the robots. It was taking components out of a stack and then stacking them again somewhere else. It looked like busy work to Nave. Hey, he said, to attract the droid's attention. What do you want? the droid replied. Is anyone expecting me? he asked. I'll check the roster, the droid said. Its eyes dimmed a fraction of a second as it was calling up information about the day's business or whatever was recorded on the roster. Nope, the robot said. Nothing about any human personnel in any role or capacity. I think you just got delivered to the wrong place. It happens. Just wait till some system notices and reroutes you. Great, Nave said. Chapter 10 The captain watched the view screen, fascinated as a cliff face split in two. It was a live feed being sent up from the surface of Jade Stone. Where is this happening? she asked, Skydancer. Northern Hemisphere the ship's AI replied, roughly 70 miles from Exploration Base North. That can't be a coincidence, the captain said. It's right next to them, on a planetary scale. Could this be some kind of natural plate tectonics? I'm no expert, the ship's computer said, 
but we haven't seen anything similar before on the planet, and if it is plate tectonics, it's very localised in nature. The image on the screen then started to break up. First it pixelated, then started dropping entire frames. Problem? the captain asked. Yes, Skydancer answered simply. Some kind of very localised atmospheric interference. But again, I hesitate to call it natural. It seems too coincidental, too targeted for that. Agreed, the captain said. She called Maskin and Keen. Two holograms soon joined her on the bridge. We're monitoring the situation from orbit, the captain said, and it seems there's something to report. Skydancer replayed some edited highlights of the cliff splitting in two and of the interference knocking out their satellite surveillance. Maskin, the captain said, your base is closest. Get a couple of scramjets up in the air and let us know what they see as soon as possible. Immediately. Maskin could be seen turning away, but what she was looking at wasn't caught in the hologram. She could be seen barking orders, but they weren't captured either. Keen, the captain said. Yes, I think the likelihood of your base experiencing a similar nearby seismic event is quite high. Yes, captain. So I want you to increase your frequency of scramjet patrols, but restrict their operations to a hundred mile radius. We may not be able to warn you next time, and, whatever is going on, I want you to have as much warning as possible. Get me as much information as you can, and get it to me as quickly as you can. Yes, Captain, Keen said. The Captain killed the connection. Her people had a lot to do, and they didn't need the distraction of their Captain breathing over their shoulders. What is this wild goose chase we've been sent on? the Captain asked. Obviously, Skydancer said, Fleet Command have blundered onto some kind of beehive and they need some idiots to poke it. So, the captain growled, do we pull out the ground crews, reinforce them now with more slugs, or wait to see what happens? There is too little information yet, Skydancer said. We don't even know if the seismic event and loss of satellite surveillance means that there has been an escalation in the danger present in theatre. Therefore, unfortunately, I cannot advise you whether it would be better, strategically, to reinforce the positions on the surface or whether to pull the units out. And yet, the captain said, I feel things just got a whole lot more dangerous. Down on the surface... Keen was at the landing pad, watching the last scramjet gently moving upward on secondary gravitic thrusters, and the main engines were already ticking over, ready to accelerate it to many times the speed of sound. It was so fast, it could arc into the upper atmosphere and be on the other side of the planet in an hour or two. It looked like a hunting avian, but a hunting avian with thick wings laden with ordnance. She had fully half of her drones out on patrol as well, the last of them going through the main gate right then. A pair of her whipbacks. The whipback was a versatile drone with good armour, she assured herself, and good intelligence for a machine that wasn't AI. It looked like a fish, mounted on a pair of medium-duty legs, and that's how most people referred to it, the fish. It was an old and dependable design that had been in service with Tarazat forces for decades. The legs provided a good firing platform, ate up almost any type of terrain thrown at them and weren't so heavy that the beast would sink into the surrounding terrain and have to be pulled out. The fish had two robust wings, each with two blasters, making four blasters in all. That would be formidable enough even without the mass driver built into the nose. It was a very robust model of mass driver, ideal for dealing with the dirt and stress of jungle use, and it was installed so that it could dump its waste heat into the fish's heat vane mounted down its back. Keen noticed that Punter had wandered up, come to watch the last drones go out as well. Go get em, little fishes, Punter said.
He was at the gate supervising engineering drones as they added mass to the fence. It was an old trick Keen had told him about. Nothing beats adding more mass. If she had to choose between building an earthen rampart and putting in a fancy energy fence, she'd build the dirt wall every time. She'd seen an energy fence just flicker out one time, closely followed by a bloodbath. She never did find out why it had happened. Damn thing was probably just doing a software update. Go get who? Keen suddenly asked. One seismic event and some satellite glitching doesn't mean there are necessarily any hostiles. Except we know there are. Yeah, there probably are, she conceded. And I think it's pretty obvious by now that Skydancer has no idea what the hell we're dealing with here. Probably some kind of alien. Could be anything then, Punter said. Yeah, from a Stone Age frog creature with a club all the way up to being made out of pure energy that can melt your ass with a thought, Keen nodded. My ass is already pretty cooked in this damn armour. It wouldn't take much to set it to melting. Punter smiled. Keen left him to his work and returned to base control, a very grand title for the most hardened of their temporary structures. Keen had left instructions with the engineering drones to add mass here too, and she was pleased with the progress they were making, building up earth in angled ramps around the walls and hardening it with metal plates and whole trees. Good work, she murmured as she entered the structure. Now the question came of whether she should remove her armour, and as there had been no contact with hostiles, and control operations were a hell of a lot easier outside the unwieldy metal jumpsuit, she decided to remove it. She deftly toggled the little clasps at the neck and wrists and started the process. The gloves and helmet came off, and the armour opened down the front in one long slit that turned into two slits down the legs. Keen slid out of the cushioning embrace and dropped to the floor, easily more than a metre shorter now that she was unarmoured. She was left in what was called the inner skin, a kind of uniform modified to have a few zips and studs that would start to dig into the flesh after a while in the armour. All the fastenings were Velcro, and there were no pockets. She reached back into the armour and found the little compartment where her belongings were stowed. She pulled out some light shoes, there was no space for heavy boots, a pouch with key cards and the like, and a sidearm with a holster, both strung together on an elastic belt. She put the belt on and settled her sidearm and pouch of belongings comfortably. There was a mirror in the armour storage area, so she stopped to see how her uniform and hair were sitting. You never knew when you would be required for holographic communication, and it didn't do to look unkempt or less than perfectly groomed, not if the captain called. She saw a woman looking back who was what would be called veteran, no longer a new recruit. Her uniform jacket was short-sleeved and showed her iron butterfly tattoo on the light brown skin of her right forearm. Her black hair was cropped short, and there was no obvious defect with her kit. That will do, she said to the woman in the mirror. Then she went through the few short corridors to the main chamber of control. She selected the most central of the chairs and glanced at the information on nearby screens, power usage, fence integrity, drone positions, feeds from the patrolling scramjets, all normal. There was no base AI, but a pretty good base computer was doing its best to keep the most relevant information nearby where she could access it easily. Keen nodded appreciatively. She opened a line to Punter and saw his hologram appear in the room in front of her desk, just a portion with the upper body of his armour and his helmet, the area of his face round his eyes visible through the slit. How's it going with the fence? she asked. It'll all be done before nightfall, his hologram said, its eyes darting about, attentively watching the drones. 
We'll have three times as much mass in that fence. Not even fifty of the lash faces could push it over. Great, she said. Everything is normal here, so take your time. Do a good job. Wilco, Punter said, and Keen killed the connection. Then she called up Maskin, but the hologram was degraded, concentrating information at the face to reduce the data required, detailing the base commander's full lips and epicanthic folds, but just sketching in the rest of the body. Hello, Keen said. Hello, Maskin replied. The connection's getting worse, I see. Soon we'll be relying on line-of-sight communications, lasers and radio and other primitive stuff. There's no line of sight between the North and South Hemispheres, or between surface and orbit. No, Maskin agreed, and it's a huge problem. Just to talk to my scramjets ten miles away, I need a chain of drones on hilltops relaying laser messages. Radio comes and goes, but I can't rely on it. Only line of sight is dependable. The hologram froze, gradually pixelating, then came back. See what I mean? Maskin said, the definition in her hologram fading again. We're going to be cut off from the outside world before nightfall at this rate. I agree, communications are our primary problem, Keen said. We need a solution. I need to know what's happening up at Base North, and so does Skydancer. Maskin nodded. I propose using my scramjets as relays. What do you mean? Maskin asked. Keen paused not sure herself what she meant. The problem had crept up on them fast, and she hadn't had time to think the details through, but as she watched the hologram deteriorate, she knew she had to make some kind of communication solution work. I propose rendezvousing one of your scramjets with mine. I'll pull up a map. OK, Maskin said, her nodding hologram head causing pixelation and disruption. Keen took her time calling up the map giving her some space to think through her spur-of-the-moment plan. She had the feeling it just might work. Here, she said, painting the map coordinates for a position just north of the equator, we'll rendezvous two scramjets here. Load one of your scramjets with data and transmit it to my scramjet. It'll bring the data home to me and I'll send a scramjet into the upper orbit to transmit the data up to Skydancer via a satellite or a shuttle. OK, it'll have to be a snapshot every hour, but I'll only need to dedicate a single scramjet to it. Actually, I'll send you one of mine, Keen offered. There's nothing going on here yet and I'll still have a couple left over for patrolling. Let me take care of the entire communications chain. You just make sure that your base computer knows to transmit to my drone some useful information. My base computer is good. That won't be a problem. Great. How long do you think you'll need my drone station keeping above your base for you to send up the information packet? How much information will you need? It's not just that. I want to keep drone exposure to the environment in the Northern Hemisphere to a minimum. I'd like to set a maximum loiter time. We can set a maximum of five minutes and still send you a good selection of collected video and readings. Five minutes it is. I'll start setting up the drone relay communication chain immediately. The first drone should be over your base to collect the first information packet within the hour, coming back round again every hour after. Great, we'll have some information to squirt to it by then. Keen wasn't sure if Maskin had cut the connection or if the system had run out of satellites to bounce information off. But her counterpart at Base North was suddenly gone. Keen called Punter. You're going to see circling drones on the hour, Punter, she told him. As she was explaining the drone data relay, she saw his hologram start to degrade. The interference was spreading to the southern hemisphere, or a new centre of interference was starting up centred on base south. Whichever way, it was a worrying development. The conversation with Punter took a while because of the radio problems, but he soon got the idea, and she was able to devote herself to the problem of actually setting up the communication relay with Base North.
It took Keen more time than she expected to get all the moving parts of the scramjet relay arranged, and she ended up needing three of the machines flying in three giant ovals to reach base north each delicately synchronized, and another to make the long climb up into orbit and back to pass information to Skydancer. Once the system was set up, she could forget it, because the scramjets had a virtually inexhaustible power source, at least on a tactical scale. They would be quite happy to keep relaying information till the end of the world, or until their power ran out, decades hence. One difficult part was to set up the protocols to allow the drones to swiftly handshake and then fly alongside each other for a few minutes at the end of each loop, swapping information, but she kept working till she got it. In the end, it was five hours later before the first information arrived with her. It was also swiftly relayed to the orbital scramjet, which started its climb, meaning that Skydancer wouldn't see it for another half an hour or so. Keen opened the data package and was rewarded with a heading written in large letters across the top of her screen. Data scrape Jade Stone, Base North, Folder 0001. And below that was a file tree. It was extremely short, with just three subheadings. The first was video with 9,865 files. The next was instrument readings with 7,890 files. And the last was summaries with just one file. Keen clicked the summaries folder and opened up the single file it contained. A hologram appeared before her, but she recognized instantly that it wasn't a recorded image and it certainly wasn't being transmitted live. Instead, it was a simple avatar, a simplified, smoother version of the speaker with just enough features to be recognizable, generated on the fly. It was Maskin. This video, Maskin's avatar said, is our first sighting of the threat we know is coming. Then the avatar was replaced by a video. The point of view of the video was through the cameras on the nose of a drone. The view showed a wider field of view than a human eye was capable of, as images from the drone's various eyes were combined into one image. The drone was walking through primeval forest. There was no other drones in the field of view. The drone was out of contact with Base North and on full autonomous operation. In the bottom of the video, a title appeared. First contact. The drone stopped and scanned the forest around it. Keen hadn't seen enough of the video to know if this was part of its normal patrol procedure or if it signified that the drone had heard or seen something unusual. The door behind her opened and Punter came in. Is that it? he said. Did you start watching the data without me? Yes, this is it. You haven't missed anything she said distractedly. Something in the video had caught her eye, something among the foliage. The video froze and a subtitle appeared, frame showing greatest extent of creature. But the greatest extent didn't show much. It was a chintinous, insectile face, or part of a face, the details indistinct among the alien foliage of the forest but she could see that the mouth was half open. Creature, Punter said. Why does the base computer care about some creature? What threat can it pose to drone armor? How many hits from a mass driver can it survive, or even a blaster for that matter? What is it? I don't know, Keen said. I'll play the rest. The paused symbol disappeared from the player and the video file continued. The quality of the file immediately degraded. The creature emerged from the foliage, but was pixelated, and the colour balance was so far off that all that was left was a silhouette. Looks humanoid, Punter said. Why isn't that stupid drone shooting at it? Keen thought it hadn't recognised the creature as a threat, and was about to say so, but she didn't get time. There were readouts down the side of the screen showing the drone's status. All the readouts that mattered suddenly jerked into red.
The drone had finally decided to engage the alien creature as the most likely source of the distortion and damage to its systems. Unfortunately, its sensors were badly impacted across a huge range. It was getting mostly shadows and gibberish from its video, magnetic, infrared, ultraviolet, motion, audio and olfactory sensors. It was going blind. A simplified 3D representation of the world, a model based on most recent reliable sensor readings, was suddenly overlaid over the shadows provided by the drone's eyes, and the drone started shooting. It was shooting at a shadow, overlaid with a vaguely humanoid 3D shape. The position where the drone thought the creature was. Its gun temperature readings jumped and capacitor levels started falling as its energy charge was turned into destructive force and projected at the enemy. Keen saw Punter's trigger finger tighten in sympathy with what he was seeing on screen. Then the video feed went to three seconds of static and died. Replaced with a new title, Recovery of Video File from Drone Carcass. Carcass? Punter said, his trigger finger relaxing. I don't like the sound of that. Me neither, Keen said. Again, they were watching through the nose sensors of a drone as it strode through the woods in full autonomous operation mode. It pushed through thick patches of the spiralled, thorny and convoluted branches with its nose. When patches were too thick, it ripped at them with its utility arms, extending from hatches below the fish-like body for the purpose. It ripped at a bunch of thick branches and broke through to an open space beyond. The trees in the clearing, four or five of them, were denuded of branches and all leaning in one direction, towards what was left of a drone. It was standing at the back of the clearing, and its fish shape was still recognisable, but it was horribly damaged. Their drone, the one whose eyes they were watching through, hesitated at the edge of the clearing, scanning the space and as far into the trees as its sensors would go. It then, as if summoning its courage, stepped into the blasted space. It went straight over to the remains of its fellow drone, but... As it passed one of the trees, a picture-in-picture picture zoomed in on the damage done to the trunk. The wood looked churned up, a weird mixture of melted and mixed. The damage was strange, like heat damage, but worse and without any scorching. Have you ever seen anything like that? Keen asked Punter. No, boss, he said, but that's weapon damage for sure. Look, it's directional and it intensifies round our busted-up drone. The damaged drone was now looming in the view as their host drone neared it. At such close range, the damage was frightening. The thick armour had split in several places and bulged outwards, the drone's insides spilling out, twisted, deformed and melted. Where the armour hadn't split... Where it had maintained its integrity, it was twisted and distorted like the fabric of the tree that they had seen a moment earlier. The two main legs were untouched, strangely, and the drone looked like a twisted mess installed on two mechanical reverse-jointed legs. The host drone tried to initiate a handshake to swap data via a laser connection but the damaged drone was completely inert and unresponsive. The host drone opened a hatch in its belly and extended a utility arm. The hand on the end folded back to reveal a data jack. The host drone knocked some of the twisted armour aside to find a place to insert the jack. It found a socket, plugged in, and the damaged drone's file system appeared in the window. It was a mess, just as twisted as the physical body. Data damage too, Keen murmured as they watched. The host drone downloaded what it could, then headed off through the trees. The video then cut to another caption. The recovery drone finds high ground and passes data to a scramjet. 
The view was now from a circling scramjet. It was centred on a drone on an exposed rocky outcrop. There was a high-speed red flickering as lasers mounted around the drone's eyes beamed up the information retrieved from the blasted drone carcass and its own experiences too. As the scramjet circled, it noticed movement in the forest around the drone. It beamed down a warning, but the computer operating the drone on the exposed hilltop decided to keep transmitting. It could use its wing blasters and keep its nose trained on the scramjet to ensure the data connection. It couldn't use its main mass driver though, because this was nose mounted. The scramjet also started losing off missiles into the forest at targets based on observed movement of the canopy as the drone on the hilltop was firing into the woods with its blasters as best it could. Trees were torn apart, dirt, rock and foliage was thrown into the air. The view on the ground became chaos and still the drone kept broadcasting, sending up its precious cargo of data. The drone was then buffeted by impacts, its armour sloughing off and its internal structure rupturing to the surface. The data stream from the ground broke off and the scramjet immediately banked away and the video stopped. It was replaced by another caption across the screen, Base Commander's Personal Log. This was an audio file only, but Keen could well imagine the concerned look on the base commander's face. She was much closer to whatever this threat was, and it was pretty obvious she wouldn't be getting any reinforcements or evacuation until Skydancer had more information about what they were dealing with. She'd been hung out to dry, thrown down on the surface of the planet as bait, just like Keen, but there wasn't a hint of resentment in her voice. Keen had to give her that. The lack of communications is the worst thing, came the base commander's voice from the audio file. I don't know, I've even lost a unit till it fails to come back from patrol. It's just a fluke that I have any idea what I'm dealing with. Just a couple of degraded video files of movement in the trees. She paused, collecting her thoughts. There are a few things I can already say, however. One thing is that these creatures are not human, and I'm sure we're dealing with multiple hostiles. They appear to be using some kind of organic armour. They are bipedal, judging by the first contact alien, and they have potent weaponry. I'm confused about why they didn't engage the scramjet. I would love to know if that is related to some kind of range limitation of their weaponry. I guess we'll just have to wait for them to show up at the base. The audio stopped and a caption appeared on the screen. End of summary. Keen turned to Punter, her face grim. He met her gaze, his expression hard to read, waiting for her to speak. Did that look to you like a fair fight between drones and the hostiles? Keen asked. No, it most certainly did not, boss he replied, his voice vehement. They took the first drone by surprise. How was it supposed to know that this was a hostile and not some dumb forest creature? And the second one was surrounded, outnumbered. We both saw the state of the first drone, the busted up armour. How long did it last before it lost functionality under the hostile's fire? Not long, Punter admitted, but long enough to return fire. It got off a few good rounds with a big gun, with a pretty good chance of having hit it. It's a pity it was taken out before it could confirm the kill. I didn't see any dead aliens strewn about that clearing, Keen said pensively. No, Punter nodded, but maybe with its alien physique, it can have its ass shot off and still manage to crawl away somewhere to die. Keen started laughing and Punter smiled. Okay, punter, she said. Go talk to the drones. I don't want them wandering round on their own any more. I want them patrolling in groups of... She paused, half thinking, half inviting suggestions. Punter's guess was as good as hers right now about how many drones should be in each group in order to survive contact with the hostiles. Five, punter suggested. Five it is, Keen said. 
and we'll have our next instalment from Base North in about an hour. Off you go. Punter went to organise the defence of the base. He sent scramjets flying low over the forest, out looking for any sign of the hostiles, out to 20 or 30 miles away. He soon had all the drones on permanent patrol as well. They patrolled in groups of five, around a rigidly predetermined circuit. Some groups starting and stopping, some patrolling continuously, some clockwise, some anti-clockwise. The circuit was one mile out, and it took the drones an hour to go round one time. The drones were stamping through this terrain with such regularity that it was turning into a wide, muddy track, almost completely denuded of vegetation. Punter also had the engineering drones clear a line of sight, track out to the patrol circuit, with drones spread along it as a relay, so he could be alerted by laser communications the moment anything happened. Chapter 11 Shavir and Altia were both in the room where the buzzer scientist had been doing his experiments. Altia was trying to examine the way the buzzer equipment was interacting with the surface of the wall and with systems below. But Shavir was pacing the room behind her, distracting her. Why here? Shavir said. That's the big question. Why travel halfway across the quadrant to an ice moon if you already have command of the drifter system? What advantage does a frigid lump of rock give compared to an artificial solar system that is capable of intergalactic travel? I think, Altea said, I think it's something to do with the ocean beneath the surface. There is a sea below the crust, a huge frozen sea. And that, I think, is the tomb at least according to my latest readings of translated texts. So, Shavir said, instead of squabbling with these damnable tin cans over control of that hilltop fort, we should be looking a little deeper. We should be looking to the core. Of course! Shavir turned and, without a word, left Altea alone at the wall. Altea watched her go a pensive expression on her face, and then went back to her experiments, and back to piecing together the least damaged of the buzzer equipment. Definitely no systems I could see that would be able to cut a pattern into stone. The pattern was prompted to form spontaneously, she muttered to herself as she worked. Would you like me to catalogue that remark? The site computer asked. Yes, please, Altea said, and make a note that this opens up more problems than it solves. What kind of machine is this that we are inhabiting? Then she noticed a message winking in the corner of her display. Her slug had arrived and was ready for collection. Nave was still in the landing bay at the centre of the room, roughly where the transport had dropped him, with his bag on the floor, his helmet on top, waiting. After another twenty minutes, he went back over to the robot. Have you got anything to sit on? Sure, the robot said. It went over to its pile of stuff and selected a couple of robust-looking plastic cases. It brought them back over to Nave and set them down. It patted the top of one case and sat on the other itself. I thought you might have been rerouted by now, the robot said. I was hoping something might have happened by now too, Nave nodded. Hey, the robot said, there's a food dispenser round the back here. Would you like something to eat or drink? Sure. Where is it? No, you're the guest here in Temporary Logistics Forwarding Depot, GK690. I'll get you something. The robot went to its pile of stuff pulled out a medium-sized case and unpacked a food dispenser. It added some consumable cubes in the top and found two containers to insert in the bottom. It punched some buttons and then brought him the results. There was a beaker of yellow liquid and a plate with a bar of red stuff on it. Thanks, Nave said, and took a drink. You're welcome, the robot nodded. Nice armour, by the way. 
Nave looked down at the slim suit he was wearing, then back up at the robot. What do you know about armour? Oh, the robot said, I'm not just some ordinary sub-AI box stacker like this other guy. It indicated the other robot in the hangar with a dismissive gesture. Nave raised an eyebrow. Oh, no. No, the robot continued. I'm full AI. I know a lot about a lot of subjects. Self-educated, you see. My mother was self-educated, Nave said. The mining cartel didn't provide schooling, but she didn't let that stop her. Good for her, the robot said. I started out as a hobby project, something to fiddle with for one of my logistic officers. She was wasted here, had a magnificent mind, but you know how it is. She could only get a job as a slug in the benighted infantry. Ended up in logistics. Benighted? Nave smiled. I'm full AI, the robot deadpanned. I can use big words if I like. Nave took a bite of the red thing. Delicious, he said, suddenly realising how hungry he had been. Thanks. Calm down, the robot said. It's not like I cooked it or anything. Right. Nave munched on the food and the robot watched him. So, what were you saying about the armour? Ah, the robot said. That's interesting. It's a very cutting-edge design. There are only a few examples in the battle group's inventory system. Battle group? Yeah, we just got promoted to a battle group when those last few squadrons joined us, and your armour's serial number indicates it's from a recent generation. Serial number? Nave said, confused. He looked down at the armour, but it looked pretty featureless to him. Yeah, serial number, the robot nodded. You have the armour set to broadcast its manufacturer details in the handshake. You should probably change that. It's not secure, and it makes you look like a noob. I was issued this thing less than an hour ago, Nave said. I have no idea how I would change a setting like that. I can take a look, the robot offered, if you like. Nave shrugged, and the robot held out its hand. Give me the helmet. Nave was hesitant a second. He'd only just been issued the suit and was pretty sure the Navy would frown on him, showing it to random droids, who probably weren't even military issue. Come on, the robot said. Don't be bashful. Hand it over. Nave placed the rim of the helmet in the robot's hand. The robot took it gently and peered inside. Then it reached inside with its free hand. Nave noticed that the robot's index finger had an interface jack on it. After a few seconds, the helmet started projecting a hologram. The hologram swam in and out of focus. It's a bit tricky, the robot said. Still has the factory settings, and there's so much spyware it's slowing the process down. This thing has a good modern processor too, so that's a shitload of spyware. Military police like to know what we're up to, and if you saw what we got up to, you'd understand. The robot let out a metallic little chuckle, and the hologram projection coalesced into something recognisable. It was a shimmering flat blue sheet with the words, Customer Settings at the top. Customer? The Navy is the customer, the robot said. You're usually not supposed to see this menu, but you call it up like this. The robot showed him how to manipulate the menu. The menu screens and option selections moved so quickly that Nave had difficulty following them. But he was confident he could replicate the droid's actions. Removing the spyware now, the droid said. Nave saw the screen flash and go to black, which was worrying. Then writing scrolled vertically up it, and then the original screen came back, seemingly unaltered. Then the robot got him to move his arms to better calibrate the force feedback settings. The slim suit seemed to move more naturally after the robot had made the adjustments. The robot stopped playing with the settings and handed the helmet back to him. Thanks, Nave said. What's your name? Jay, the robot said. That was the name of the original robot kit my creator started with. 
I'm far removed from a standard J kit robot now, of course. You can call me J. I'm Nave. Is J a gendered name? Do you identify with male or female? Male, I guess. I've been told my voice is more masculine than feminine. Great food dispenser programming, Nave said, holding up what was left of his bar of red stuff. This is really good. It'll put hairs on your chest. It was quite some time later that one of the interior doors to the bay opened. Nave and Jay were deep in conversation about local weather conditions and the likely effects they would have on the battle group's equipment. They both turned their heads at the sound of the opening door to see a tall woman enter. She had black skin and nappy hair, and her features had a neat trick of being delicate and powerful at the same time. She was wearing the first non-military clothes Nave had seen on planet. So this is where you've been hiding, she said. We were expecting you down in the dig coordination centre. Were you? Nave said unable at that moment to come up with anything better. Yes, we were, the woman said. You are Nave. That's me, Nave confirmed. And who might you be? I'm Altea, she said. I'm the one who requested you be transferred to our staff. Oh, Nave said. This was all very different to any duty he had been assigned before, but one thing was the same as usual. He was obviously considered too insignificant to be told what was going on, what he was expected to do, or where he was supposed to go. It looked like this woman might be his superior, though, even if it was still very unclear what his role was. Is this robot part of your team? she asked. Nave looked at Jay and shrugged. The robot looked at its pile of boxes for a moment, then back to Nave and Altea. He nodded his metal head. Yes, said Nave. He's called Jay and he's part of my team. Bring him along then, Altea said, and headed for the same door she came in through. Nave slung his bag of belongings over his back, gathered up his helmet and followed, with Jay just behind him. Altea was walking quickly and didn't bother to try and make small talk. She led the way down through two levels of the building and went into a large room with a conference table surrounded by comfortable chairs and a lot of readouts around the walls. The conference table had a large hologram pit in the centre, which was switched off at that moment. Nave and Jay followed her into the room. Well, she said, Looks like we missed it. Oh dear, Nave said, still with no idea what was going on. I'll show you to your quarters and we can pick this up tomorrow, early tomorrow. She led him back up one level. The original huge dimensions of the buzzer corridor had been adapted for humans. One single corridor had been turned into accommodation by adding temporary walls down one side to make sleeping cubicles. She took Nave to one and punched in a code to open it. It's the usual base code, she said. Change it when you get a chance. Bye. But I don't know the usual base code, Nave said, a moment too late. Altea was already walking down the corridor while Nave took a look at his quarters. They were very spartan. There was a single camp bed a cupboard, a desk and chair, and some kind of integrated toilet shower contraption. Nave went in and sat on the bed. So where am I staying? Jay asked. Don't you have quarters already? Nave asked. Nope. I'll talk to this Altea person into finding you some tomorrow, Nave said. You'll have to use your initiative for tonight. Altea came to collect him early the next day, just as she had said she would. You're not wearing your armour, she said. Yeah, he mumbled, still half asleep. I was issued with it, but nobody has told me that I have to wear it. And where's that robot of yours? He's looking for somewhere to call home. Oh, Altea said. I'm sorry, doesn't he have quarters? We weren't expecting him. I'll sort him out with somewhere to stay. I'll assign him the room next to you. Great, Nave said. Now come with me.
We have to get on with this. She set off at a gentle pace, allowing him to walk beside her. I'm sorry things were so chaotic yesterday, she said. You threw a spanner in the works when you didn't turn up on time. Sorry about that. I'm sure you had your reasons, she said doubtfully. But today, I want to pick your brains a little. What about? he asked. What a strange question, she said. About the buzzer scientist. The one you talked to, before he was killed. Oh, Maeve said, I see. It really should have occurred to him sooner, he realised, that they were interested in him because of the buzzer he had interrogated. It was the only noteworthy thing he had done since arriving on planet, if not the most significant thing he had done in his entire life. And there's another thing, she said, more quietly. Oh, I'll explain when we get to my lab. All right. They walked along some more corridors, descended a couple of levels. They descended again. It was a few minutes before they finally wound up in a room that Knave recognised. I've been here before, he said. Of course, she confirmed. This is the room where you met the scientist. The room was the same, but different. There were still obvious signs of the damage done to the far wall by the mass driver fire, and there were some ugly stains and broken equipment. But there was a lot of new equipment in the room too. Human equipment. Well, Altia said, let's get down to it. Chapter 12 the next delivery of data arrived almost exactly an hour after the first, and both Keen and Punter were in control to see what it contained. Base North had reached the same conclusions as Keen and Punter, that there was no necessity to go looking for any more trouble, because trouble was probably on the way for them. They had gone for an even more extreme solution, by slashing and burning back the forest and surrounding the base with drones. It put all their eggs in one basket, but when all your eggs consisted of only two slugs, a bunch of drones and half a squadron of scramjets, it didn't seem like too much of a concentration of assets. They had brought their perimeter tightly in around the base, the first video was of dark shapes moving at the edge of the forest. Scramjets fired into the trees, drones unloaded blasters and mass drivers. There was more footage of the attacking creatures, including footage of them attacking a drone. They opened their mouths from a few metres away and it seemed like they were breathing. The drone's surface warped and its legs buckled, but the legs held and it kept firing. Did you see that? Keen asked. They warped its structure with something mounted in their mouths. It wasn't just bad breath. How many were there? Looks like the drones outnumbered them two to one. Drove them off for the loss of five drones and one engineering drone that got caught out in the forest. That's heavy losses for fighting what? Bipedal ants with bad halitosis. The video cut back to the avatar of the base commander speaking directly to them. Hi, Keen, she said. I'm going to collect some dead hostiles and cut them up, so I can tell you what we're dealing with here. More news at the top of the hour in our next data packet. But the next data transmission didn't come. Instead, they had two scramjets coming over the horizon and landing on their pad. The third scramjet from the relay was already well on the way to the outer limits of the atmosphere. All three of them had a copy of the same video taken by the scramjet at the end of the relay run at the base north site. It was utter destruction. The fence was melted away in three places the ground torn up and remaining vegetation warped and twisted around the gaps. The buildings were busted open like paper bags and the metal drones were scattered about like scrap metal. There were carcasses of the biped hostiles strewn around too. Lots of them. That's not good, Punter said at last. 
Those things must have come back in greater numbers. There are hundreds of bodies here. Is this all we have? Keen asked. Just a video of destruction, no other useful data. Upon Skydancer, the command crew were watching the same video a short time later. We just lost an entire base, the captain said. These creatures must be very sophisticated and well-armed constructs, and well-armoured too, to take on so many drones and win. Still images were appearing on monitors around the Starship Bridge, the best shots of downed hostiles and estimates of the amount of damage it had taken to kill each one. This was combined with images showing the estimated destructive power of their mouth weapon. This is the question, Skydancer said. Do we reinforce our positions now, or do we call it a day and go back home? We stay, the captain said. Do we repopulate base north? Skydancer asked. Yes, the captain said. We give it everything we've got. And base south? They stay put for now, the captain said. We need to know if this is a global threat. All right, captain. The captain left the bridge and went to her private quarters. She sat down and started to make a recording. After she had finished, she transmitted it to the scramjet, station keeping in the upper atmosphere, which then immediately dove back down towards base south. Keen was watching the recording a short time later. We've now both seen the footage of the remains of base north, the hologram of the captain said. We are reinforcing with everything we have. You will be staying where you are until the situation becomes clearer. We both now know that concentrating your forces and awaiting the enemy is not a good strategy. I advise sending out small patrols as widely as possible and reporting any contact immediately. We will divert forces to retrieve you if, and only if, a hostile threat is detected in the southern hemisphere. There was a short pause, time enough for Keen to wonder if she would ever get off this tangled forest rock of a planet. Then the captain said goodbye and good luck, and the hologram dissolved out of existence. Keen immediately contacted Punter. His hologram taking the exact same spot as the captain's had, but his face hidden by the visor of combat armour. No pickup, Punter, she said simply. Can't say I'm surprised, Punter said. They have to know if the ass end of the planet is infected too, which means they have to wait and see if we get attacked. That might be their plan, but we're not staying here. No, no. These things seem to have short-range weaponry. We are screwed if we stay in the forest. We are going in convoy to the tallest lump of rock with the best firing lines we can find. I like it, Punter said. The scramjets can stay up in the air till we get a chance to build them a new pad. I'll climb into my armour and we'll head out in twenty minutes. What about the buildings and fence? They're useless against this type of hostile. Each one has one of those strange disruptor guns melded right into their face. Any one of them can just disrupt a path through our static defences. We need a different kind of defence perimeter. Keen paused to pull up a map. This hill here, she said, highlighting it for Punter with a red circle. That's going to be our new home. Looks cosy, he said. Protuberance K-LAT5-7-90H. Hmm. I'm going to have to give it a more evocative name, something a human can remember. Permission granted to name that cursed little lump of rock. Cursed lump of rock, huh? I was going to call it after my mother, but I think cursed rock has more of a ring to it. The convoy left about 25 minutes later, and Keen was happy with its shape. The scramjets were already covering the route to the objective. Fast-moving units would be there in half a day, and the slow movers bringing up the rear would arrive the next morning. On the swift march to the new location, Punter didn't even slow down for obstacles. He just powered through them in his armour.
Unless they were too big and he had to go round, he just kept running, shoulder-charging thick vegetation, and then he jumped a fallen tree. As he jumped, he let out a whoop, though he would have been hard-pressed to put his finger on exactly what emotion had provoked it. There was the tension that the fast-moving convoy could be attacked at any moment, but it felt great to be running through the alien woods. There were twenty drones up ahead of him, twenty drones to either side and twenty behind. Keen was in another bubble of eighty drones up ahead. The most rearward of her drones were only a few steps ahead of his forward drones. They were close enough that they could relay messages through the trees as the intervening drones made fleeting visual contact with each other to flash laser pulses of data. At least there was no way the aliens would be able to mess with that, even if they could knock out radio and satellite communications. The latest message came relaying down the chain of drones. I'm getting no contacts from hostiles, not from drones or scramjets. How are the engineering drones doing? They've left the compound and are following in our tracks. That shouldn't be too difficult. We're leaving quite a trail, Punter yelled, and waited a few seconds for the message to go up to his boss and then back again. Cutting quite a swathe, Keen replied. Punter chuckled but didn't bother transmitting this along to Keen. It suddenly occurred to him that if the engineering drones would have no problems following their trail, then neither would homicidal alien life forms with advanced weaponry built into their faces. He dismissed the thought. There was a boulder ahead, which he climbed with three quick kicks of his mighty armoured legs, and then jumped. His hips were starting to ache, dealing with the constant load of the actuators. The armour suit was power-assisted, but that didn't mean you could ease up on exercise and training. Operating such a huge chunk of machinery took it out of you, and the plan was to be running non-stop for the best part of an entire day. Punter let out another whoop as he jumped from the top of another rock into the primordial forest. He heard some shooting ahead, and a few moments later, Keane's voice was coming from his communications unit. Just frightening off some lash faces, she said. Some fireworks to let them know they should run from us instead of dig in their hooves and fight. No worries, Punter yelled. Do they have hooves? Not sure, Keane's voice again. Figure of speech. Then more shooting, this time from his left. What was that? Keane's voice had a hint of concern. Punter was already looking to his left. To be more precise, he had pivoted the top half of his suit to the left, his mass driver at his shoulder, ready to fire. His hip flexor muscles were really starting to ache now as the suit contorted him into an unnatural position, his legs still pounding away at the ground without any drop in speed. The foliage strange interlocking leaves, more like feathers here than the type of leaves he was used to on his home world, were too dense to glimpse a drone and try to pick up a line of sight connection. He ran to his left and a drone loomed out of the forest, running at exactly the same pace in exactly the same direction. An inhumanely tricky military manoeuvre that only high technology and the tireless mechanical joints of their legs made possible. The drone's laser did a quick handshake and then dumped information. Punter put his suit on auto as he reviewed the data. It was a video taken through the nose camera of a drone way out on the left of the formation. It was crashing through the trees with the strange feather foliage. Suddenly, a sensor warned of movement in the trees ahead. It was too late for the drone to slow. It burst through the trees, body slamming whatever had been inside. At high speed, and the drone weighing the huge amounts that it did, if it had hit an ordinary animal, it would have burst like a balloon. It was just impossible to tell from the data the drone had captured what it was that it had hit. 
At the drone's running speed, the impact sensors within the drone's armor were hard-pressed to come up with any useful estimate of what size the creature had been. Punter scrubbed backwards and forwards through the video at the moment of impact, but all he could see was leaves. Well, Keane's voice relayed to him as the foliage thinned. Possible contact, Punter said, and sent her the data. It was a while before he got a reply. Yeah, I'd say that that was one of our hostiles, her voice finally said. But this video clip isn't going to be enough for Skydancer. They are going to need more before they decide it's worth their while to pull us out. Punter edged back to the right until he was back in position, running hard again. He was no longer whooping. A lot later, the convoy broke through the tree line and out onto the rocky outcrop they had selected. It was perfect, better than they had hoped. They even had to slow down to hop from rock to rock as they approached the summit. When Punter got to the top, he found Keen with a can of spray paint marking out a scramjet landing pad on an area of flat rock. You made it, she yelled when she saw him. It was no problem. Just that one bad guy might not even have been one of the hostiles. You really believe that? Keen asked. You think all the action is going to be up in the North Hemisphere? Don't know, he said, and took a look around. But I fancy our chances a lot more now. From the exposed position on top of Cursed Rock, they could see across the treetops of the strange alien forest almost all the way back to the base they had just abandoned. Unless they have an air force, Punter suddenly added, then we're screwed. Keane looked up at the sky, then back at Punter, and shrugged. He started laughing. So, how do you want to do this? he asked when his chuckles had subsided. Nothing fancy, she said. Just draw the wagons into a ring and hope our weapons really do have better range. Yes, boss. Punter turned to look after organising the defences, while Keen turned to a scramjet that was descending to the impoverished platform on its secondary gravitic thrusters. Its mighty scramjet engine, easily more than 70% of its weight, whining as it powered down. The beast reared up to expose its payload bays, supporting itself on wing hinges and undercarriage like some prehistoric raptor. It was the size of a troop transporter almost, though more graceful, and it towered over Keen. Let's make sure you have the absolute deadliest payload of weapons we can put together, she said. The scramjet's drone mind liked the sound of that. It beeped in approval. Nightfall came, and so did news. The scramjets accompanying the engineering drones had spotted a disturbance in the woods near where the slow metal beer moths were. They had engaged with mass drivers, and the disturbance had evaporated. Flying over the scene, they could not find any bodies. Do you think they know we need evidence and they're dragging their fallen away and hiding them? Punter asked. No, I think the mass drivers turned them into mist and a fine sprinkling of droplets in the trees, Keen replied. It was just the first of a series of attacks, each one more determined than the last. By morning, they had all the evidence they needed, relayed up to orbit and up to Skydancer by Scramjet. We'll divert the very next dropship to your location to pick you up, the captain said. Just keep that hilltop you found free of hostiles. Keen stared into the morning sky, greener than any she remembered seeing in all the ground actions of her career. Punter had set up their drone defences well, she saw, and nodded approvingly. She could see circling scramjets in the distance. She increased magnification and saw the tops of the trees shaking and shuddering as mass driver rounds and blaster fire thudded into them. What do you think about how quick they're expending mass driver ammo? Keen asked Punter. What are you going to do? was his response. He was right too. 
The die had been cast, the position chosen. The scramjets knew what they were doing. They wouldn't be firing if there wasn't a good chance of inflicting casualties. They didn't just spray the canopy with fire on the off chance like a human pilot might be tempted to do. The circling scramjets came nearer and nearer, protecting the engineering drones unseen in the forest below. They were firing less and less often. What had been the constant thunder of strafing runs became intermittent flurries of suppressing fire. Then an engineering drone burst through the tree line. Keane looked to see how many others would be following it, but there were none. Only one engineering drone had made it to their new position. Keane didn't care too much about that loss. They were going to be picked up in a matter of hours, and there wasn't much she could use the engineering drones for, but it did point to the potency of their enemy that they could pick off so many under the watchful eye of the circling scramjets. It was very quiet, Keane suddenly noticed, because there hadn't been any firing for three or four minutes. I don't think they like the look of our new position, Punter said, his voice hushed. It's a whole new ball game for them, much more difficult to creep up on things with no tree cover. The scramjets were patrolling the tree line now, in big circles that took them all the way round the base of Cursed Rock and back again, circling endlessly, their mechanical eyes never losing concentration. Five minutes passed, then ten, then twenty. With any luck, the bad guys will go away for a good think, and won't bother us till pick-up, Punter said. As if on cue, they heard firing, scramjets firing into the woods. The firing was coming from in front, from the left, from the right, and from behind them. Keane stared at the woods, but couldn't see anything. Whatever had attracted the drone's attention was set back from the tree line. Then the drone started firing from the ground too, first one to the left, then one to their rear. The drones went instantly from virtual statues to living things, spitting a hail of destruction into the woodland, and Keane then saw her first hostile. She had been expecting something like the one she had seen in the video, but it had a green hide, the same shade as the jungle itself. She opened up with her mass driver, but the thing moved fast. Found some cover behind a rock, her mass driver rounds just uprooted a small tree, trying to find a foothold among the rocks, and threw it in the air. Blast you, she muttered. Then there were five more hostiles, then another ten. Most were picked off by the scramjets and drones, and Punter bagged his first, neatly slicing it in two with traversing fire but some were finding cover among the rocks. It's a good job we have air support, Punter said. With the scramjets on our side, we can deny them cover. The scramjets were now dropping behind the hostiles, picking off the ones that were hidden from the guns on the hilltop, but Keane knew there would inevitably be some who found cover that hid them from both the hilltop and the scramjets. It wasn't quite as simple as Punter imagined. They have some kind of chameleon thing going on. Keane warned. A lot of them were green as they came out of the trees. They'll be as grey as this rock by now. More and more were pouring out of the woodland. It was worrying, and the number of hostiles was impressive, but they were a modern military force. They could keep up their fire for weeks if necessary. The mass drivers, their most fearsome weapons, would run dry in about twenty minutes at this sustained high rate of fire, but they had some mass cubes, enough to reload half the drones, and the blasters would never run out of ammo. They didn't have the stopping power of a mass driver, but they were plenty deadly enough to tear apart one of the humanoid alien hostiles, even though their skin was hardened. Bring them on! Punter yelled. The hostiles seemed to be inching forward, but then a concerted effort by the scramjets destroyed any advances they had made, withering their advance till it was once more back at the tree line. There are hundreds of them, Keane said. How did they manage to mass at the tree line without us noticing? 
They can match their temperature to the ambient and move slowly enough not to trip the motion detectors, make them damn near invisible in the forest, Punters said. He was guessing, of course, but Keane judged them to be good guesses. A terrible thought suddenly occurred to Keane. They know this frontal assault will never work, so why... Her words were cut off as a hostile appeared directly in front of her, rearing up from the ground. If she hadn't suddenly guessed their plan, hadn't stopped firing and adjusted her aim, she would have been dead. Instinct. She had always had good instincts. The creature's mouth was open, and she saw, as she ducked, that the weapon wasn't invisible, as it appeared on the video. There was a bunch of technology within the creature's insectile mouth and a muzzle where its tongue should be. The muzzle was spitting a horrible twisted energy, all the colours of the rainbow, but red shifted to hues of blood. Even though she had ducked, it touched the armour on her back, spreading it in sheets like a hot knife falling on butter. All the creature would have to do would be nod its head downward and that terrible beam of warping energy would mess her up. Of that, she was absolutely sure. Luckily, her masked driver had gotten between the two of them. She shifted it and pulled the trigger, getting the muzzle below the creature's chin, blowing its head off. The creature's carcass toppled backwards and she had a second to catch her breath to realise how close she had just come to being killed. Luckily, she had way too much adrenaline coursing through her system to really let it bother her. To her left, another creature appeared underneath a drone. The creature fired its mouth weapon, sending the drone's thin underside armour flying in warped streaks. The drone scanned left and right, confused, looking for the attacker. It was taking the machine precious seconds to work out what had happened. A fellow drone transmitted the vital information that the attacker was below it and the drone took a step back, tilting its body downward to try and get a visual, but it was too late. It had lost too much armour. The destructive beams of the energy unleashed from the creature's mouth had penetrated into its body cavity. It slowed and stopped. Its status lights went dark. The hostile was killed by mass driver fire from a nearby drone. Mass driver fire that was perilously close to their own units. One round ricocheted and tore off the leg of another nearby drone. Their position would be torn apart if this kept up. How had the hostiles penetrated among them, Keen asked herself, and, more importantly, how could she stop them? If they're camouflaged in the same temperature as the rock, and they move so slowly, Punter was yelling, obviously desperately wrestling with the same problem as her, how do we detect them? Topography, she growled triumphantly. Another hostile had appeared among them, this time taking out three drones before being killed. But she left Punter to deal with it, and to try to keep the drones from shooting each other in the confusion. The hostiles at the tree line had taken advantage of the confusion to encroach further and further up the hill, but she ignored this too. She had to deal with the problem of the hostiles penetrating among their positions. If she dealt with that, they could hold out for weeks. She immediately contacted the scramjets, told them about her idea. Compare topography, she told them. Reload old maps of cursed rock, compare them with what you can see, and destroy rocks younger than one day, she yelled. It was a difficult problem for the scramjets, really exposing the limits of their non-AI intelligence. Their topographical analysis systems were designed for picking landing places and for avoiding smacking into mountains, not for targeting aliens who were pretending to be rocks. They had to recognise the pathways within their firmware on the fly, and it took time. It also distracted them from their job of suppressing the hostiles at the tree line, who took advantage of their discomfort to advance up the hill, the fastest of them engaging with drone positions on the lower slopes of Cursed Rock. Come on, come on, 
Keen was muttering. Recalibrate! Another creature burst out of hiding, right behind Punter, but Keen had been scanning the most exposed areas of their position, watching their asses, and she was ready for it. She blasted it with multiple rounds from her mass driver, even as it was hitting Punter squarely in the back with a blast from its strange but powerful weapon. At such close range, Punter's armour deformed explosively, throwing him forward, propelled by a cloud of debris formed from his own warped armour. Punter! Keen yelled. You okay? Yes, yes, he said, climbing quickly back to his feet. My armour held! Good stuff! I'll never criticise it again! Another fraction of a second, as they both knew, and his flesh would have been warping into spaghetti just like his armour, but neither mentioned it. Then finally, the scramjet started shooting, seemingly at random, among their ranks. The drones instinctively drew away. Hold your positions, you rats! Keen yelled at them. The raptors ain't shooting at you! Concentrate on your targets! The scramjets found interloper after interloper, destroying them before they got right in among the drones. It was only then that exactly how precarious their position had been became clear to them. There were another twenty or thirty hostiles, almost within their perimeter, worming their way to appear later behind their backs. It would have been enough to doom them in only a few minutes more. The hostiles couldn't hide from the scramjets anymore, though. They knew what the hillside of Cursed Rock was supposed to look like, and they were firing on any deviation from that, destroying hidden hostile after hidden hostile. Without support from the scramjets, however, things were deteriorating on the slopes of the rock. The hostiles had overwhelmed the drones further down the rocky outcrop and were now on the upper slopes, within range to shoot at the defenders on every summit of cursed rock. That's when mass driver ammo started to run out. How long had they been fighting? Keen suddenly wondered. Every second seemed infinite, but the minutes had started to run away from her. Keen had been parsimonious with her driver and had enough for ten minutes more, but the drones in good firing positions were stuttering to a halt with their main weapons. There was no way to sugarcoat it. They were being slowly and surely overrun. What had looked like a pretty good position was gradually turning to crap. Where is that dropship? Punter yelled. They won't pick us up if we don't keep a landing zone clear for them, Keen yelled. Leave the drones to fight it out with the hostiles and fall back to the landing pad I painted for the raptors. Keen and Punter hightailed it up to the landing pad and crouched down among the rocks. Keen took a good look at their situation. They were surrounded by a ring of drones, a very slender ring in places, all firing outward at the encroaching hostiles. Now that the scramjets had finished clearing the hilltop, they had turned their attention back to the hostiles, to devastating effect. The situation seemed to have reached a state of equilibrium, except for the fact that more and more drones were running out of mass driver ammo, and the scramjets were being reduced to using blasters too. The hostiles had also come up with a new tactic. They built up forces, unseen among the trees, and burst forth to charge the line of drones at the weakest parts. Most of these charges were doomed, chewed apart by mass driver fire from an observant raptor, or driven back by massed fire from the drones. But one or two of the charges had found their mark, leaving a warped and busted drone or two before being repulsed. Each time this happened, the line of drones had to contract a little, or get a little thinner, or both. It's only a matter of time before they break through, Punter said. Agreed, was Keane's only response. But how long? Punter pressed. I think we have to know. Keen summoned up a tactical program into her armour suit's memory and ran it. She fed in the variables as she saw them, picking and choosing from the data she had available, and watched as the outcome was computed.
The answer came back in seconds. Looks like we've got about four hours, Keane said, rounding up generously. Four hours! The disbelief was plain in Punter's voice. That tactical simulator of yours needs an upgrade or something. Twenty minutes went by with the loss of only one drone, but then two were lost in the next five minutes, before a relatively peaceful half-hour with no friendly casualties. Multitudes of hostiles were chopped down, but no friendly casualties. Punter and Keane had both been glancing up at the sky the whole time, willing a dropship, a grav barge, an atmospheric transport, anything to appear. There was nothing, just the windless, featureless blue sky with the dark shadows of their own scramjets flitting around. The scramjets were now all out of mass driver ammo, all looping down to tear at the hostiles with blaster fire. As one of the scramjets came round for another strafing run, the hostiles did something strange. They stopped pressing onward up the hill and seemed to huddle together. The scramjet flew on, unworried by the change in behaviour, but as the blaster impacts started to tell, started to tear the hostiles apart, the whole group twitched. Huh? Keane said. Both her and Punter were now watching. The twitching group of hostiles suddenly grew upwards, shooting upwards as the hostiles jumped to the shoulders of other hostiles, like acrobats at a circus. One hostile was left at the top of the pyramid to jump as high as it could, bringing its mouth weapon in range of the scramjet. What the? Punter said. The hostile hunched its shoulders, hissed like a cat, the beam it projected seeming thicker and more torturous than usual, and it had just enough range to lick gently at the scramjet. The scramjet's right wing twisted into an unnatural shape, sending the stricken thing ploughing into the side of cursed rock, right on top of two drones, resulting in a giant detonation and showers of scrap metal and rock debris. The hostiles were running for the gap in the circle of drones before the smaller of the rocks and metal parts had finished raining out of the air. Keen and Punter both immediately brought their mass drivers to their shoulders and started sustained firing, plugging the hole in their lines with rounds from the mass drivers. Not good, not good, Punter said. Keep firing, Keen said. Give the drones time to reposition and plug the gap. What drones? Punter muttered. That's it. We've spread them as thinly as they'll go. So just keep firing, Keen said. Just then, a shadow fell across Punter's armour. Grav transport, he yelled, his voice exultant. Well, what are you waiting for? Keen screamed at him. Climb in! She didn't dare take her eyes off the oncoming hostiles, now pouring through the gap in their lines, until Punter yelled for her to follow. She dropped her aim, turned and ran for the transport. She saw it immediately, just a little distance away. But the time it took to run, with her back exposed towards the enemy, was excruciating. She saw an armoured door gunner pensively surveying the scene behind her, a scene she couldn't see. A male voice came over her communicator. Keep your head down as you run, I'm gonna have to deter your followers a little. The gun at the grav transport's door exploded into life, the mass driver rounds arcing over her head as she ducked and ran. The deadly little rods of metal were uncomfortably close, which meant the hostiles were right behind her. The grav transport was hovering on its grav engines about two metres above the ground. With the assistance of the massive legs of her suit, it was an easy jump. She landed half in and half out of the large side door. She grabbed onto the floor panels and hauled the bottom half of her body in. It was only then that she was able to turn round and look the way she had come. The circle of drones had completely collapsed and the hostiles were running unhindered for the landing pad. 
The pilot was juicing the grav engines so that they had already risen a few more meters and were rapidly accelerating upwards, but the hostiles were still running undeterred. Then they seemed to fall, a whole row of them, and then another row falling on top. Keen instantly realized what was happening. They were building another structure. They were rapidly building some kind of ramp or mound, using their own bodies as building blocks to create a smooth path upward for their kin. It was living architecture in which each hostile was a brick. It possessed surprising strength and flexibility, reaching a height of tens of meters and involving hundreds of hostiles. Soon there was a giant ramp, with hostile after hostile jumping from the top, screaming out their warping energy at the apex of the flight and falling to earth. The door gunner slid shut the armoured door, which warped and buckled in his hands, refusing to close the whole way. There was the screeching, grinding noise of tortured metal and then silence. They had escaped. Nobody spoke. Only the grav engines could be heard humming gently, powering them into orbit. Chapter 13 Why didn't you shoot the alien scientist? Altea asked. I think a lot of other ground troopers in your situation would have shot first and asked questions later. You're right, Nave said pensively. It was the body language, I guess. At some level, I realised he, or she, was trying to protect his or her stuff. He wasn't attacking me in any way. Take a seat, will you please, Altea said. She was indicating a normal-looking chair, but there was a column of technology beside it, draped in cables like an old tree draped in vines. Nave hesitated a moment, but then sat. Altea moved behind him and started attaching electrodes and other probes to his forehead, wrist and chest. She had to undo the two fasteners off his shirt to get at his chest. She didn't show the slightest hint of shyness or hesitation about it. Is this some kind of lie detector? Nave asked. No, Altea said. Then after a pause, why, have you been less than truthful with me? Why would I bother? My armor suit sensors were recording the whole time. You know as much as I do about what happened, if you've watched the footage. In fact, you probably know more. You can rewind, fast forward and freeze frame. And consult a lot of sensor readings that you probably didn't have time to notice, such as infrared and motion detectors, Altea said. Right. But, she continued... The human mind has a way of building up a picture of things, the faculty of pattern recognition it has, which can be very useful. And that flash from the ceiling is pretty much unexplained. It also knocked out a lot of your suit sensors for a fraction of a second here and a fraction of a second there. Yeah, that flash of light, those flashes of light, they have me a little worried when I come to think about them. I wonder if I'm going to mutate into some kind of alien monster. Altea laughed at this. I don't think there's much chance of that. Then something seemed to occur to her, her face going serious. At least, I don't think so. Nave couldn't work out if she was messing with him or not. She took a step back to admire her handiwork, then went over to a big console that Nave didn't remember seeing from the last time he was in the room. So tell me what happened in your own words, she said, waving at Nave to begin with an encouraging hand gesture. Okay, he said. We had just defeated the missile system. But is that a good place to start? As good as any. Did it seem too easy to defeat the missile defences? Too easy? Too easy? No, it definitely did not seem too easy. Those missiles were coming down like hard rain, and any one of them would have been enough to take out almost all of us, me and all the drones. 
Even a piece of shrapnel can catch in a seam in the armour, cause a leak, and if the suit atmosphere mixes with the planetary atmosphere, kablooey. The two sets of gases make some super unstable kind of explosive. I'm aware of that, Altea said. So you saw the missiles as a genuine threat? I damn near crapped my pants. If I hadn't had so much to think about, I reckon I would have. Okay, continue. She called up a hologram of the structure and was mapping out a route from the hill, onto the ledge where the door was. Nave realised it was the route he had followed to enter the building. After that, I decided to go into the structure. Why? It looked dead. I was curious about it. You risked your life. It's not like staying outside was any safer. We were taking heavy casualties at that point. How did you gain entry? The questions continued and Nave answered as truthfully as he could. He was warming to Altea and genuinely wanted to help her with whatever it was she was up to. He realised he still wasn't sure what the point of the interrogation was. What's all this about? he asked. Didn't I explain? Sort of, but not really. OK, it might actually help you if you know, she said. The thing is that this scientist had access to an alien technology that we barely understand. The scientist also seems to have had a control over the technology that we lack. It is possible that he had used the technology to reprogram your mind and suit sensors to show a shorter and less eventful visit than actually took place. You think he did something to me and wiped my memories? It's an exciting possibility, just a theory of course, a hypothesis. But what we are doing here is looking for any hint that would confirm it. Some confirmation that my mind has been messed with by a mad alien scientist using advanced technology he stole from another species of aliens. That's about the size of it, Altea confirmed. But I've been questioning you for hours now, and there is no hint that your memories deviate in any way from the recordings made by your armour and by the drones that were with you. I don't know if I'm glad to hear that, or if I'm sorry. Me neither. It would be an exciting prospect, but frightening. It would mean the alien technology left by the drifters is as powerful as we imagine. But it would also mean, after all, that the buzzers are further along in their attempts to control it than we are. When you were bringing me here, you mentioned another thing, Nave said. That's been on my mind. I was talking about the flashes. If anything did happen, I think it most likely happened just before, during or just after the period marked in the footage and in your memories by the two flashes. But let's take a rest for today. If I fatigue you or tell you too many fairy stories, I'll be running the risk of planting false memories in your brain. I like the sound of that, Nave said, smiling for the first time in a few hours. Taking a break, I mean. Altea came out from behind her console. The holographic map floating above it was now so complex that she couldn't avoid passing through a corner of it, causing it to flicker, recalculate and move a little to the right out of her way. She removed the probes from Nave's forehead from his wrists, then pulled at his shirt to get better access to the electrodes she had placed on his chest. She gasped. Her hands stopped. She took a step back, letting go of his shirt. Have they always been there? she asked. Have what always been there? These marks. Nave looked down at his chest, at what she was pointing at. No, he said, a very slight note of alarm in his voice. They have most definitely not always been there. Across his chest was a line of alien writing, just like the writing on the walls around them. Each rune was dark as a tattoo, and also red and livid, like it had been freshly burned. Altea was squinting, trying to make out the symbols, but having difficulty because of the strange medium of being imprinted in flesh. 
she reached out a hand to touch them, trace the outlines. Whoa there, Nave said. For some reason he couldn't explain, it felt more intimate than the attaching of electrodes. He wasn't sure he wanted anyone touching these strange symbols that had appeared on his chest. May I? she asked. Nave shook his head, did up his shirt, and stood up. You mentioned a rest and something to eat, he said. Yes, I did, she nodded, and it would be rather churlish to withdraw my offer now, wouldn't it? Churlish, Nave said, exactly what I was thinking. I haven't had much of anything to eat since yesterday. I have a food synthesizer in the next room. They went into the next room, an area that Nave hadn't seen before. It was full of human technology. One of the shower toilet cubicle things, like the one that Nave had up in his new quarters, and a flimsy-looking camp bed. All the comforts of home, Altea said. You live here, Nave was incredulous, down among all this alien stuff. Not officially, she said. I've been assigned a cubicle up near where yours is located, but I spend so much time down here. You know how it is. I guess, Nave nodded. He didn't, of course. He never had a job where he would voluntarily spend a moment longer than mandated on duty but he could imagine that there were such things as jobs that weren't demeaning, badly paid, boring and dangerous. Take a seat and I'll cook you up something. They chatted for a while, then Nave got up to go back to his room with a smile on his face. Get back here early in the morning, Altea said as he left. Nave nodded over his shoulder and carried on out of the room. Altea immediately went back to her lab and sat down at her work console. She called up a holographic terminal screen and downloaded video and stills taken by the cameras dotted around the room. She blew them up until she was looking at the ancient alien runes that seemed to be burnt into Nave's flesh. As she studied them from every angle, directing software routines to create simplified versions and overlay those on the complex originals. She could immediately tell that the meaning of the inscription was complex and that it would take some time to decrypt. Up in his quarters, Nave was standing at the mirror with his shirt off. He was staring at the alien letters, which seemed to be slowly fading, if that wasn't a figment of his imagination. He was searching his memory for gaps, for inconsistencies, but they weren't there. He was sure. But the presence of the alien writing was undeniable. He just had no idea how it had gotten there, no idea what had happened to him in that room. His door chimed. Who's there? Jay? Oh, Nave hesitated for a beat. Come on in. The door slid aside and the robot came in. He saw Nave staring at himself in the mirror and his head cocked to the side. Are you checking out your abs? he asked. I didn't have you pegged for that type. No, Nave said, annoyed. This... He waved a hand at the alien rune scrawled across his chest. Um, nice tats? Never mind. Did you find a place to stay, or do you need to crash here? There's a room for you now, next door. I found myself a cushy little berth. Don't worry about me. I found a place with the engineering drones. Their hangar is almost completely automated. No noisy humes asking me to do busy work. Nave reached for his shirt and started folding it up. Hey, you're full AI, he said. You don't have to do anything anyone says. Why do you care how many humes are wandering about? Well, it isn't exactly official, you see, my AI status. The powers that be don't like redesignating a system as AI. Right, got it. It's funny, you using the word hume. Most humes don't like it. I don't always think of myself as a Hume. Humanity hasn't ever done much for me. Never given me respect. Never even given me enough to eat. Not until I joined the Navy. 
So the deal is, I can starve in the streets like a dog or agree to be a murderer in the Navy for them with my life on the line every day because the plutocrats at the top are too chicken to personally fight the people they piss off. You're not kidding, Knave, Jay said. That isn't the way most Humes think. But I'm not a droid or a buzzer either, so I guess I'm just a knave. That's deep. Are you messing with me? No, I like you. You're a nut. Why are you here? To talk, shoot the breeze, chew the fat, put the world to rights, compare theosophies. You get the idea, it passes the time. I'm not good at small talk, I've noticed. The droid made an electric chuckling noise that made Knave smile. But don't worry, I've got plenty of talk for the both of us. I like to practice. I might have to pass a Turing test one day. Turing test? Not important, an old joke. Let's synthesize us some alcohol. I already tried, Knave said. Noob, the robot snorted. If I can hack cutting-edge military hardware, don't you think I can persuade your prehistoric food synthesizer to conjure up some alcohol? The only question is, do you prefer wine, beer, or a drop of the hard stuff? Beer, they've said, light and fizzy and cold. Spoken like a boy with an uneducated palate. Just show me how to hack that food synthesizer. Knave said, suddenly feeling in great need of a beer and having no interest in having his palate educated. You're the boss, Jay said, until I get that AI status officially. So I am your human overlord and you have to do my bidding. Don't push it, Knave, or I'll poison that beer. It was many hours later when the door chimed again. Knave, where are you? I said to come to the lab early. Altea's voice came from a little speaker in the door access control system. Shall I let her in? Jay asked. A shape on the camp bed moved a little and groaned. I'll take that as a yes. The droid got up off the floor where it had been sitting cross-legged. It opened the little cubicle's door to reveal Altea leaning against the door frame, her finger extended ready to push the bell again. Ugh, she said. What's that smell? Jay indicated the bed with a thumb, where the shape was still moving weakly. Another groan came from that direction. Has he been drinking? Altea asked, genuine shock on her face. Sure looks like it. But how and why? He said something about being interfered with by aliens. He seemed upset. Oh, Altea's face fell. It's to be expected, I suppose. We don't really know what happened to him. She looked in the direction of the shape slumped on the bed for a few more seconds, this time with more sympathy on her face. Can you give him something to flush that alcohol out of his system, shower him and send him down to the lab? Whenever he's ready. Sure thing. OK, tell him there's no rush. Will do. Thanks. Altea went off down the corridor, with Jay watching her go. Curiouser and curiouser, he said. A thank you from a Hume. What? Nave said, a head emerging from beneath the blanket. You just missed your girlfriend. She said to get yourself down to the lab pronto. You have more lab rat work to do. That's what she said. That's what she said. You lying tin full of diodes. She isn't the type. She's a lady. Just get in the shower, Jay chuckled, and I'll mix up something for your sore head. Thanks. Knave dragged himself out of bed and staggered towards his shower-toilet combo unit. Hey, the robot yelled. What? Your tats are gone. I told you, Knave mumbled. They're alien tats. I've never seen anything like that before, Jay said. I don't think anyone has seen anything like these before, Knave said, and closed the door of the wash toilet unit behind him. I had a feeling you'd be fun to hang out with, 
Jay whispered in the general direction of Nave. Then he went over to the mirror. He saw a medium-sized robot. He actually only came up to Nave's shoulder, and Nave wasn't the tallest of humans. The robot looking back at him from the mirror had a helmet-like head, but elongated it to the front like a dog's muzzle. His body was boxy and bipedal, and his arms skeletal, but his legs were sturdy, terminating in boot-like feet. It was a very stable configuration, and Jay was pleased with it. He hadn't made any changes in quite some time. The colour scheme, on the other hand, was more difficult. He was constantly tinkering with it. At the moment, he was mostly painted a plastic-looking white, like a kitchen appliance, with red accents at the shoulders and knees. His eyes were a black visor slit. Not bad, he said, almost drowned out by the sound of Knave singing in the shower. But it might look better with some alien runes scrawled across the chest. He looked himself up and down critically one more time. His knee actuators were getting old, he noticed, and would need replacing. Then he went over to the food synthesizer unit and mixed up a hangover cure. Chapter 14 Admiral Danda and Shavir were deep in conversation. Shavir was present on his bridge in hologram form. Admiral Danda suddenly paused, something important occurring to him. By the way, Shavir, he said, what is your position? I'm on Ice Tomb, overseeing the investigation of the site. We're finally making some progress in our study of drifter science and culture, and this site could provide the key to unlocking a treasure trove of strategically important new advances in technology. Yes, the Admiral nodded. I am aware of the vital nature of your work, but do you need to be there personally to oversee the dig? I suppose not. Why? We have committed a considerable force to securing the planet, and I had hoped that would be the end of the matter. But buzzer forces are massing nearby, and I and our strategy people are predicting that the buzzers will try to retake Ice Tomb. We have so many ships here, Shavir said. We've dug in so securely. Is it even possible that they could retake this site? Unfortunately, the Admiral said, bringing up a display of the current strategic situation. It's a distinct possibility. The system is much closer to their lines of supply, and we are a trifle overextended. Unless we make some breakthrough soon across the wider front, we aren't going to be able to keep it. We only have it now because we took them by surprise. I see, Shavir said. Ice Tomb is going to fall, and the fall will be sudden. I can't guarantee safety of personnel on the planet when the buzzers counter-attack, and that isn't a question of if, it's a question of when. I understand, Admiral, Shavir nodded, her face set. I'll have my people map as much of the complex here in as much detail as possible, with the dig on going to the very end. But I'll evacuate to a more secure location immediately. That would be wise. I'll need a biological lab, a very secure one, set up at the new location. The Admiral nodded. Actually, he said, there is a very secure facility at Seat of Reason. After Shavir had talked to the Admiral, she went to see Altea, slightly surprised to find her with the subject called Knave unconscious on an examination table. The room was in semi-darkness because Altea had dimmed the lights to help Knave along into unconsciousness and hadn't turned them back up. What is this? Shavir asked. Some very fascinating developments, Altea said. Notice the marks across the skin of the subject's upper chest area. Are these drifter symbols? Shavir asked. Yes, Altea said, and they only appear in proximity to the drifter artifacts in this location. Fascinating, Shavir said. 
Do you know if this was something done during his encounter with the buzzer scientist? Or is it a more general effect to do with exposure? And if so, why hasn't it affected any of us? I have no idea, Altea said. But I will let you know as soon as it is possible to start building some kind of hypothesis. Excellent. I need you to keep me informed about everything that's going on here. Shavir waved a hand at Knave lying on the table. This, for example. But I also need a concerted effort made to get this place mapped, with samples taken. Even though I'm being called away to other experiments, this place will remain at the forefront of my attention. I have a feeling it will turn out to be central to our efforts to understand the drifter culture. Called away? Altea, I have been called back to Science Ministry HQ, Shavir said. You will be taking control of operations on Ice Tomb. I am transferring control of this scientific facility to you. The local Navy and Ground Forces commanders will ensure your security and will continue to pacify remaining pockets of buzzer resistance, but you will be in charge of all operations regarding the scientific base and the dig. This is a great honour, Shavir. Thank you. It is deserved, Shavir nodded. After me, you have one of the best scientific minds of our culture. Just explore as much of the riches available here as possible. Catalog it and send it. Box up and send me anything that isn't nailed down. I'm counting on you. I won't let you down, Altea said. Shavir nodded again, clapped Altea on the shoulder, turned and left. Altea watched her exit the room, and it took her a moment to empty her mind again and return to studying Knave. Shavir was soon forgotten as she studied the symbols. There was no context to them, but she could see that the drifter symbol for home was repeated twice, once at the start of the sequence and once at the end. She was also studying the scans of Knave, provided by the most sensitive equipment she could get her hands on. She couldn't find any physical abnormalities. What process causes the symbols to appear? she asked, for the benefit of the recording. She suspected that it wouldn't make any difference what scale she studied Nave at. There would be no physical clue as to the cause or the nature of the signs. She adjusted the mix of neurochemicals she was introducing into Nave's head, but the brain patterns and mental activity she was seeing all seemed normal. She gave up in exasperation, and set the machines to slowly wake Knave, then went to sit at her usual console. Shavia's questions had been good ones. Altea sat, wondering if the signs written across Knave's chest were the doing of the room's drifter technology of the buzzer scientist, of the strange mixture of the two, or if she would ever know. She was roused from her pondering by Knave, who started groaning on the table. The devices that had been monitoring him folded out of the way as he swung his legs over the side of the couch and sat up. They would still be scanning until he was a few steps away from the table, but the resolution dropped, and then dropped even more as he started to move around. Well, Doc, he said, am I still human? You're as close as you likely ever were. I can't find any mechanism that is making these symbols appear. All I can say is the topography of your skin is not altering. So it is some process, chemical maybe, that is taking place in the cells themselves. Nave paused, digesting this. So I've been messed with at a cellular level. Probably some even more basic level than that. Great, Nave nodded. And was it the buzzer who did this, or was it the drifter technology working all on its own? It's hard to say, Altea admitted her ignorance unwillingly. It could be connected to the sign that the buzzer wrote, to the drifter technology reacting to the confrontation, or maybe the buzzer set the machinery to attack you in some way and your drone saved your life. Or maybe they are just stupid, bloodthirsty machines and they murdered one of the finest minds in the galaxy. At least you have your theories, Nave said a smile catching at the corner of his mouth. I suppose this means we'll be seeing a lot more of each other, 
me being a test subject now. Altea nodded. I suppose that's what it means, she said. Then followed a period that Knave would remember as one of the happiest times of his life. Months went by, and a kind of normality descended on the Ice Moon. The attacks mounted by buzzer forces remaining on the planet became less frequent and less intense. Tarazat forces gained control of the entire Mount Fang complex, and the complex proved much more extensive than they had suspected. The mountain itself was studded with drifter structures and riddled with tunnels, but the tunnel complex went deeper, much deeper. There was level after level of structure, all accessed by stairways and shafts. The shafts used gravitic effects to allow people to rise and descend, powered by gentle arm movements. They were still operational, and they were lined with symbols. Knave loved plummeting down through the grav shafts much better than plodding down the spiral ramps, and it was possible to reach quite a speed before the shaft overrode his actions and slowed him down. Altea explored everywhere, and, of course, Knave came with her. He became a kind of drifter technology detector. In areas of the Mount Fang complex where drifter technology was densest, and in the best working order, the symbols on Knave's chest became more distinct. While out on the surface, or in structures of exclusively buzzer technology, they faded to nothing. All Knave had to do was accompany Altea through her day and share all her triumphs and discoveries with her. He started to develop a sort of sixth sense for drifter technology. He didn't know if it was his imagination or something real, but he would get a sensation in the area around his heart when drifter technology was at its densest. Deeper, Knave said one day. I think we need to go deeper. They were already many levels deeper than they had ever been before. They were alone except for drones. Altea had used her newfound authority to get hold of a team of very advanced drones. There were five of them, and they were bipedal, light, slim, and very mobile. Altea wanted them to be able to go anywhere that she and Nave went, but they were also very capable. They were each armed with a short but heavy blaster slung under the right forearm. The five of them, working as a team, could easily hold off a couple of stray buzzers, which was judged to be the likeliest threat they might encounter. Even the drones' faces were graceful. They were about Altea's height, with the female cast to their metal jaws. Their sensors were hidden away behind reflective blaster armor, so they looked a little blank-faced, and they had no indication of a mouth at all. If they needed to vocalize, it came from a unit in their chest. They had each been given an identification number for their current mission, ranging from VIP-1 to VIP-5. Altea was the very important person, and their mission was to keep her alive. Knave had quickly started calling them Viper-1 to Viper-5, and Altea had picked up the habit. One of the five vipers was always within earshot, and they were constantly repositioning, checking the environment for danger, making sure no stray buzzer or other threat was anywhere near their VIP charge. They were often the first to spot a new passage, or a different way ahead, and they reported directly both to Altea and Nave. We can proceed forward or to the right, no threats detected, Viper 4 said. Then it simply waited for a response. It would wait all day if need be. None of the Vipers were ever in a hurry. They only hurried when their human charges did, trotting or even gracefully running, to stay ahead of them and make sure their route was secure. Thank you, Altea said, always polite, even to a drone, then turned her attention back to Knave. What do you mean, deeper? We have penetrated down almost as far as the liquid ocean below the ice. Yes, Knave said, but I have a firm feeling that we can go even deeper. How? 
Altea asked. She was now always genuinely interested in any of his suggestions. He had been physically marked by the ancient drifter culture. He was no longer some ordinary slug in her eyes. The grav shafts don't seem to extend below this level, she said, or at least we haven't encountered any in days. It had been days wandering this, the lowest level yet discovered, and weeks mapping the structure above, and Knave had been thoroughly enjoying it. He had gotten used to the dark corridors and chambers, to sleeping in temporary structures set up among the alien ruins. There is a way, Knave said. He didn't know how he knew, but he knew. He could see Altia's face in the light from the readouts within her suit helmet's faceplate. She simply raised an eyebrow, surprised but not in a disbelieving way. All right, she said, but we haven't found a grav shaft that goes any deeper, and without the grav shafts it's going to be difficult to go lower. You know what it is, Knave said. No. Altia was still being very patient with him. I've done a few behind-the-scenes jobs. Uh-huh, and you see buildings from a different perspective if you are in the kitchens washing dishes or in the garage guarding grav transports. That's robots' work, Altia said. Not on my home planet, Knave said quietly, almost to himself. Go on. You see, in a job like that, that a structure has two faces. One that is for show and one that is more functional. There is a big difference between the turbo elevators in a hotel lobby and the bare grav platform at the back for goods and luggage transport. The lobby elevators are showy, obvious, but the goods platform doesn't look much different from all the other bare systems in the back of the hotel. So we're looking for the goods elevator? Altia asked. Sort of, Knave said his confidence deserting him a little. Maybe. It's an interesting theory, Altea mused. If you're right, it'll open up as yet unexplored parts of the structure. Altea pulled a hologram projector out of a pouch on her utility belt and looked around for a surface to set it up on. They were in a chamber with three exits the one they had come in through, and the two options they had to choose from to continue their mapping and exploration. There were two structures in the room that reached to human chest height, but didn't look like furniture. They looked more like computer cores, or some other hot equipment that needed numerous heat vanes around the sides. The tops, however, were flat and level. Altea placed the projector on top of one of the structures and switched it on. A couple of indicator lights sprung to life, but otherwise her hologram projector did nothing. Let me see schematics of the floor topography of this level, Altea told the small device. The device lit up the room with a patchwork quilt of the floor topography that had so far been scanned. It was undoubtedly out of date, but communications were proving difficult within the complex, so she would have to wait till she got back to their central computing center before she could update it. Still lots of empty quadrants, Knave noticed. It might still be enough, Altea said over her shoulder, then turned her attention back to the projector. Display only structure that is repeated four times or more. A lot of the patchwork representation of the floor topography melted away. What was left was a surprisingly large number of structures that were repeated throughout this lowest level of the drifter passages below Mount Fang. This is where we should probably start investigating, Altea said. If there are any hidden elevators, they're likely to be a floor-level structure that repeats. Two weeks later, they were still looking for Knave's goods elevators. Altea was in the centre of a likely chamber floor, a chamber that was not near the centre of the complex, but was more of an outlying structure. It wasn't well connected either, with just a single door providing access. The vipers were at the doorway and spread down the corridor, leaving Knave and Altea to investigate the room. 
Nave was just standing and staring, taking in the huge wall opposite the chamber entrance. It seemed to be a mural. I'm no expert, Nave said, but won't these pictures be useful in deciphering the drifter language? Decrypting, Altia said. She was kneeling in the centre of the room, looking at one of the items of repeating floor topography that had still not given up its secrets. What? The process is called decrypting, Altia repeated, and it's on hold at the moment because I'm trying to help you get to some secret lower level, even though there is no direct evidence for the existence of such a level other than a feeling you had. If it helps, Nave said, turning to look at her in the centre of the room, I'm getting that feeling very strongly now. Really? Because, as far as I can tell, this latest item of repeating floor topography looks like a simple vent, or maybe a heat sink or something. It doesn't look like an elevator or grav platform. No, Nave admitted. Perhaps not. He watched her taking readings with some sort of scanner, then unpack some tools from her utility belt. His attention wandered to the walls of the chamber again. They were absolutely covered in technology of one form or another. There were conduits, pipes, switching places, circuit boards, control panels, all in the robust bronze finish preferred by the drifters, all carved over with symbols, and yet, beneath the mess of what seemed to Nave later editions, there was a mural. It looked like an abstract relief sculpture, with disjointed shapes and flat areas, but Nave felt there had to be some meaning there. Remember when you were telling me about your idea of flow? Nave said. Hmm? Altia was distracted. You told me, Nave carried on, whether she was listening or not, more for himself, that you had the idea of flow. You said that was the breakthrough. You told me that once you had decided to look at everything through this one prism, it had all started to take shape. This isn't a simple vent, Altia mused, not really listening to Nave. But then again, what about drifter technology is simple? The graph shafts are simple, Nave volunteered. Simple to use, Altia nodded, though neither were looking at each other. She was engrossed with her floor feature, he with his mural. But far from simple to construct. This mural seems simple too, Nave mused, but perhaps it hides some sort of complexity. Altia looked up. He had succeeded in attracting her attention. But she didn't say anything. She just put her tools down on the floor of the chamber, laid her hands in her lap, and observed him. Nave traced a shape within the mural with his fingers. See, he said, there are two of these, this shape here and this one here. They look different, but something about them feels the same. Go on, Altea said. This structure containing them is this room, maybe, and this area down here is a lower level. You seem to be reading an awful lot into an essentially abstract carving, Altea said. Perhaps I'm deluding myself, Nave said. The artist who created this wall carving must have lived... how long ago? Before what we think of as the first founding of our civilization, Altea said, and it has been protected from the moon's plate tectonics across the immense stretches of time since then. Exactly, Nave said. How can any human possibly know what was going on through that drifter's head when it stood here with a hammer and chisel and did this? I doubt it used a chisel, Altea said. Oh no? No. The surfaces are too smooth for that. Does it look to you like the drifters were bipeds? Yes, Altea said, like us. But the perspective in the image is off somehow, Nave said. Or they were enormous. These are the sort of things I would love to find out, 
Altea said. But to focus for a moment, if this really was the way down that we've been looking for, how do we activate it? Dunno, Nave said after a pause. That's helpful, Nave, she said, but there was a smile on her lips. How much drifter tech have we actually seen in operation? he asked. Only the stuff that is always on, like the grav elevators and the automatic repair modules. Oh, Altea paused for a second. And the machine in the room with you and the buzzer scientist. Oh yeah, that machine was definitely working. But I've been wondering. The buzzer, did he make that happen? Nave asked. And even if he did, how did he do it? Altea didn't answer, and Nave could see that she was thinking hard. He watched her face. He liked to watch her think. Not her whole face, though. Through the environment's suit helmet, all he could see was her forehead, eyes, and a bit of her upper lip. A small vent in the suit's neck sent out a puff of gas into the frigid air, where it immediately froze and fell to the ground as snow reminding Knave that he certainly didn't want to be in here without his suit on. There were reflections in the faceplate of her suit, reflections of the bronze-like metal of the room around them, and the stone of the carved walls beneath the metal. The most bronze was in the ceiling above them, Knave saw in the reflection. He looked up to see hardly any stone, all machines, every one with a bronze sheen. Must be hell to polish, he said. That joke wasn't funny the first time, Altea groaned, craning her neck to join him in looking at the ceiling. But there is an unusual amount of technology in here. Like in the room where it happened. Altea didn't need him to explain. She knew he was talking about his encounter with the buzzer scientist. She had seen the same thing he had or, at least a recording of it, through his suit cameras. Where the buzzer carved an operator, she said. There was a long pause while neither said anything. That's it, Altea whispered. She went over to where she had left her tools on the floor. What's it? Nave asked. His voice was excited for her, but more than a little confused. It, Altea said. She was picking up her tools one by one, examining them, discarding them. This one, she said triumphantly. Nave recognised the tool and suddenly realised what she had in mind. You're going to carve something, he said. Yes, she smiled at him, pleased at how quick he was. Of course. But have you ever carved anything before? No, but I don't think our buzzer friend had ever carved anything before either. She stood up and went over to the wall that was most covered over with drifter symbols, densely packed on the rock of the walls and on the machinery itself. This is nuts, Nave said. What kind of input interface requires a hammer and chisel? Like I said, she lifted her tool to the wall, a small but powerful laser torch. I don't think they used a hammer and chisel. I still don't get it. Don't feel bad, she turned to give him an encouraging smile. I would probably never have worked it out either. Not without the insight of the buzzer you talked to. But think about it for a moment. It's the perfect input method. No need to scroll through endless menus of options. Just write what you want and have it happen. I don't know about perfect, Nave muttered. Well, perhaps not perfect. But look how aesthetic it is. She lifted her arms and did a pirouette to indicate the commands written on walls, floor and ceiling all around them. It's pretty, Nave allowed. Now why don't we add our contribution? She returned to her spot on the wall, calibrated the laser cutter, linked it to her data bank of translated symbols and started writing. The buzzer had obviously known more than her about the underlying technology, but she was confident that she was a better linguist. Nevertheless, she chose to write something quite simple. Two entities for transport down, she said, as she wrote. 
Now all I need is an operator, she said to Nave. She hadn't realised how long it had taken her to write the sentence on the wall, but she saw by the expression on Nave's face that it had taken a while. To her, it had taken what hardly seemed like any time at all, but to Nave, it had been an eternity, watching her hunched over, carefully carving each character. How long will it take to carve that? he asked. Not long, she said, ignoring the tone in his voice and bending back to her work. It's a good thing these suits have good batteries, Nave grumbled. Time slowly passed until Altea eventually stood back from her work. That should do it, she said. It has certainly done something, Nave nodded. The corridor outside had gone dark, and there was no sign of the vipers, who had been there guarding them moments before. Nave drew his gun from a holster attached to the right leg of his environment suit. Maybe I should have worn that fancy armour they issued me, Nave said. Maybe you should have, Altea agreed. They both walked towards the dark corridor, side by side. Nave had a lamp slung under the barrel of the gun and switched it on, sending a beam of illumination down the corridor. But instead of the corridor they had been expecting, there was an open space with six walls and no obvious exit. Five of the walls, as Nave shone the beam of his flashlight over them, were the usual mix of rock, technology with a bronze sheen, and drifter symbols. The far wall, however, was different. It was smooth, apart from what looked like natural striations in the surface, like in the ice of a glacier. Cave in? Nave asked. Hardly, Altea murmured. I'd rather think my writing worked. I think this whole room is a goods elevator. I think I brought us down to a lower level. But I didn't feel any movement, and the change was instant. We could simulate that effect with our own technology. Just move the room fast enough and damp the gravity in the elevator the same way gravity is damped in a starship when it's dogfighting. If you say so, Nave said, bowing to her superior understanding of engineering and science. But even I know that the power required would be enormous. Why bother? Why bother indeed? So, Nave said, investigate further or go back for our escort of vipers. Altea didn't bother answering. She just walked out of the alien goods lift and into the dark, switching on a powerful little light attached to the top of her helmet. Seeing her do that made Nave wince. Wandering around with a big light strapped to your helmet was just an invitation to get shot in the head. He looked at his own more powerful flashlight and smiled ruefully. He was announcing himself as a target just as temptingly. There was really no way round it. They had to see, and even if he knew how to switch on the lights, he might have decided against it in case it announced their presence. I wonder why this level is in darkness, Altea said, while the levels above are all illuminated. Maybe the drifters on this level didn't pay their electricity bill, Nave said. Altea didn't bother to reply to his lame joke. She went right up to the unusual striated wall and put her hand against it. She read the temperature readings from her fingers of her suit gloves, transferred it to a readout inside her visor. This wall is cold, she said. No kidding, Nave replied. The whole base was 160 degrees below freezing. A human wouldn't survive long without an environment suit. The buzzers didn't seem to mind it, though. And the rumour was that they even preferred the cold, though how anyone would know that was beyond Nave. Come and touch it, Altea said. Nave came over, and they were both soon standing side by side, each with a hand touching the strange striated wall. Oh, Nave said, I see what you mean. It's almost twice as cold as the rest of the complex. Exactly. Altea said, and my suit is giving me some funny sensor readings. 
She peered at the wall, moving her helmet closer and closer. Then she saw a shape on the other side and blurted out a short involuntary yelp and took a step back before she got back in control of herself. It's transparent, she said. I saw something on the other side. Really? Nave said. He quickly retracted his hand as well and took a step back just like Altea. They were both side by side again, but there was now a much more cautious gap between them and the wall. Then, Nave saw it too. A shape, hard to tell how big, but definitely undulating, definitely swimming. A snake thing, or a skinny shark, or... Nave wasn't sure. It was gone before he could get a good look at it. Did you see that? Altea asked. That time I saw it, Nave replied. So we have a life form. Great. Now are we going back for the vipers? Good idea, Altea said, keeping her voice even, though Nave thought he detected a slight flutter. He wondered if his own voice was betraying him in the same way. He cleared his throat. Back to the elevator room then, he said. We need to see if you can do that same trick in reverse. They went back, and Altea erased the operator character she had written by melting and smoothing the wall, changed the sentence to say, up, and rewrote the operator character. It seemed, almost before she had finished, that the corridor had replaced the darkness in the doorway. The dark room with the striated ice wall was now below them, all five vipers jerked to attention at their return and came running into the elevator room. Are you hurt? Viper One asked Altea. I'm fine, she said. I'm fine too, by the way, Nave said, but he was aware that he was of secondary importance to them. The base is under attack, Viper One said. You must be evacuated. What? Altea yelled. This facility, Viper One repeated, is under attack. Above Ice Tomb, the battle rages for control of deep space and the atmosphere. Buzzers have already started to break through the orbital superiority units. Viper Four was already taking the lead, heading down the corridor. This way, Viper Four shouted. Follow Viper Four, Viper One said. We will have an evacuation unit waiting at the nearest exit to the structure. It is vital that we can evacuate you before the situation in orbit deteriorates any further. OK, Altea said. The whole group started jogging through the corridors, with Viper 4 in the lead and Viper 2 bringing up the rear. Try and match this pace, Viper 1 said. It is imperative that we exit this structure at the earliest opportunity. You mean you want me to hurry up? Nave asked. Yes, Viper One said. This structure is the objective of the entire buzzer swarm. Swarm? Nave said, looking at Altea. She did her best to run and shrug her shoulders at the same time. They were soon at an aperture that had been cut into the structure by the buzzers. It was large enough for them all to enter at once, but it was pressurised. They had to wait until the atmosphere was vented before the pyramidal buzzer-designed door would open. It was a strange moment of calm after all the hurrying. This couldn't have come at a worse time, Altea said. It galls me to have to leave just as we make this amazing discovery. How serious is this invasion anyway? Our defences are supposed to be formidable. Do the buzzers really have a chance? The vipers didn't answer. Then the door opened, allowing them to see a small landing platform outside. A small warship was waiting for them, hovering in the upper atmosphere. They're sending down a shuttle, Viper One explained. It was supposed to be here waiting with the doors open. What's the spaceship's name? Altea asked. The Imperturbable, Viper One said, then pointed. Ah, that's the shuttle bay opening. Here comes our ride. Shuttle Imp 3 inbound, Altea heard in her communicator, hold position for immediate pickup. The imperturbable hovering above them was huge and with numerous visible gun turrets, obviously well armed. 
It was shaped, like most spaceships, that were capable of atmospheric insertion, like a spear point. It was aerodynamic, but with gravitic drives, there was no need to bother with lifting surfaces such as wings. The guns were located along the vessel's spine, near the gravitic virtual gyroscopes, to minimize the inertia effects when traversing. Some of the spaceship's mass drivers were so big that otherwise turning the turret clockwise would spin the whole spaceship counterclockwise. Nave noticed that one or two of the giant mass drivers were already canted almost directly vertical and were engaging targets with their characteristic screeching sound of metal leaving the barrel accompanied by a muzzle flash of ionised atmosphere. Missile door covers were also hinging out of the way along the flanks of the spaceship and handfuls of missiles were arcing up into the sky, heading for targets too far away to be seen by their eyes or even their limited environment suit sensors. This does not look good, Nave said. How is there already action within the atmosphere? The invasion is progressing quickly, Viper One said. Every shot the spaceship above them fired made the thick atmosphere around them quake with a shockwave that they could feel through their environment suits. Every muzzle flash illuminated the platform like a flash of lightning, but then came a flash and a rumbling impact much larger than any of the others. Everyone looked up, but at first nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The imperturbable was still firing, Imp 3 was still descending, but then they all saw it at once. A jet of fire and debris coming out of a jagged hole in the rear of the giant spaceship. That's probably the location of the stabilizers, Altea said. Nave had no idea what she would be basing that assessment on. The distribution of visible grab thrusters, or the spaceship's configuration perhaps, but he didn't doubt her. He had seen plenty of examples of how deep and varied her knowledge was, of all kinds of different areas of science over the preceding months. As if in confirmation of her guess, the spaceship started to slide sideways, unable any longer to precisely maintain its position against the tug of planetary gravity. The spaceship started climbing even as it was slipping sideways, but there was obviously something wrong. Its nose was climbing faster than its damaged rump, then its main engines came on, with their characteristic blue glow, but the blue was fluctuating. That's a real bad sign, Altea said. Hesiper fluctuations in the drive plume means those engines are not long for this world. Altea grabbed Nave by the hose attaching his helmet to the environmental unit on his back. It was the surest way to get anyone in an environment suit to come in the direction you wanted. She dragged him back into the big airlock as the entire mountain was shaken by a titanic explosion. Flame and debris exploded through the door. Among the debris Nave noticed over Altea's shoulder was the torso and head of one of the vipers. The limbs ripped away by the shockwave, then he lost consciousness. He came round, according to the chronometer inside his suit's faceplate, just seven minutes later. He didn't feel too bad, but he realised that was probably just shock. He looked around and saw Altea lying among the debris just a few steps away. She had taken a lot more of the impact of the shockwave than him because she had pushed him through the door and come in afterward a fraction of a second later. The Viper had followed very shortly afterward, but that tiny delay had been enough that it was now lying torn apart on the ground. Altea groaned. Thank the powers, Nave said out loud. He went over and helped her to her feet. Oh, I feel like I've just got stoned, she said, but I don't think anything's broken. You saved my life, Nave said. Of course, she said, and tapped his chest. You're an important subject. We have to keep you and your markings in one piece. Nave couldn't tell if she was joking or not, and before he could decide, they were interrupted by the viper. 
or what was left of it lying on the ground. This location will become unsafe very soon, it said. It's already pretty unsafe, Maeve said. Altia waved him silent with a gesture of her hand and turned her attention to the damaged viper. Which one are you? she asked. I'm number four, it said, but that's not important. The important thing for you now is to find a safe location, as I do not believe that another attempt will be made to evacuate you to orbit. I think you're right, Altia said. Thank you for your service. You are welcome, Viper 4 said. Good luck. Altia turned away from the stricken robot and locked eyes with Nave. Things don't look so great, she said. I really don't have any idea what we should do next. We've got to think about our immediate survival, Nave said. Once we find somewhere even halfway secure, then we can start to make more long-term plans. Somewhere secure, Altia repeated. Chapter 15 Far away from Ice Tomb, Shavia was looking at some footage with Admiral Dander. The footage was playing again and again on the bridge of the Admiral's flagship, the Tempest. Shavia was present as a hologram, standing at the Admiral's right shoulder as he tried to interpret what he was seeing. They are a very impressive life form, he said. They can take almost as much damage as a medium drone, and that weapon is powerful, even if it lacks range. That's an astute appraisal, Shavia hissed. But there is something else, something that has very much excited us here at the Science Ministry. Are you referring to this self-organizing behavior? The Admiral asked, calling up some examples onto a monitor. It has been seen in insects and does have undeniable military applications, as the creatures demonstrate in this encounter. Yes, that too, Shavir said. But there was something else, something easy to miss amongst all the unavoidable pyrotechnics of the encounter. All right, Shavir, the Admiral said, slightly exasperated. Out with it. May I take remote access to this video clip? Help yourself. The video rewound, and a small corner expanded to fill the screen, suddenly slightly pixelated at the lack of resolution. Here we are, Shavia said. The important part is a few seconds later. The video came to life, hostile after hostile streaming from the woods, as seen from the nose camera of a drone. The drone picked off hostile after hostile with mass driver fire. Then one of the hostiles was hit with just a glancing blow, though it was enough to tear off its arm. The hydrostatic shock killed it instantly. It toppled to the ground and the drone's crosshairs moved on to new targets. A few moments later, a hostile appeared above its fallen comrade, gathered up the arm and the main part of the body and dragged them away. The view increased in magnification again, becoming even more pixelated. The hostile was doing something to the body, something hard to make out. Is the hostile stitching its comrade's arm back on? the admiral asked. That's exactly what it's doing, Shavir confirmed, though the process doesn't seem exactly to be stitching. We'll need better quality images before we'll know. But why? The damn thing's dead. Is it some strange show of compassion? Shavir didn't say anything. The creature finished what it was doing with the arm and bent over its comrade. Their head seemed to be in contact, but it was difficult to tell through the distortion. Then the fallen hostile hopped to its feet, and both hostiles ran back into the battle. The admiral gasped, and Shavir smiled. Both hostiles were soon hit by mass driver rounds and sent tumbling to the floor again, but Shavir's point had been made. The Admiral turned away from the screen to look fully at Shavir. Did I just see that life form being brought back to life after a fatal injury? he asked. We believe so, Shavir said. Needless to say, we have to know more about what happened. 
Is it some general breakthrough that can be applied to our longevity programs? Or, more likely, is it some specialism in the design of this creature that allows for it to be revived to continue fighting? If that is the case, the Admiral mused, it would revolutionise warfare. Soldiers that kept getting up to continue to fight. One of our researchers joked that they were zombies. That name sort of stuck. Now we are calling them Z-forms. Z-forms. The Admiral tasted the word in his mouth. This is top secret, Admiral, Shavir said. We don't want a hint of this technology getting out till we understand it and control it. Of course, Shavir. And I am taking a personal interest in this research. Just tell me what you need, and I shall make sure you have it. For now, Shavir said, I need reinforcements. We have to capture some of these creatures so we can experiment on them. Consider it done. It wasn't long before Shavir's wishes were being acted on. Only days later, on Jade Stone, all Skydancer's ground forces were being committed at the site of the seismic event. Dropship after dropship arrived with wave after wave of drones, depositing them at the entrance to the opening in the cliff. Among the drones were a sprinkling of humans, mostly spread among their drone charges, but one group was standing together, a group of elite soldiers. Keen and Punter had been attached to their unit, and Keen was standing with the commander of the elite unit, a man called Krupp, while Punter was mingling with the rest of the team. Keen had been expecting some small amount of rest after her close call when Base South was overrun, but instead, here she was, hurled back down to the surface with a bunch of gung-ho fools that were going to drag her right down the throat of the biggest concentration of hostiles they could find, and, to top it all off, it was raining. It was a depressing kind of grey rain that came down vertically from the sky. Her armour insulated her from the damp and from the cold, but the rain still cut visibility, making footing treacherous, and just plain brought her down. What's the plan? she asked Krupp. Krupp hadn't volunteered any information about his rank, so she didn't feel she had to show him any particular deference. If she wanted anything, she just went up and asked him, and he hadn't shown any displeasure with the arrangement yet. Why are you so suddenly interested in the plan? he countered. So she pointed to a cuboid structure with a hatch and readouts that an engineering drone was loading onto the roof of the team's transport. Because of that, she said, is that what I think it is? Or what do you think it is? Don't dick around, Croup. I know you're planning to capture one of these hostiles. Zed forms, he corrected. And I'm not sure you realise how dangerous even one... She trailed off as she saw an engineering drone bringing another cube towards them through the rain. All right, she said. I suppose we'd better get on with it. The speed with which Skydancer's ground attack forces had cleared an area of primeval forest, landed dropships and disembarked drones and infantry, was impressive. Skydancer had delivered every drone type in its arsenal, from scout drones the size of chickens to a pair of frontal assault machines, FAMs, that resembled tanks. Their propulsion was gravity, allowing them to drop to the ground for a low profile or soar over the treetops to clear terrain. The FAMs were part of the advance guard of 20 drones that headed uphill towards the seismic source location, the area that was strongly suspected to be the source of the hostiles. The drones picked their way through the trees, while the FAMs floated just above the treetops, flipped on their backs to allow the deadly main turret weapons to fire directly downward if necessary. Above this tight group, scramjets circled, looking for disturbances in the surrounding jungle. Keen had to admit, from where she was watching, forgotten by the Special Forces grav transport, it looked like an impressive sight. She knew the firepower deployed would be able to do devastating damage to any opponent, especially an opponent that didn't seem to be able to challenge for atmosphere superiority. 
she wondered if the hostiles would even be able to penetrate the extremely heavy armour of a fam with their short-range weapons. The advance guard marched right up to the crack in the cliff, the enemy's front door, according to their suspicions, and didn't even pause. The drones just marched on in. They were already receiving images from the chicken drones that had entered at a run five minutes earlier. They saw a large tunnel, large enough for the two fams to navigate side by side with the regular drones beneath. Keen was watching the feed, like most other members of the ground forces, with a slight delay, so the powers that be could cut off transmission if there was anything they wanted to keep secret. The first contact wasn't long in coming. A single hostile popped up from some crevice in the wall, but was targeted and blown to pieces before it could even open its mouth. The drones marched on, grinding the monstrosity's remains into the rock. Keen didn't feel at all reassured. She knew the hostiles were quick learners and that they were cunning. All right, Croup said, let's follow the vanguard in. They climbed into the grav transport and were deposited at the cliff face seconds later, a very ordinary cliff by the standards of the planet. OK, people, Croup said. We go in nice and slow and we follow the drones nice and tight. Yes, sir, a chorus of voices. Keen was still getting her feed and had seen three more hostiles pop up and be destroyed before the elite group she was now part of had even entered the aperture in the cliff face. Chicken drones were milling about at the cave entrance, going into the cave one by one, creating a relay so communications could be sent backwards and forwards to the drones at the head of the advance, the ones doing all the fighting. There is a slight problem, Punter said in a message intended only for her. If the drones keep vaporising the hostiles, there won't be anything for us to snatch. Don't worry, Keen said. I'm sure we'll have plenty of hostiles all too soon. Always cheerful, boss. As if to confirm what Keen had said, another Z-form popped out of hiding. This hostile waited till it was below a drone before revealing itself. Damn, their stealth is good, Croup said. The drone was confused, suddenly taking damage from below and unable to see a target. Its fellow drones were packed in too tight to see what was going on or to be able to fire effectively. Take control, Croup, Keen urged. Sort them out. Can't, the team leader said. They're being commanded through a different circuit. Anyway, it's not our job to make sure this attack succeeds. We have a specific mission, capture us a hostile. But it might be a little more difficult than I had envisaged. Well, it's obvious how to grab one, Keen said. Enlighten me. Do you think all the hostiles hidden among these walls have popped up? You are probably surrounded by them. You just have to start looking. We can't pull your little trick from Cursed Rock, Croup said. We don't have a topographical map of the tunnel from before this incursion. Every last one of these rocks in here could be a hostile, and we'd never know. They move too slow for the motion detectors. Their bodies are at ambient temperature. They can alter their colour and even the roughness of their carapace. How are we supposed to spot them in here? Stop moving, Keen said. We spread out into a line and combine the processing power of our suits. Ladar, scan the walls to the best resolution you can and rescan every second, not comparing the previous scan, but to the original scan. OK, Croup said, I get it. Their movements are too slow to appear on scans updated from just the second before. But there will be a bigger discrepancy over time, so we keep the original scan. And we can't move till we are sure this section of corridor is clear. We have to give them enough time to betray themselves. You heard the lady, Croup said. Spread out, people, and start scanning. Minutes passed with no discrepancies in the scans, minute after minute. They could hear the crunching impact of drone feet coming down the pipe from the direction of the entrance. Reinforcements, Keen muttered. And that was when they got to their first contact.
It was closest to a slug called Mengar who immediately pinged the team leader. Instructions? Keen thought that was an excellent question. What exactly was their plan for when they detected one of the hostiles? Engage, Croup ordered. Non-lethal munitions. So that was it? They were going to knock the thing out with beanbags? Mengar started firing. His first shots were impressively accurate, and Keen could believe these were elite soldiers. Mengar kept his finger on the trigger, and, under sustained fire, the creature had great difficulty doing anything. But it did climb to its feet, and it did open its mouth and start sending a beam of warping energy in the direction the beanbags were coming from. Increase munition velocity, an order from Croup. But gradually, we need to keep the impacts non-lethal. The creature could obviously take a great deal more concussive energy than a human. Mengar was increasing the power of each shot from his weapon, but it was too late. The creature had reached him. The automated systems in Keen's armour muted the screams. Two more troopers had reached the scene, one called Diva. Approaching from further into the passage, and the other, called Helpern, approaching from the direction of the entrance. They caught the creature in a crossfire, their weapons already adjusted to the power level that Mengar had reached. The creature was thrown to the ground by the force of the impacts, but it continued struggling. It won't stay down, Helpern said, her voice impressively calm. I don't think it has a nervous system that can be shut down by concussive impacts. Agreed, came the team leader's voice. Go to plan B. By then, two more of the team had arrived. The creature was causing chunks of stone to fountain around it as it flailed wildly with its mouth open. Both the new troopers advanced, while Helpern and the other beanbag gun operator kept the creature pinned with gunfire. One was torn into shreds by the creature's mouth weapon at such close range. His suit blossomed like a flower and the flesh boiled out from the inside. The other trooper got behind the creature, however, and clamped one hand on the left side of its head and one hand on the right. The creature, its elbow and knee joints more flexible than those of a human, started to tear at her armour with its claws. The creature had ripped away two panels of armour and left deep gashes by the time Helpern had dropped her weapon, run over and grabbed the creature's arms. Next, she trapped the creature's legs by kneeling on them. Another trooper appeared, dropping his weapon among the rocks and fumbling to extract something from a pouch attached to the flanks of their armour. The trooper extracted a cage-like device. Soon, they had the cage tightly clamped round the creature's head, keeping its mouth shut, and they had its arms and legs bound and immobilised too. OK, Croup said, we're not done yet. We have to get this guy loaded on the back of the transport. The troopers worked fast, and by the time Coop and Keen had arrived, the creature was already half in a crate. Let's get another one, Croup said. Keen and Punter were among the detachment sent to deliver the creatures to Seat of Reason. The creatures were very securely shackled to the kind of racks used for transporting drones. They were bound at wrist, ankle, waist, chest and neck, and their jaws were bound shut. Nobody had tried feeding them yet, but that didn't seem to bother the creatures. The hold containing the Z-form specimens, as they were being termed, was in the belly of the spaceship, with no windows and just a single door. There was no furniture, and the surroundings were particularly grim and depressing. Keen and Punter were often put on guard in the hold, with instructions to kill any specimen that might manage to escape its confines. It was an excruciatingly boring duty, with each watch alone in the dark hold, lasting four hours. Keen often found herself approaching the creatures to ward off boredom. She made sure her heavy blaster rifle was firmly in her grip and ready for use at a moment's notice, and then she walked right up to the racks. 
There were seven of them each floating on a small grav engine, and each loaded with a single specimen. The dim lighting in the hold was brighter around the creatures thanks to lights mounted on the racks. The little circle of light only accentuated the gloom of the rest of the hold. Keen happened to be standing next to Z-Form Specimen 6. She put her face nose to nose with the creature and stared into one of its eyes. The eye was like no other she'd seen before, and she'd seen quite a few strange alien eyes, not least the empty eye pits of the buzzers. This eye, however, was like liquid. It was like a drop of amber exuded by a tree in response to injury. There was no structure to it, just an orange globule in a face of grey, unhealthy-looking flesh. The sooner we get you delivered for dissection, the better, she said to the creature. The monster couldn't reply, of course, with its jaws clamped shut, but it didn't seem oblivious to her. Her presence was provoking a reaction, she could see in the twitches of its facial muscles. Then the eyes changed colour, went blood red. Ugh, she said, and took an involuntary step back. She went back to her post, standing in a position where she could fire on any escapees before they reached the door to the hold. It was a ridiculous precaution to have her in here wasting her time. The specimens were clamped tightly to their racks, and they weren't going anywhere. Just another two weeks to the seat of reason, she told herself. Just another two weeks and we can dump these monsters off and never see them again. These experiments can't be carried out here, the station commander Bragg was saying, his voice raised and anxious. These creatures are just too dangerous. Oh, pish posh, Shavir said. We've had more dangerous life forms than this here for study. That's the whole reason it was constructed out here as part of this asteroid for ease of quarantine and, if need be, destruction. They argued a while longer, but Shavir was Bragg's superior, so there was only one way the conversation could end. Shavir would have her way, but Bragg insisted on some upgrades to lab security and also insisted that the labs would be housed in a newly excavated part of the asteroid, away from the main tunnels. Both of them were satisfied at winning some concessions, and both left the meeting more or less content. After the meeting, Shavir went to a tower that she liked, a tower that projected from the surface of the asteroid and gave a virtually unobstructed view of almost an entire hemisphere of the asteroid. She took some time and looked for an area for the site for the new Z-form annex. The asteroid was far from a perfect sphere, of course, but neither was it irregular as most asteroids. That had been one of the reasons it had been chosen as home for the research base. Its large mass and relative uniformity made construction of the tunnel complex within relatively straightforward. Shavir's view of the asteroid was overlaid with existing station schematics as she picked out the location for her new labs. She would have a design finalised within days, and the giant engineering robots that roamed the surface of the asteroid would have the tunnel complex almost built before her first specimens arrived. Chapter 16 I think the surface gives the best chance of survival, Nave said. We've seen that with the buzzers hiding out there. There were still units out on the surface until just a few days ago. Units that we hadn't found for weeks. And there still might be buzzy units out there now, for all we know. Altia was silent, considering. And, Nave went on, the surface must be absolutely strewn with supplies. There are fresh environment packs for our suits, and there are a lot of munitions just lying around. I've done a survival course too. I'm pretty sure I can build a well-camouflaged shelter. No, Altia said. No? No, I don't want to spend my last few days of life scrabbling around on the frozen surface of an ice moon. You don't? 
Not while there are still things to be learned down on the new level we discovered. I'll understand if you don't want to come with me. If the powers smile down on you, there is a chance you could survive until this planet is eventually retaken, if it is eventually retaken. I don't understand. I'll likely only last a week or two before the supplies in my environment pack run out, assuming the buzzers don't find me, but I will be learning new things. Nave paused for a second. Altir seemed adamant about going back into the complex, and he had no intention of spending his last week or two of life alone. I'm coming with you. You don't have to, Altir said, her eyes searching what she could see of his face through the visor of his suit. I know, he said, forcing his face into a resolute mask to reassure her. Lead on. They quickly retraced their steps towards the room that led down to the hidden level. How long do you think it would be before the buzzers get ground troops down here on the surface, in the complex? Altia asked as they walked. I don't know, Nave said. On the usual schedule of a planetary invasion, I would say days or weeks, if not months. Usually a presence is established in the system, then supply corridors are pushed through to the target planet then superiority must be established in orbit, over at least half a hemisphere of the target, and, usually, only then do the first battles for atmospheric superiority start. A few successes are usually required before the first slugs are sent down in dropships to start crawling the surface up close with the enemy. This invasion is definitely not happening on that type of cautious schedule. I see, Altia nodded, an accelerated process. So the question is, how much time do we have? Do we have enough time to go up to the apex of the mountain structure and get some more supplies? Like you said, Nave nodded, difficult to know. The imperturbable was taken out just minutes ago. I didn't see by what, probably a missile, and I've been feeling impacts through my feet ever since, growing in frequency. He stopped, bent down, and picked up a small rock. He looked up at the ceiling above, looking in vain for a place it might have come from. It seems the impacts have been powerful enough to shake loose some debris. The whole corridor was then rocked by a tremor. A mist of rock and ice particles were shaken loose and descended on them like snow. At the speed this invasion is progressing, I put our chances of successfully getting more supplies at 50-50, at best. I'm inclined to agree, Altia said. Her mouth was open to continue speaking, but she was interrupted by a noise from the corridor they had just come down. They didn't see anything, so the noise was probably being transmitted from further away by some strange trick of the corridor acoustics. Buzzers? Altia whispered. Nave shrugged and drew his blaster. He pointed down the corridor, indicating they should carry on trying to get where they were going. They both started trotting down the corridor. Altia became painfully aware of just how much noise an environment suit could make. Her backpack thumped against her back with a dull bump, her rubberized boots squeaked on the floor, her arms and legs swished as the suit fabric rubbed against itself, the fasteners and flaps on her utility belt jangled, and innumerable other bits clapped and rattled. These things aren't exactly built for stealth, she whispered. I know, Nave said, smiling despite the gravity of their situation. But we don't have to be ninja scouts, just stealthy enough to avoid attracting the whole swarm down on our heads. They reached the elevator room, and Altia immediately went to her inscription and started work with her laser tool. What had seemed merely an an annoyingly long time to carve a symbol before now seemed like centuries. He wanted to yell at her to hurry, but he restrained himself. The last thing she needed now was him stressing her. Instead, he went to the room entrance and peered down the corridor, his gun already aiming at the spot where the corridor went round a corner and out of sight. He amplified his suit microphones and almost immediately heard it. A metallic dragging noise. 
He couldn't imagine what could be making it. One of the vipers, perhaps? But he was pretty sure they had all been destroyed. Whatever it was, it was coming closer, getting louder. Almost there, Altia hissed. Wait, Nave hissed back. There at the end of the corridor was a robotic shape he recognised. Jay, he hissed, is that you? The robot just waved. Come on in, Nave yelled. The robot came along the corridor as fast as it could, dragging one leg, which was all torn up and looked to have a badly damaged knee actuator. Any way you can change that graffiti to say three beings? Nave asked. All right, Eltia said. Nave helped his robot friend to limp into the centre of the room. Altia bent to work again, the little laser torch sending flashes of red light across the dimly lit room, making the wall relief on the far wall seem to move in a jerky dance. Nave's microphone was still turned way up, and he suddenly heard another metallic scratching noise. It was coming from the corridor. Was anyone with you? Nave asked Jay. The robot shook its head slowly. Cat got your tongue? Nave asked, as he went back to take position at the mouth of the corridor. The robot nodded. Nave knew it was a bad idea, but he couldn't help but keep glancing away from the corridor to look at Altea, even though he had no real way of gauging her progress. And eventually he glanced back to see an oncoming buzzer already halfway along the corridor. He fired by instinct and ducked as far as he could out of sight while still being able to see the hostile alien. He scored a hit, blowing off one of the creature's arms. The creature paused and took time to aim at him. Nave ducked as a section of the wall he had been leaning against exploded the force of the blast knocking him, skittering across the room. Got it, Altia said, as the buzzer came through the doorway, then suddenly vanished. The corridor was gone too, replaced by the same dark chamber as before. Then Nave noticed that the buzzer hadn't completely vanished. It had been almost halfway into the room, and its head and one of its legs, the parts that had already made it through the door, had been neatly amputated. They were lying, inert near the door. Altea turned away from her freshly carved inscription and saw the remains of the buzzer too. I guess we cut that quite fine, she said. Skin of our teeth, Nave nodded. They stood side by side, the tension slowly draining from their bodies. I was hoping we wouldn't be seen when we came down here, Nave said. Me too. Altea said, but the one that saw us is dead. And even if they do work out where we have gone, their understanding of the drifter language seems far inferior to ours. They have to use brute force methods to input commands, and as far as we know, the only buzzer who could do that is dead. They can't expect to easily achieve any results, and the results they do get, it seems, are unpredictable. I think we'll be safe down here for a while. Until our air runs out, Nave said. Well, Altia said, I guess we don't have much time to waste. I'll go investigate. She switched on her helmet light and went through to the other chamber. Nave was about to follow her when he noticed Jay's slumped form. You're not doing so good, are you? he asked. In reply, the robot just weakly shook its head. Your audio's definitely offline, that's for sure, Nave murmured to himself. He looked around the room and noticed the tools that Altea had left piled around the vent thing in the centre of the floor. He gathered up a handful of likely-looking implements and went to kneel by Jay. He knew a little bit about android physiognomy mostly from checking over and troubleshooting drones, and soon found the most urgent problem that needed his attention. The line connecting the robot systems to its primary power supply had been partially severed, meaning he was extremely starved of energy. Ideally, it would need to be replaced, but no replacements were available, so Nave would have to jury-rig something. 
He had done similar repairs before, but usually with better tools and usually working on the thicker and more robust cables of combat drones. He took his time, worked methodically, heating and fusing strands of the cable, and some more life seemed to return to the robot. I'm going to need some feedback if we're to get you ticking again, Nave said, so let's see if I can't get you talking. Nave removed the robot's faceplate and was confronted by a mess underneath. Something had impacted it severely in the face. The components beneath were split, crushed, torn and irreparable. This is going to be tricky, Nave said, but I've got an idea. His own environment suit was heavy duty with quite a lot of redundancy. He found a speaker system that didn't seem to be connected to anything vital and transferred it to Jay's lower face. Once he had it securely in place, it took forever to hook it up. It hadn't been designed for the complex connectors in the robot's face, and they were pretty busted up, needing fine repairs to fix, but eventually Jay spoke. Hello, world, he said. What? Nave yelped. He hadn't realised that he was so close to getting the robot's audio working and the words had taken him by surprise. It's the traditional first message that should be transmitted through any output device, Jay explained. Don't worry, I haven't lost my marbles, not according to standard diagnostics anyway. Where did you pick up all this damage? I was aboard the shuttle, the robot explained, its speech still modulating, climbing up and down in pitch. We were coming down from the imperturbable on Imp 3 to come and get you. Oh, Nave said. I didn't think anybody had survived. I didn't even see where the shuttle went down, and I didn't know you were inside, otherwise I would have come and looked for you. Just help me fix my leg and all is forgiven. It was some hours before the leg was working with anything approaching full mobility again. It had a noticeable limp, but they had to give up on it for lack of spare parts. It'll do, Jay said. Hey, where did Altea go? She went through to the aquarium. Aquarium? Yeah, Nave nodded, standing and looking through the dark doorway. In there. A light could be seen dancing around the walls, Altea's helmet torch, as her gaze moved from one interesting artifact to another. Come on, Nave said. He drew his blaster and switched on the flashlight that was slung beneath the barrel. It illuminated the same room he remembered from before, but there was no hint of a life form behind the striated ice wall. Altea was off to one side, examining some seemingly random piece of alien technology. Hey there, Nave said, causing her to move her attention from the strange gizmo and towards him. Can I help? Actually, yes, Altea said. Oh, hey, Jay. Hi, Jay said, raising a busted-looking arm in greeting. Glad you're better, Altea said. What would you like me to do? Nave asked. Do you see this hieroglyph? she said, pointing, and, when Nave nodded, carried on. It looks a bit like a bird, if this bit here is the wing. It's a pretty deformed-looking wing, Nave said. That's not the important thing, Altea said. The important thing is that, the first time I looked at it, it had two feathers. Now it has three, Jay said. At least if you ask me. Exactly. Altea said, so unless I'm losing my mind, it got erased and rewritten while I was in the room. But I haven't seen anyone in here with a laser welder. I don't understand, Nave said. Me neither, Altea said. This is something new, a symbol spontaneously changing. Unless you're losing your mind, you said, Jay mumbled less than tactfully. That can't be ruled out, Altea nodded. So I checked the video records of my suit, and, what with the lighting conditions down here, I couldn't find an image of the hieroglyph before the change. I can't prove I'm not just misremembering. So, Nave, seeing as you offered to help, if you would, could you sit here? 
She put one hand on each of his shoulders and pushed him down into a sitting position in front of the symbol. You just keep an eye on that and, more importantly, see if you can get a good image of it with your suit camera and that big old flashlight you've been waving about. OK? And give me a shout if it changes, the moment it changes. Can do. Do you want me to do anything? Jay asked. Watching unchanging points on the wall is, after all, often considered to be robot work. We're good at it. Not to toot my own horn, you understand. It's a question of concentration. But Altea was already engrossed in her alien artifact again, a column of metal emerging at an acute angle from the intersection between the wall and floor, completely covered in a cascade of hieroglyphs. You seem to be a very capable member of the team, she said absently. A bit of initiative is called for here. Just make yourself useful somehow. No problem, Jay said. Nave was already asleep before the robot had finished the sentence. He dreamed about a lot of strange things, things that he would only start to remember with any clarity a long time later, but one thing united all the dreams, the colours. The colours felt, somehow, more vivid than he was used to. It was like that time he had been controlling drones on a nighttime mission. The conditions had been terrible, and the drones were reduced to using a 3D model of the environment that they were creating on the fly from sensor readings. It was enough to target hostiles, but it was no substitute for actual vision. His dreams were like natural vision, after being forced to look at a colourless 3D model of reality for a long time. But there were still things he couldn't see, presents that were actually absences, humanoid in shape, but he knew, the way people know things in dreams, that they were far from human in nature. It was like he couldn't see them, but he suspected the reason he couldn't form a visual impression of them was because he didn't, couldn't, understand them. He awoke with a start, and from habit, the first thing he did was check his suit chronometer. It wasn't in the usual place. It had moved from upper right in his field of vision to lower left. It told him he had slept twelve hours. Why didn't you wake me, he said. But when he looked round for Altea, he saw that she was asleep too, curled up against one of the walls, her ribs rising and falling rhythmically. Jay came in from the other room. I assume it was you messing with my environment suit's operating system. That's right, the robot said. Altea asked me to make myself useful and the settings on your suits were all wrong. You'll be able to squeeze an extra week out of them with my adjustments. Thanks, Nave said. You're welcome. Nave turned to look at the hieroglyph and immediately saw that it had changed again. He compared it to the picture he had taken before falling asleep and noticed that a few of the hieroglyphs around it had changed too. What the... he said. She was right. So she was, Jay said, looking over Nave's shoulder. Should we wake her? Nave asked. She said she wanted to know immediately, Jay said. Nave nodded and went over to the sleeping form. How much sleep has she had? he asked the robot. She got her head down not long after you, Jay said. Nave reached gingerly for her shoulder and shook it gently. Altea, he said, voice hushed. Your hieroglyphs are doing strange stuff. She came bolt upright, her eyes snapped open, making Nave involuntarily recoil backwards. Really? she asked. Really? Nave said. For all the good it does us. Chapter 17 To take their minds off their situation, they all spent the next couple of weeks helping Altea research the aquarium room. They had no particular reason to do this, but there were rewards for their progress. They had an important breakthrough on day two when Altea discovered how to open a door that turned their single room domain into an entire labyrinth. 
They explored the new areas and discovered all kinds of machines that Altea said were completely new, unknown to previous drifter research. In these new areas, there were rooms where the hieroglyphs were changing so quickly that they were a blur. It's like this is the only living part of a dead organism, Altea said. If this is a reef, then the rest of the complex is just dead coral, and this area is the only place with living organisms. The most active machines were near the striated ice of the planet's submerged sea, which often formed a wall here and there, within the complex, and the most active machine of all was built into the ice itself. It seemed to have bronze roots that spread out across the striated ice and even penetrated through it, seen as a shadowy presence floating this way and that with the submerged ocean currents. They set up base in front of the machine and often saw dark shapes swim by on the other side of the ice. When one of the shapes swam past, the machine went nuts, humming and clicking, as waves of symbols and hieroglyphs swept across the surface. They decided it was as good a place as any to wait for the end. It was three days or so before their supplies of breathable atmosphere and hydration fluid were due to run out. Their food had run out long ago, but luckily the suits were well supplied with appetite-suppressing drugs. Nave, as usual, was the first of the two humans to wake up the first morning. He said hello to Jay, who had been keeping watch all night, as had become usual, and went over to the machine. He had started to get comfortable with alien machinery, designed and forged long before his ancestors had come down from the trees, and he gave it an affectionate pat. And hello to you too, he said. The machine reacted instantly. The surface of it went clear of carved hieroglyphs. They simply melted away, as if the metal had been suddenly heated, but Nave was still touching it, and there was no change in the frigid temperature. The clear surface changed again. A single hieroglyph formed right in the centre. Nave looked round at Jay, his face a mask of shock and discomfort. Don't move! the robot said. I'll wake Altea and get us a translation, but I gotta say, seems to me like it might be saying hello back to you. Jay woke Altea and pointed. That was all he needed to do. From the look of Knave grabbing onto the ancient machine with just a single hieroglyph in the centre of the machine's display panel of liquid metal, she knew it was communicating. That translates as... she paused. As... Hello? Yes, that could probably be something like hello. What do I do now? Nave said. I don't want to piss it off. Don't worry, she said. If I had to guess, I'd say this is just an automated system, like when your hologram projector says hello to you, just because you switched it on. You think? There was a long pause before she answered. Yes, she said at last. I think so. How did you interact? Did you use the laser cutter? I just said hello. It reacted to sound. She put her finger to her lip, even though the suit was in the way. That's new. It's making some kind of neutral contact, Jay said. Don't break the connection, Knave. Keep your hand on the console. Well, Altea hissed, say something. What should I say? Maybe I should take over, Altea said, getting up from the floor and walking towards Nave and the alien console. No, Jay said. We don't know what strange magic has made this possible. Nave, keep your hand where it is. Altea, stay put. The robot held a hand towards Altea, palm out, in a gesture to make her stay where she was. OK, Altea said reluctantly. Well, this is a first contact situation, if you ask me, so, um, be friendly. That's enormously helpful, Altea. Thank you, Nave said, turning his attention back to the alien device. He stared at it for a moment, waiting for the inspiration to strike. Both Jay and Altea had their attention riveted on him. Can you talk? he asked at last. 
a symbol formed on the display plate, and the previous symbol shuffled away over to the left. Yes, Altia translated. OK, Nave said, but I meant using sound. There was a pause. No symbol appeared on the plate. That question will probably be difficult for it to pass because... Altia started to explain, but was interrupted. A voice emanated from the walls. I can speak using sound, it said. The voice was strange to their ears, half growl, half howl, and half dream. Wow, Altia said. Yeah, that goes for me too, Jay said. Do you have true intelligence? Nave asked. Altia winced. He'd asked another difficult question. How was an alien machine, with a few brainwaves from an alien head it had never encountered, supposed to understand the meaning and intention of such a complex question? I am fully intelligent by your standards, the voice said. Whoa, Jay whispered. This is cool. Yes, it is, Altia whispered back with a smile. When is he going to get round to introducing himself, she wondered, the frustration mounting. She wanted just to grab him by the shoulder and pull him away from the alien machine. But the robot was right. That might break whatever magic spell was making this possible. So she balled her hands up into fists and forced herself to just watch the encounter play out. They could analyse what happened later. My name is is Nave. My name is Rort. Nice to meet you, Rort. It is pleasant to talk with a being. It has been quite some time. Are you finding this language in my head? As a summary of the process we are using to communicate, that is admirably succinct. I'm no expert, Nave said, but I think that is beyond the capabilities of our science. Definitely, Altia said, and certainly with a brain we're not familiar with. Introduce me to your friends, Rort said. You do not need to remain in physical contact with the output unit any more. This is Altia, Nave said, and this is Jay. I'm pleased to meet you both, Rort said. And I'm pleased to meet you, Altia said. Likewise, said Jay. Altia felt a wave of relief at being invited into the conversation, becoming a participant in one of the most momentous moments in the history of the study of drifter culture. What is your function? she asked. I am responsible for the integrity of this settlement, Rort said, and I solve problems for the inhabitants. Do we count as inhabitants? Nave asked. Because we sure have problems. There was a long pause. It stretched on past a minute, and the three of them started to look at each other. The unspoken question was whether the machine would ever speak again. I think you broke it, Jay hissed. I will help you with your problems, Rort said at last. Great, Nave said brightly. Problem number one is a breathable atmosphere. Computing, Rort said, followed by a pause. Then, a solution has been found. This room will gain a breathable atmosphere of nitrogen, oxygen, and some other trace gases in 45 seconds, and the rest of the complex will follow within one hour. Cool, Nave said. Thank you, Altia said. You are all welcome, Rort said. It is now safe to remove your helmets. And indeed, the little red atmospheric incompatibility warning in Nave's field of vision went green. He popped the seal on the neck ring of his environment suit and lifted the helmet. The air tasted better than anything he had in his lungs for a long time. He couldn't remember the last time he had breathed a nice, fresh, planetary atmosphere that wasn't the result of some mouldy hydroponics machinery. Altia took her helmet off at roughly the same time and smiled at him. Her mouth was unselfconsciously wide, gulping down the air.
And they need water and food, Jay said. Computing, Rort said. It will take some time to reconfigure a local device to produce food and beverages. Estimating required time. Please wait two hours. Thank you again, Nave said, then noticed Jay's upbeat state. Is there anything you need? Actually, Jay said, I do need some new actuators. I've got quite a limp going. It's cool, makes me look a bit like a space pirate, but it would be good to get it fixed. Do you require a new housing to accommodate your intelligence? Rort asked. There was a long moment of hesitation. Jay looked at Nave, then at Altea. Eventually, the robot reached a decision. A whole new body, you say? Yes. That's a little more than I asked for. I understand. If you have an emotional attachment to your present form, I can attempt repairs, but the technology is unfamiliar to me. What the hell? Jay said. Let's do it. Upgrade me. Please follow the directions. A yellow line of light stitched itself across the floor from Jay's feet to one of the doors, just like the directions provided for patients to follow in a hospital. You guys wait here, Jay said. I won't be gone long. I don't think. Jay glanced at the unit Rort had first used to communicate, which was now covered in rapidly moving symbols. How long will this take? he asked. For a standard bipedal configuration, the time required is five hours, but more time may be required depending on how complex the connections to the unit containing your intelligence are. Like I said, Jay said, I'll be back before you know it. He followed the yellow line out of the room and Altier was already asking questions before he was through the door. Good luck, Nave called after Jay, but he wasn't sure the robot noticed. Nave quickly lost interest in the questions Altier was asking. They seemed very dry and technical to him, mostly to do with the structures of the drifter language. It was interesting enough, but it wasn't the sort of history of rise and fall of an alien empire that Knave would have asked about. Eventually, there was a pause in their conversation, where Altia had stopped to dig out a data pad and make some notes. What happened to the drifters? Knave asked. We devolved. Rort told him. How? It was voluntary. Then why? Some of the places evolution and progress take you to are frightening. Some preferred to climb back down into the primordial ooze. That seems strange to me, and to me, Rort said. There was a silence. Nave noticed that Rort's answers to Altea's questions about language, technology and other technical subjects had been expansive, while the answers to his questions about why there were no drifters anymore were short, cryptic and evasive. Did they all devolve? Nave asked. Most did, Rort said. Now please, no more questions about the fall of the drifters for a while. It is a difficult subject for me to contemplate and to speak of. No problem, Nave said, and searched around for some way to change the subject. I suppose I should come clean a little bit about what brought us here. Altea looked up from her data pad. Her fingers paused in their rapid poking and swiping at the screen. We were chased down here by buzzers, Nave said. I think they'll join us down here within the next month or two at most, which wasn't a problem when we were running out of air, but now that you have saved us... There is a battle on the surface and in the atmosphere between Tarazat forces and the buzzers, Rort said. I would prefer it if they didn't manage to penetrate down to this level. That seems to be unavoidable, Rort said. The technology I have at my disposal to resist them entering this level is more advanced than the technology I have observed them using, but they are very numerous and determined.
They know that you came down here, and they know your point of entry. They will force open that access point eventually. Will you help them? Altir asked. The way you are helping us? If they contact me, Rort said, the way you did, and if they ask for my help, of course I will help them. They may want to kill us, Nave said. Maybe, I'm not sure. I'd say there's a good chance of that, Altia said. Or maybe they'll capture and torture us. Nave's mouth was set in a firm line. I will not help them directly harm you, Rort said. But neither can I guarantee to prevent it. They are numerous and very intelligent and resourceful. Any structure of comparable technology to their own would have given up all its secrets to them long ago. So what are we going to do? Nave asked. Computing, Rort said, and then there was a long silence. An amorphous blister appeared in the wall near them, then started to become sharper in its outlines. What is that? Altia asked. They both stared at it for a while as the bronze metal and rock of the wall flowed to produce a more and more defined object. Suddenly, Nave recognised it. It's my food synthesizer from my cubicle. Hey, that's right. I've got the same model, but there's nothing written on the buttons. Don't worry, I know what all the buttons do. I've got all the functions memorised. I'll whip us up something. Something starchy with a bit of spice to it. Sounds great, Altia said. It actually sounded disgusting, but she was so hungry she would eat anything, and she was so distracted by having access to a drifter intelligence that she didn't want to waste any time programming a food synthesizer. She went back to her data pad. It's a shame it won't do wine, she said absently. Don't worry, Nave said. If this is my unit, Jay hacked it so it would squirt out alcohol. Things are really looking up. Altia and Nave shared the meal, which wasn't as disgusting as Altia had been expecting, but was far from delicious. Luckily, the machine had a setting to fabricate plates, cups and cutlery, because they had found nothing similar in their travels through the alien complex. They chatted and relaxed, but Nave couldn't shake the feeling of having been imprisoned. Then they heard heavy footsteps from the corridor. Nave jumped up and drew his gun as a large robot walked in. Hey, don't shoot, the creature howled, growled, whispered. Jay, your old pal. You look different, Altia said. I know, Jay said. This body looked a lot smaller in the simulation. Jay was now a little taller than Nave or Altea and had a skin of the strange alien bronze metal. His face was nothing like it had been before. It was a knobbly cylinder with sensors scattered around seemingly randomly. His hands were different too, long and like spider legs on the end of skeletal arms. It's quite an ugly mug, I know, Jay said in his new alien voice. It's going to take some getting used to. That voice too, Altia said. I like the voice, Jay growled. I think it'll get me some respect at long last. No more stacking crates at a temporary logistics hub. Stacking crates? Altia sounded confused. I thought he was full AI. It's a long story, Nave said. That night they went to sleep with full bellies and a slight feeling of hope. Jay stood guard, as had become usual, and spent the time holding his new spidery fingers in front of his new sensors, waving them back and forth. It's like there are extra colours or something, he mumbled to himself. I've never had sensors this good before. He did some internal diagnostics and found a bunch of extra memory and neural networking had been provided for him. As soon as he noticed it, he felt himself sliding into it. He ran a few calculations in his new home, just to see how quickly he could now come up with an answer. I'm even thinking faster, he mumbled, 
though Knave and Altea were both sleeping and paying no attention to him. Am I even me any more? That's the risk you run, I suppose, when you hop onto an alien operating table. Knave was the first to wake up and, driven by habit, checked his elapsed sleep time. The counter told him he had been asleep for ten hours. His moving about woke Altea. Morning, Jay said. Neither replied. There was a pause. Then Knave looked at Altea. Hey, he said. Jay has the same symbols on his chest as me. Altea nodded. Rort, she said. What are these symbols about? It is an interface, the AI replied. An interface is required for some interactions with the technology here. Would you like an interface, Altea? There was a long silence as both Knave and Jay stared at Altea. At last, she broke the silence with a single almost whispered word. Yes, she said. A line appeared on the floor. Altea simply got up and followed it. Knave was following Altea before she had gone more than a few steps out of the room and Jay reluctantly, after a few moments, followed them. They had to go quite a way through the labyrinth before the line they were following faded away. Please enter the operating zone, Rort's voice requested. Altea looked round in confusion and an area of floor became illuminated. Glowing lines appeared and formed a small shape, and then the shape expanded to form a glowing gold hexagon. Altea walked to the hexagon and positioned herself in the centre. What now? she asked. A small aperture opened in the ceiling above her, a hexagonal aperture that grew larger and larger. Within the cavity were writhing tendrils of technology. This is what happened to you, Altea said. Next comes the flash, Knave said. It was worse than Knave remembered. The flash was like lightning striking Altea's body. For a split second, tendrils of force played around with her form, and then the energy was gone and she fell to the floor. Then came the second flash, more powerful than the first, making the body convulse. Altea lost consciousness for a few seconds, then stirred, groaned, and picked herself up. She pulled at the fasteners on her shirt, pulled it open to expose a demure area of her upper chest, just below the clavicles. There were hieroglyphics there, more than on Knave's chest. Well, that's strange, was Altea's only reaction. She staggered a little, and Knave took her arm. Come with me, he said. You need a rest. She smiled and allowed herself to be supported a little as the two left the lab. Jay was left behind, watching them go, but not particularly interested in accompanying them. After a while, he looked over at the operating area. Jay walked around the centre of the glowing hexagon. He looked down admiringly at his own symbols. These are different to the ones on Knave's chest and to Altea's, the robot said. Every interface is unique, Rort said. Unique, Jay repeated. Yes, unique, but with pretty much the same functionality. The interfaces led them to the most active areas of the structure and drew them deeper and deeper in. Their research was fascinating, and they really started to forget about their predicament. Then, one morning, Knave woke to find Jay shaking his shoulder with those long, creepy spider fingers of his. The robot pressed Knave's gun into his hands, even before he was fully awake. We've got incoming hostiles, Knave, Jay said. Don't ask me how I know, I just know. What? Buzzers, Jay said, have breached our defences. They are now spreading out throughout this level, and it is only a matter of time before they reach this position. What do you want me to do about it? Knave asked. I mean, this is a nice gun, and I'm a pretty good shot, but we're talking about a buzzer swarm up there. 
I'm a little hazy on the exact numbers required for a swarm, but I get the feeling it'll be enough to deal with us three. The room was shaken by an explosion, a big one, big enough to wake Altea. She sat up, brushing dust from the ceiling from her hair, a confused expression on her face. What's going on? she asked. Apparently, Nave said, with a calm he didn't feel. The buzzer swarm has found us. It has, Jay said in his alien voice, and they'll be coming from that direction. He pointed towards one of the corridor mouths, leading into the room. But I thought they wouldn't be turning up for months, Altea said. Apparently, Jay said, they have accelerated the schedule. Chapter 18 These creatures are fascinating, Shavir said. The tissue they are composed of is like nothing ever seen before. I can't see the value in them, Mikor, a senior lab assistant, said. How can they possibly be controlled? They can't, she said. But perhaps an admixture of this tissue and our soldiers? More testing on live subjects? It's a time of war, Mikor, Shavir turned to look at him. Mikor hung his head in an unmistakable gesture of subservience. Shavir nodded, satisfied. Now, she said, if we have finished debating the medical ethics of winning the war against the buzzers, why don't you toddle off and select some volunteers for our experiments? How many will you need? Ten, Shavir said. Ten should do. For a start... Mikor left the room to go and do Shavir's bidding. She was left alone in the lab with her prizes. Reason, she said. Reason was the name of the full artificial intelligence at the heart of the research station, the most advanced artificial intelligence ever created by the Tarazat Science Ministry. Yes, the computer answered. I'd like to watch these subjects in action again. We now have considerable footage of the Z-forms, Shavir, the computer said. Its voice was a purr. Is there anything in particular that you would like to see? No, Shavir said. Just project the images over here where I can see them and choose some highlights. The computer didn't answer, and instead a hologram of a screen appeared near Shavir showing images of the Z-forms attacking the exposed mountaintop and the daring escape of Keen and Punter. Shavir reached for a rack of scientific instruments that was floating nearby on a gravitic motor and took out a laser scalpel. She used it to cut a section from her nearest specimen, a long, perfectly rectangular strip. She put on lab gloves, programmed the settings at the wrist seal for maximum impermeability and took the strip of flesh between finger and thumb. She removed it from the creature and placed it under a sensor. It was fascinating to study the cells. She wasn't even sure they were cells in the conventional sense. They were more like identical versatile units of biology, organising themselves to produce the creature. After hours studying the cells, she went back to her specimens. The screen was still playing footage of the creatures in action. They organised themselves to produce a ramp in order to launch one of their number at the dropship in the same way the cells organised themselves to produce the creature. Shavir decided to take a sample from the mouth area, where the obviously non-organic weapon was integrated with the organic part of the creature. It was then that she noticed it. The scalpel wound she had made earlier was gone. It was completely healed. Spontaneous healing, she said to herself. Then, reason? Yes, Shavir. Show me an image of the subject Z Form 3 from when it was first captured. The video on the hologram screen was replaced by a single static image showing the Z Form. It was covered in scar tissue and had a deep wound in its thigh. She looked at the specimen in front of her and there was no sign of any of this damage. They exhibit spontaneous healing, 
Shavir said. Interesting, Reason said. And there is something else. Yes, Shavir said, intrigued. They have gained slightly in mass. Gained? Yes, Reason confirmed. Mikor was alone in the lab, calibrating instruments and doing research on the best way to remove tissue samples when it happened. The strap holding the right arm of subject Z-Form 2 broke, and the creature's arm was suddenly free. Mikor stared in horror and screamed. He wasn't screaming anything coherent, just animal sounds of fear. He staggered back a few paces as the creature reached for the mask over its face, the one keeping its jaws tightly clamped shut, the one preventing the creature from using its disruptor gun. Mika was walking backwards, watching fascinated as the creature gouged livid scratches in the mask. But the mask held right up until the moment Mikor reached the door to the lab. He opened it as the creature exposed its fearsome jaws and opened its mouth to reveal the maw of the disruptor within. Mikor stumbled, shaking out of the lab, yelling at Reason to close the door, which Reason did as soon as he had cleared the doorframe. Unfortunately, that was too late. Mikor had already been blasted by the creature and turned into something twisted and unrecognisable. The creature howled in triumph and turned its attention to freeing itself from the remaining shackles that were holding it in place. Shavir was in her study, reading about hybridising humans and aliens. It was an interest of hers, especially as there had been so little success in the field. It was a backwater of science, frowned upon by the short-sighted fools of the non-military establishment. But there were some visionaries doing good work. Shavir, the voice of reason, interrupted her. Yes? We have a situation in the lab where the Z-forms are being contained. There has been a fatality. A fatality? Mikor. That's a shame, Sevier said. He was competent and obedient. Show me the situation. There was a physical screen mounted on Shavir's desk, and it sprang into life. A scene of chaos could be seen in the lab. The Z-form was now free and was slashing at the lab door. It would periodically stop slashing to fire shots from the weapon in its face, shucking off centimetres of armour in twisted ribbons. The other Z-forms were agitated in their bindings, twisting this way and that in an effort to free themselves. How thick is that door? It will contain the creature for approximately five more minutes. Put the Z-form down. It has proved impervious to the gas normally used in the lab for such purposes. Send marines with mass drivers. Dispatching a containment team now. Shavir watched on cameras located in the lab and on cameras located in the corridors as the creature gradually dug through the armoured door of the lab. It emerged into the corridor, stepping with its clawed feet into the remains of Mikor, just as the containment team arrived on the scene. They started firing immediately. Shavir winced as she watched them blowing holes in one of her specimens, but said nothing. The creature was soon sent twitching and lifeless to the floor of the corridor, its tattered remains mingling with those of the unfortunate lab technician. What a waste, Shavir said. We'll need to find out why the creature's shackles failed and increase the strength of the confinements on the other specimens. I'll start an investigation, Reason said. Before the end of the day, Shavir was examining the body of her former lab assistant. Shavir wanted to look at a fresh victim of the Z-Forms' face weapon, but what she found was far more interesting. Every sample she chose from her dead assistant had evidence of the Z-form that had killed Mikor, its DNA, mingling with that of the unlucky lab worker. Your death wasn't in vain, Mikor, she told him. If you hadn't mingled your remains with those of the Z-form that killed you, I would never have seen this effect. There was no answer from Mikor's lifeless corpse, but the results on her readouts spoke volumes. 
The alien cells were interacting with Mikor cells, unravelling the DNA within and picking and choosing among what was found there, like a virus in some respects, and the alien cell was taking on some of the characteristics it found there. She had found fusions that resembled human brain cells, and fusions that resembled human muscle and many others. Fascinating, she mumbled to herself, as she manipulated the samples in her scanner. If there was any alien life form that could be induced to hybridize with human tissue, it was this one. Reason, she said, I need some human subjects, some live human subjects. Wheel the first one on in here as soon as you have them sedated. Just seven hours later, she was finishing the procedure. Her first Z-form graft to a human host. It was going exceptionally well. She looked down on her work with pride. She had removed a huge portion of alien skin and transplanted it to the human on the operating table. The strange new process was taking place where the alien cells assimilated some of the functionality of the human cells, but on a larger scale and much more quickly than had been the case with Mikor's corpse. It was hugely encouraging, but then the human host's vital signs all crashed. Heart rate and brain activity both fell away and there was nothing she could do to stop it. Within minutes, her first human test subject was dead. She consoled herself with the thought that it would be a long road to perfect such a complex and ambitious procedure, but deep inside she was disappointed. She had been hoping that the strange alien cells would work some magic, that they would bring success where it hadn't been encountered before. She looked at the still warm corpse, a healthy young male with Hispanic features, marred only by some extensive acne scarring. She briefly wondered what backwards planet he must have come from that he hadn't been able to have it corrected. That was always the way with these things, though. It was the poor and disadvantaged that ended up being experimented on. She looked up his name in her records. Cantor. She updated his status to deceased and claimed his remains for the science ministry. Fellow, she shouted, calling for Mikor's replacement. I'm here, the young woman said. She was above average height with epicanthic folds and long straight hair. She was quite independent-minded, which could turn out to be a blessing or a curse. But she had proved competent so far. Put this unfortunate soul on ice, will you? Shavia asked. I'm a little shaken up at losing him. I'll take a look at him later and see if we can work out what went wrong. Certainly, Felu said. She unlatched the gurney from the operating array, allowed it to float free on its grav motor, then pushed it gently and silently from the room. Cantor woke up one hour later. He had no idea how long he'd been out. He hadn't really been told what to expect, hadn't been told to expect much of anything, except they were putting some experimental new covering on his back for a temporary period, but he had been expecting to at least wake up in a bed. Instead, he was in some kind of pod or canister, and it was cold. He banged his head on the roof of it when he tried to get up on his elbows. The pod was very narrow and uncomfortable, even for the mean-spirited Tarazat Navy. Hey! he yelled. What's going on? His back felt extremely odd, like there were worms under his skin. He wondered if something had gone wrong, or if that was how it was supposed to feel. Hey! he yelled again. Let me out! Outside the deceased specimen containment unit, where Cantor now found himself, was a larger lab. The lab was empty, apart from a robot that was not equipped with AI, just a very smart computer. The robot contacted Fellow. Yes, Fellow said. What is it? A disturbance, the robot said. An unusual one. 
it started sending an audio feed of the noise coming from the containment pods. Hey, came a gruff masculine voice. You could at least tell me why you've got me locked up in here. When do I get out? Can you localise that? Fellow asked. It's coming from containment pod CGY78411, the one that is housing the most recent specimen you dropped off. What? Fellow was confused. You mean Cantor? He's still alive? No, the robot said bluntly. He is most definitely dead. The readings all confirm that there is no brain, heart or lung activity. Who is that out there? came Cantor's voice. I can hear you talking. Are you planning on letting me out any time soon? I'm on my way, Fellow said. She was five minutes away from the lab and she kept the connection open so she could monitor events. She checked the robot's interpretation of the readings from the containment pod and she had to agree. They all seemed to point to Cantor being most assuredly dead. But he didn't seem to have gotten the memo. Shall I allow the subject to exit the pod? The robot asked, clearly torn about what was best to do. Hold on a minute, Fellow said, and I'll contact Shavir for instructions. She arrived in the lab a few moments later, Shavir standing beside her, and they were accompanied by a containment team. The robot was attending to something of questionable urgency on the other side of the lab. Fellow got the impression it just didn't want to be anywhere near her or Shavir. The four marines in power armour of the containment team inserted themselves between them and the containment pod, their blaster rifles raised. OK, Reason, Shavir said. Pop the seal on that containment pod. There was a quite literal popping noise, and the tray holding the grav gurney slid out about a centimetre. About time, came the voice from within. Slide the pod out slowly, Shavir said. The pod slid out, accompanied by wafts of frigid air. The man's flesh was grey and he was naked. Only the mist in the air, because of the cold of the pod, was providing him with any dignity. He pulled himself off the gurney and planted himself on his feet. But his knees wouldn't hold him. He collapsed to the floor. Guess I'm feeling the effects a little bit, he mumbled. Fascinating, Shavir said. Take him to a secure ward. Two of the containment team shouldered their rifles and helped canter up. They took him out of the lab, one on each side, supporting him under the arms. Cantor was physically lifted off the floor by the large suits of armour and his eyeline was level with their helmet visors. Hey, he said after a few seconds, what gives? Keen was in the suit of armour on his right and Punter supported him on his left. It was Keen who answered him. Talk is that you had a near-death experience on the operating table. That would explain how I feel, Cantor said. If it helps, Punter said, you look like shit. That's just great, Cantor said. Thank you for your encouraging words. I'm sure I'll be better in a jiffy now. They reached the secure ward, which had a door thicker than the doors of many carrier bays Punter had seen. They put him unceremoniously on a bed and left. The huge door closed behind them. Shavir and Fellu were still in the containment lab, still standing next to the pod that had held Cantor's lifeless body, which was still open. This is so exciting, Shavir said. The hybrid creature is functional. I'm not sure you can call it a hybrid if the human part is dead, Filu observed. Details, Shavir exclaimed, details. Ask the subject if he feels human. The entire human personality and knowledge set seems to have been transferred to our subject. We'll have to do more testing, of course. Let's call him Z-Human-1. But his name is Cantor. It doesn't do to refer to test subjects by pet names, Shavir said. It gets in the way of objectivity. As you wish, Fellow said. Was the transplanted tissue the largest Z-form tissue sample we have? Shavir asked. No, Fellow said. 
The last time the Z-Forms mounted an escape attempt, we recovered an entire arm, severed at the shoulder by a hit from a mass driver. Excellent, Shavir said. Prepare the next test volunteer. As you wish, Shavir, Fellow said. When will you need him? Another male? Yes, Fellow said. At the moment, only one other, a male, has cleared the prep phase. But there is a female who will be ready in a couple of days. No, Shavir said. Such a long delay is unacceptable. I operate tonight. I'll prep the next victim, Fellow said. I heard that, Shavir said. Fellow, this is a military operation and I cannot have you second-guessing every decision I make. You might not like what we are doing here. I admit that this methodology is far from ideal, but we can't refine it until we understand it, and you will follow my orders to the letter. Understood? Understood. Cantor had been in the ward for what seemed like days, but might only have been hours. He had been fed, but he wasn't hungry. You must have me on some strong-ass drugs to take away my appetite, he mused with a grim smile for the nearest of the camera units. There were three of them, little cameras on tiny grav sleds, scooting about the room and documenting his every move. They even followed him to the bathroom. There was just a single bed in the ward, and the only entertainment was provided by a few screens and a hologram projector. Cantor just watched sport and reclined on the bed, in theory an easy gig, but he didn't feel at all well, and worse, he was a man of action. He would prefer ground operations on some buzzer-infested rock to watching entertainment screens all day. The worst of his physical symptoms was his back. He had also gone a strange colour, a very unhealthy-looking grey, but he tried not to think about that. At least that wasn't causing him any pain. It was his back that really hurt. The border where the graft interacted with his flesh was a livid river of fire. It went away to a dull throb most of the time, but when it flared up, he would be rolling around and yelling. He switched channels and found a game featuring a popular gravball team, a team Cantor hated. There was a close-up of one of the players in his gaudy-coloured grav pack thrown into high relief by the grey background of the inside of the spherical stadium. It was a player Cantor hated, and to Cantor's delight, the team he hated was losing. He smiled, relaxed back on his bed with his hands behind his head, and started to enjoy the game. That's when he felt it. There was a disquieting presence. There was another like him, nearby, a rival. It was an overpowering feeling, but at the same time, the rational part of him realised, completely nuts. He decided it must be a side effect of the medication. He tried to push the feeling from his mind, but it wouldn't go away. Next time the robot that fed him came into the room, he found himself surreptitiously watching, looking for an avenue of escape. The door always opened without warning, and the robot was inside, with the door closed inside a couple of seconds. Cantor started mulling over whether that was the time to dive from the bed and roll under the closing door. He thought it might be, and it would mean some action at last if he gave it a go. Shavir the space station computer said. Yes, Reason, Shavir acknowledged, lifting her head from her researches on species hybridization. Nothing she had found bore any resemblance to the effects she had been able to produce herself. Her results were more like cutting-edge research in nanotechnology than anything in the literature. I'm sorry to disturb you, the computer continued, but we have an escaped Zed human. Show me the situation, Shavir ordered. Her desk screen sprang into life, showing Cantor, thankfully now at least wearing a surgical gown, in the corridor outside his lab. He walked to the second secure lab and started sniffing at the edges of the door. Fascinating, Shavir said. 
Shall I send a containment team? Reason asked. Yes, Shavir said absently. That may well be necessary. But they are not to be armed, and they are not to be wearing power armor. Just a simple hardened environment suit. I don't want my Z-Human hurt. Shavir continued to watch Z-Human 1 as he investigated the locked lab. Open the door to secure lab 2, Shavir said. The containment team has not yet arrived, Reason warned. Just do it, Shavir said. On the screen, she saw Cantor take an involuntary step back as the large door slid unexpectedly up out of the way. After a moment's hesitation, he went into the lab. The view on Shavir's monitor changed to show him entering. Zed Human 2 was doing his best to hide in the shadows of the lab and his grey skin was becoming the same antiseptic white as the walls. Cantor saw him immediately and charged at him, driven by some terrible instinct. The man stopped cowering and came out to meet Cantor and swiped at Cantor's face at the same moment as Cantor threw a punch. Cantor managed to duck in time, his opponent seemed slow and uncoordinated with the arm, and then Cantor saw why. The unfortunate's human arm had been removed and replaced with some alien monstrosity, with the elbow in slightly the wrong place and terminating in long claws. Cantor stepped inside the man's reach, but felt the claws digging into his back. By the powers! Cantor yelled. He had to finish this quickly before his opponent did any more damage with his claws. He punched as quickly as he could, again and again. He smashed his head into the opponent's nose. He felt himself becoming wilder, losing his humanity, and then everything went dark. He came too later, not much later. He had a feeling not much time had passed. But he also had the feeling that a lot had happened. He was in a secure ward, not his, he suddenly realised, but very similar, except there was something wrong. The antiseptic white of the walls and the competent flashing lights of the displays were marred here and there by blood. And, he noticed, some of the more delicate medical technology was toppled and smashed. The bed was empty, and he was on the floor, straddling something. He didn't dare look down to see what was between his legs. He had to force himself to lower his head, half knowing what he would see. He saw one of the other volunteers, his arm replaced by an alien claw and his skin grey. But the worse was the skull. The skull had been bashed in, and in Cantor's right hand was one of the rails intended to keep a patient from falling out of bed. He had obviously ripped it from its usual position. He had no idea how much strength that would require and used it to brain this other unfortunate human. Another kid from the underclass like him, just trying to get by. The nagging feeling of a nearby rival had gone. Cantor was immediately convinced that the drugs they had given him had driven him psychotic along with turning him grey. It was the only explanation. Then a group of soldiers came into the lab, dressed in environment suits and swinging nightsticks. Cantor didn't have the will to resist them. He took his punishment. He deserved it. What have they done to me? he yelled as the blows came raining down. Shavir leaned back from the monitor, her face a mass of shock. What indeed? she said. What indeed? Cantor was having more and more trouble thinking. He knew it. He wondered if the troopers who returned him to his secure room had given him brain damage. Then, with a grim smile, he decided not to think about it. He felt the presence of more rivals, all around in the lab complex, and his immediate problem was how he was going to get to them and bash their brains out. He knew how to do it, of course, he just didn't know how he knew.
A plan had appeared almost unbidden in his mind, a plan that took full advantage of his new powers. Though he would have been unable to explain it in words what these powers were or how they operated. The first step was the feeding robot, so he would just have to be patient and wait for it to arrive. He had once hated just waiting. He had once been a man of action, but now lying in wait seemed to come naturally. His yellow eyes lit up when the feeding robot arrived, the door shutting much more quickly behind it now. He asked the robot for food. When the droid came over, he grabbed it by the left hand. He felt his hideous grey skin melt and flow over the hand, felt a weird crackling and popping sensation. When he let go of the robot's arm, only part of it remained. It had been stripped back to the struts and actuators, looking very similar to the human bones that the robot's structure was based on. An alarm started sounding in the background as he went calmly over to the door. The robot tried to stop him, but he smashed it to the floor. Chapter 19 A buzzer appeared at the end of the corridor and Knave fired. Remembering how fast the buzzer had been on the last time, he aimed for the buzzer's legs, scoring some lucky shots and bringing it down. The massive metal beast behind it, an even larger buzzer than usual, this one with an extra arm projecting from its torso, just below the usual four, was forced to ground its fallen comrade, opening it up to Knave's fire. He pummeled it to the ground with blaster bolts. That's some pretty fancy shooting, Jay said. It was luck, Knave said. They could have just easily made it into the room, damaged and pissed off and ready for a fistfight. Do you know what chance a human has in a fistfight against a buzzer? Nope, Jay said. Zero, Knave informed him matter-of-factly. Altia ran through his gun sights down the corridor towards the dead buzzers, or hopefully dead. What are you doing? Knave yelled. You crazy? She pulled two buzzer weapons from the creature's arms and came running back, the heavy weapons dragging on the floor behind her. She shoved one in the direction of Jay and gathered the other up into her arms, turning it this way and that as she searched for some comfortable way to hold the ungainly alien weapon. She ended up with it clamped beneath her arm and resting on her hip while she aimed with one hand, leaving the other to operate the surprisingly complex controls. Why does a gun need so many buttons? she grumbled. Just push the slider up to max and press the red stud when you want to kill something, Jay said. Altia fired down the corridor again and again to get her aim, and Jay followed suit. A buzzer head appeared round the corner at the end and quickly ducked back into cover as all three fired at it. I'm pretty sure nobody hit it, Knave said. But we gave it a scare, Jay said. The three of them were able to lay down a very dense amount of fire with their weapons and the buzzers seemed to have abandoned the idea of just running down the corridor. The buzzers seemed content to pop out of cover, fire off a few shots, and hide again, which was exactly what Knave, Altea, and Jay were doing as well. I guess they're biding their time, Knave said, until they can find a route that brings them in behind us. Once they start coming down all these corridors at once, we'll be in trouble. Then Altea noticed something. There was a huge, dark shape watching them from the other side of the striated ice. It bashed its head against the ice once, twice, until cracks started to appear, radiating outwards from where it was bashing its head. She noticed its eyes most of all. They were fiery yellow and intense against the dark shadow of its head. Knave and Jay had noticed this new interruption now as well. What is that? Knave asked. Shouldn't the ice be thicker? Jay asked. The whole place should be filled with cyanide gas and be cold enough to freeze our eyeballs, 
but here we are, not even wearing the helmets of our environment suits. This place just doesn't make sense, but an ancient alien AI just fixed it for us. The technology of this place is like magic, Altea said. A buzzer had sneaked down the corridor while they were distracted, and was now using its fallen comrades as a barricade. It was just one short, charging run from making it into the room now, among them. All three fired at the sneaky buzzer to try and make it keep its head down to drive away all thoughts of making a run at them. This situation is deteriorating rapidly, Nave said. That's putting it mildly, Altea said, trying to keep up a rapid rate of fire with the alien weapon as it jumped around in her grip. Then, at last... Rort spoke again. I have computed an escape route, he said. I am downloading the route into the memory of Jay. I just got a data packet, the robot confirmed. Goodbye, Rort said. The creature behind the ice convulsed its body, shouldering the ice and dislodging a giant chunk of the striated wall. The huge shard of ice fell into the room, bringing the terminal they had used to contact Rort with, ripping the terminal out of the ice by its metal roots. Goodbye, Altea said softly. Frigid water was now leaking from the cracks in the ice and instantly turning to steam as it made contact with the heat of the chamber. The buzzer had taken advantage of the distraction and charged into the room. All three targeted it and shot it down, but they were retreating now, walking backwards and shooting. Buzzer after buzzer came skittering into the room, raising their weapons. There was no way Altea or Knave would survive massed fire in just an environment suit. It was impossible. Knave knew that. Who knew what Jay's new alien body could take? But his aim was poor, and he was having difficulty dealing with the weight of the buzzer weapon, so Knave guessed the new body was no heavy-duty combat model. He articulated all these thoughts going through his mind at the speed of lightning with just two words. Not good. He winced, instinctively glancing away from the certainty of oncoming death, but it didn't come. Instead, the ice finally gave way. It came cascading down between them and the buzzers, spewing frigid water that instantly turned to steam, obscuring vision, turning the buzzers into indistinct forms seen through the fog, and then the creature emerged. A dark presence amid the steam, yellow eyes shining between the two groups. If it twitched to the right, it would be on them, but if it twitched to its left, it would be on the buzzers. The creature swayed side to side for a very long fraction of a second. Then it went left, descending on the buzzers among a hail of discharges as the buzzers tried to fight it off with blaster bolts. The creature seemed unaffected and then followed the sound of its teeth, though Knave wasn't sure if the sound was teeth or a beak or mandibles as the creature crunched through the buzzer armour. They devolved, Altea said. What? Knave grunted. This way, Jay yelled in his alien voice. The creature reacted instantly to the voice, twitching alert. It turned to watch them as they ran, hesitated for a moment, then came slithering after them. The buzzers that had survived its savage lunge retreated away from it, firing at it as it went. The blaster bolts gouged lumps from the creature's hide and left long smoking track line scars, but the creature didn't even slow down. It just released a blood curdling roar, uncomfortably similar to Jay's new voice. I left my helmet back there, Nave yelled. Me too, Altea shouted. That's too bad, Jay said, because it looks like our route takes us to the surface. At that moment, above them, the buzzer swarm was going on alert. Their sensors had detected a disturbance in the surface of the gas giant Phaeton 7. A small disturbance, but worrying. The commander of the buzzer swarm was cautious by nature and suspected some kind of booby trap left by those disgusting, squishy humans.
he sent a single pod ship to investigate, a large and formidable vessel, but ultimately expendable. The pod ship started relaying images of the disturbance. It looked like one of the thousands of other megastorms in the upper layers of the gas that made up the visible part of the planet's atmosphere. It looked perfectly normal. But the buzzers assigned to Astrogation and Planetology, who were very reliable members of his Council of Invasion Advisors, assured him that their sensors told them the disturbance was not natural. Any force powerful enough to mess with the air currents of a gas giant and reconfigure them had to be investigated. The commander watched the pictures absently. It would normally have given up some time ago and passed the task on to an underling, but there was little else to do at that moment. The invasion had gone like clockwork. The horrible organic humans, with their throbbing veins right at the surface of their flabby bodies, had been crushed, or rather squished. Their proud navy battle group sent scuttling away with heavy losses. It had been most gratifying watching huge human frigates and battleships bursting like ripe cantaloupes under the buzzer guns. The ground action had been swift and perfunctory, with a few reports of survivors being found and executed even now, but basically all the fighting was over. The commander had long ago handed responsibility for the drifter complex over to the spawn of the scientist hives. Strange creatures in the commander's eyes, strange in comparison to the spawn of the warrior hives, but buzzers just like him, and now the commander found itself at a bit of a loose end. The pod ship had sent out fighters, and they were relaying pictures from a multitude of different angles now. One of the views was relaying pictures from down the eye of the storm, and even though the commander was no expert, just a simple warrior, he had seen a good share of gas giant storms, and this one looked to go unusually deep. He called an advisor, his best planetologist, to the command bridge of his flagship. In the minutes it took the scientist to arrive, the storm had gotten perceptibly deeper. The scientist entered and bowed low, its body bloated with delicate scientific instruments beneath its thin carapace, dwarfed the more compact and robust commander. How deep does that storm go? the commander asked. Very deep, the scientist replied down to the gas liquid layer where diamonds rain down on the planet's surface like sleet. Could this be a human trap, trick or weapon? We have seen nothing to suggest they have anything like this level of technology. True, the commander mused. All their advanced technology is stolen or reverse engineered from us. They are the most disgusting hairy vermin. The commander paused, his scientist beside him, watching the storm on a giant viewscreen. So what's going on here? the commander asked. The scientist was quiet for a few seconds, communing with his fellow hive members. Then it spoke. We believe it is drifter technology. We have discovered a hidden layer of the complex deeper than any yet mapped. Go on, the commander said. Reports are confused. There are problems with communications in the vicinity of large drifter artifacts, but there might have been a first contact. First contact was carried out by warriors hunting some human vermin that were scuttling around down there, and the first contact does not seem to have gone well. The commander laughed a chittering sound like a distorted and metallic recording of locust wings. We warriors were never good at first contacts. Indeed. They both fell silent, as the sensors aboard the pod ship and the fighters it had deployed started to report a shape ascending through the eye of the storm. The form was very indistinct and could not be resolved yet, leaving information about size and shape a little hazy.
But there was no doubt what colour it was. Drifter bronze. What is your assessment? the commander asked. We have seen nothing like this before, the scientist whispered uncomfortably. I can give you no guidance about what to do. The sensors suddenly started to get a better, less distorted view of the ascending structure. At last, an estimate of size became available. It's small, the scientist said. It's the size of a dreadnought, the commander corrected. That is not small. On a planetary scale, I meant. Then a 3D representation of the shape of the structure appeared, based on what they could guess and extrapolate from the front view. It was an elegantly curved wedge of streamlined technology, tapering to the front and stubby at the rear. The commander was an expert in military spaceship design and recognised the purpose of the spaceship immediately. I would guess that it's a versatile fleet action type warship, he said. It's the first drifter spaceship of any type we have seen, except for the primary drifter artifact itself, which is a type of huge spaceship, and that's in human hands. We are very lucky that they are too stupid to unlock its secrets. We must have it, the commander shouted. It must be immobilized and boarded before the drifter we woke up can escape in it. You think the spaceship was summoned by the drifter your warriors encountered? Yes, the commander said. It might be too early for you scientists to agree, but I think the creature encountered is a drifter, and I think it summoned this spaceship. The commander started issuing orders into a communication device. Disable the spaceship as it emerges, the buzzer commander yelled. At the commander's orders, the podship fired on the drifter spaceship's engines as it emerged from the cloud layers. To the commander's eye sockets, it was a magnificent sight. The target, the drifter spaceship, caught the gleam of the faraway sun almost as soon as it emerged from the gas giant's atmosphere and was further illuminated by the characteristic red beams of energy projected by the attacking buzzer spaceships. It was just a flight of fighters launched from a pod ship, but they had positioned themselves to generate an impressive crossfire. The drifter spaceship accelerated forward, leaving the fighters behind it. It pulled a plume of cloud from the planet's atmosphere in its wake as it accelerated, engulfing the fighters, but otherwise it ignored them. It's fast, the commander mumbled appreciatively, and it looks to be pretty much impervious to the medium-caliber weaponry of those fighters. Marvellous. It will make a worthy prize. I suspect it will require considerable force to overcome the defences of this spaceship, the planetologist mused. Of course, the commander said. But the spaceship is in interplanetary space now, and so I do not think you can be of any more use to me. The scientist bowed and departed, and before he had even left the room, the commander was directing his most powerful spaceships to attempt an intercept before the target reached wherever it was going. The commander strongly suspected it would be heading for the ice moon. Nave, Altea and Jay were running through the corridors, no longer bothering to stop and shoot at the pursuing creature. They were just trying to escape the creature at their backs. It didn't seem designed for movement on land. It had flippers, lots of them, that were muscular and had talons at the end of them. And it was slowly falling behind. What kind of creature can withstand blaster impacts? Nave asked. A very strange creature, Altea mumbled. I think it's finally tiring, Altea said and Jay is keeping his mouth shut. It was hearing that voice that set the thing off. I think also because we aren't shooting at it, Nave said. The creature dropped further and further back, and they were able to slow their breakneck pace. I am glad I got that new hip, Jay said. Shh, Nave cautioned him. 
We don't know how good that creature's hearing is, and it doesn't seem to like the sound of your voice. Jay nodded and pointed. I think he wants us to follow him, Altia said. I think you're right, Nave nodded, a smile on his lips. But we still have the problem that we forgot our helmets. They both kept running, following the robot. I'm working on it, Altia said. I'm working on it. She tapped the side of her head and winked confidently. Nave did feel his spirits lighten. If anyone could come up with a solution, it would be her. He hurried to catch up with Jay. It seemed unlikely, but if they did run into some buzzers or some other hostiles, it would be best if he was in the vanguard. He was the best shot, he judged, not least because the other two were stuck with unwieldy weapons designed for buzzer hands. Hey, Jay said as Nave came alongside. I think it's okay for me to talk now. I think we've lost our friend. Do you think Rort somehow released that thing as a diversion? He asked. Altia was just behind them, a few steps further back, but within earshot, covering the rear. I don't think so, she said. It would be too unpredictable an intervention. I don't know, Jay said. I'm sure it is quite a formidable intelligence, capable of calculating variables that would be beyond us. Is, Nave said, or was. The way it said goodbye sounded quite final. And sad, Altia said. All right, people, Jay said loudly, driving all their questions from their minds. Here we are. This is the next stage of the route, but it requires that we go out through the airlock. Nave found himself involuntarily turning to Altia. Yes, she said. I thought of something, Nave, but it's far from perfect. I think I can rig up a membrane to seal over our heads and our neck rings like a big balloon. OK, Nave said. How long before a membrane like that bursts like a balloon? Actually, Jay reminded them, it'll go off with a bigger bang than any balloon. When the atmosphere in your suit mixes with the atmosphere of the planet, it will detonate like a small grenade. Thanks, that's very comforting, Nave said. Thanks. Ten minutes, Altia said. Tops. That might be enough, Jay said. Our end position is just outside the airlock. I think we just have to get outside and wait. Maybe we can wait inside the airlock, Nave said in case whatever help Rort is sending doesn't turn up instantly. Like because maybe they've been dead for a few thousand years, for example. Another worry just occurred to me, Altia said, is that Rort might have taken our desire to escape quite literally. It might have decided to help us find a route from the structure, and that might be as far as the plan goes. They all exchanged a grim look. But nobody saw fit to elaborate on this idea. Let's do this, Altia said. She pulled some tools out of her utility belt and melted and shaped some plastic. Then she used her laser to attach it to Nave's neck ring. That looks pretty good, Jay said encouragingly. It might last half an hour, if you ask me. More like ten minutes, Altia said. Altia then talked Nave through how to attach a membrane for her. She checked the jury-rigged helmets as best she could once he was done. All right, she said, let's expose these things to the frigid, toxic, explosive atmosphere out there. They entered the airlock, a buzzer design, which closed behind them and cycled. Nave felt his membrane helmet shrink to his skin in the thick atmosphere, then expand as his suit inflated it. It was cold, very cold. He was suddenly a lot less sure of Altia's abilities when it came to science and engineering. But he could breathe, and nothing exploded, which was some kind of relief. By the powers, Altia almost screamed, the air is cold on this cursed rock. Will it kill us? Nave asked. Will our ears freeze and snap off? No, Altia yelled, but she didn't sound convinced. They were both yelling now because, without helmet microphones, their nearest suit microphone was below their neck rings. It was strange for Nave not to have a chronometer readout in his line of sight either. 
He had no idea how much of his ten minutes had elapsed already. Hey, Jay, Nave yelled. Can you call out the minutes as they elapse? No problem, Nave, the robot called back. The first minute is elapsing now. Nave was shocked. One of his precious minutes before his suit would probably fail had already elapsed. He took a hurried and desperate look around the place he had ended up. He was on the slopes of an alien mountain, though the slope wasn't as steep here as usual. It was almost a plain extending away into the swirling snow. It made for a sort of natural landing pad, a big one that would be able to accommodate a huge number of shuttles all at the same time. His heart leapt. This couldn't be an accident, he was sure of that. He looked upwards, searching the gusts of driving snow for signs of a shuttle coming to pick him up, but visibility was low that an armada could be hiding up there and he wouldn't know. Second minute elapsing now, knave, Jay said. By all the powers, Altea screamed. Why bring us here? What's the point? It'll be a quick death at least. That's something. Knave had never heard her losing it before, screaming and cursing. His eyes flicked down to catch a glimpse of her face, ashen under the influence of the cold and pressure. Her suit was having trouble keeping her alive without a proper helmet, and Knave knew he must look the same, or worse. Then his eyes went back to the sky, searching for rescue. Third minute elapsing, Jay said. Shouldn't we go back in? Altea asked, before she trailed off without finishing her thought. What's that? she said. She was suddenly pointing, and Nave and Jay both craned their necks to try to catch a glimpse of whatever she had seen. There was something. The snow was thicker, blowing more intensely, but there was a suggestion of a shadow. What is that? Nave echoed. Fourth minute elapsing, Jay announced, and that, I think, is a spaceship, a large one, a very large one. I think you're right, Altea whispered, her words all but lost in the wind. I don't recognise the design, Nave said. Is it even human? Come in closer, Jay said. Try to get as close to my position as you can. Apparently this is where we should be. They both shuffled nearer to the robot, and Nave's attention was drawn to the door of the airlock they had used to exit the building. The dark window of the door had suddenly illuminated. The airlock is cycling, he yelled and drew his gun. He tried to position himself so that his body was shielding the other two, for what that was worth, and took up the most stable shooting stance he could. He nestled his blaster into his shoulder, ignoring what was probably a descending spaceship, concentrating on the airlock instead. Fifth minute elapsing, Jay yelled. The airlock door slid up. There were two buzzers inside, and Nave fired immediately. The buzzers fired back, luckily missing as they dived for cover behind the airlock door frame. Nave saw one of his shots produce a shower of sparks, and he was confident he had scored a hit on one of the hostiles. His two friends, attempting to use him as some sort of cover, started shooting as well, knocking chunks out of the airlock frame and buckling the door. It would never cycle again, and the chances of them reaching a different one before their suits failed were vanishingly slim. Nave was aware of a presence above him, the spaceship, but he didn't dare look up to get a better idea of its design. He saw movement in the airlock and fired more sparks. He was scoring hits, keeping the buzzers in the airlock. Sixth minute elapsing, Jay yelled. Nave was thrown from his feet by a huge impact behind him. Ice was thrown into the air and rock debris sent skittering. He turned to see a giant bronze wall, the side of the spaceship, rising from the ice. It hadn't stopped to hover on Gravitix, but had actually slammed down into the surface of the planet. The wall wasn't featureless. There was a hexagonal opening just feet away from Jay. The robot was lying prone, also knocked from his feet by the impact, and Altea was likewise struggling to find her feet again. Nave was first on his feet, and immediately went to help Altea, but she was up before he reached her. 
They ended up staggering towards the opening, holding each other up, just Jay behind. The buzzers had obviously regained their feet too, because blaster bolts tore through the air, forcing them to dive into the opening in the side of the spaceship, looking for cover as they dove. Knave would have preferred somehow to walk in proudly, but instead he was crawling on the floor, trying to hide behind the doorframe. Wind howling, his friends screaming, blaster bolts impacting all around them, and then nothing. A silence descended, so complete in comparison to what had gone before that it was deafening. Knave's poor ears were ringing, his face was a chaos of pins and needles as warm air hit it. They all three looked at each other. The aperture had closed, sealed by a bronze door with no windows. The chamber they found themselves in was also windowless. It was large, but it was human scale, not buzzer scale. There was a hexagonal opening, the only exit now that the door they had jumped in through was closed, but it was sealed off by an opaque energy field. Hexagonal doors, Altea said. That's new. It was such an incongruous thing to say after their lives had just been saved, after such a strange and unlikely thing had come to pass, that Knave couldn't help but laugh. Soon followed by Jay, and then, sniggering at first, Altea. The laughing took Knave's mind off the pins and needles in his face, but he could still feel the plastic embrace of their jury-rigged helmets. He popped the seals at his wrists and shook off his gloves, then reached up to touch the membrane covering his face. It was still cold from its contact with the atmosphere of the ice moon. What are you doing? Altea yelled. We haven't tested the atmosphere in here. His fingers dug into the plastic, but they couldn't even scratch it, never mind rip it. Seventh minute elapsing, Jay said. You can stop that count down now, Knave grinned, his fingers squeaking against the plastic membrane as he tried to rip it. This thing turned out to be very robust, he added. I think we could easily have lasted another twenty, thirty seconds before it popped. Come here, Altea said. I'll help you remove it. She took some chemicals and a sharp tool from her belt, melted the bond between the neck ring of his environment suit and the membrane, then cut it away. It came sliding off his head like a lizard shedding its skin. Ow! Those chemicals burn, Knave said. Shut up, you big baby, Altea giggled. Relief at being alive, plain to hear in her voice. She handed him the chemicals and the blade. All right, she said. Now you do me. This thing feels like it's trying to strangle me. The commander was watching two images at once on his bridge command screens. He was watching an incident that had happened just a few minutes ago, and he was watching a live stream. The live stream showed an elegant and powerful alien spaceship boosting into orbit around the ice moon. It was now surrounded by pod ships and fighters blasting at its shields and armour, and, to his pleasure, its shields were weakening. The commander could see the telltale signs of shields overloading, and his two most powerful units were on their way to intercept, just minutes away. The other video screen showed something more troubling, a recording of the incident on a loop. A robot of obviously alien design was leading two humans into the spaceship. The spaceship had inserted itself into the moon's atmosphere, descending in a terrifying blaze of re-entry friction, and then bellied down comparatively softly onto the surface. It was a virtuoso display of flying that would have ripped the grav engines off even his most manoeuvrable units if they had attempted anything similar. The airlock in the spaceship side had already been open, perfectly placed for the robot and the two humans just to hop in. Then, before his brave warriors could shoot them down like the vermin they were, the airlock had closed and the spaceship had risen, slowly at first, then faster and faster into the atmosphere. It had just reached escape velocity. 
It was such a perfectly timed manoeuvre that the commander couldn't believe it. He watched the same section of the video over again and again. The humans and the alien robot were huddled together in the snow and ice, under the crosshairs of his warriors. It should have been just a matter of time before they were blown messily to pieces, but then they had been rescued by the spaceship which, just minutes before, had emerged from the surface of the gas giant. It was impossible to believe or understand. He watched the humans and the robot jump to safety again and again. My best torturers will extract your secrets from you, he promised the two humans on the screen. And we will then find out what hold you have over that alien robot. A symbol illuminated in his control space and he activated it with a metal claw. The captain of his most powerful spaceship, the Chill Spider, appeared before him in hologram form. We are entering range and will commence firing in moments, the hologram said respectfully, if my commander so wills. Just disable that ship, the commander growled, and don't hold back. I'm sure it will be able to take plenty of damage before the engines are knocked out. The Dreadblade will be with you in moments. Fire at will. Fire at will! The captain could be seen screaming at his crew as the hologram faded. The commander felt a flush of pride and switched off the recording of the humans escaping. Something about it bothered him, but the battle to take the drifter spaceship would require all his attention. He watched as the chill spider entered a nearby orbit to their target. Its weapons were large and powerful and mounted in broadside bays. The chill spider could angle its weapons on swivel mounts and had the most powerful gravitic virtual gyroscopes ever designed by buzzer shipwright hives which all meant it could swiftly achieve a broadside vector against even the most manoeuvrable of adversary. Watching the mighty spaceship fire its weapons sent a shiver down the commander's spine. The gun ports opened in a choreographed ripple of tons of shifting armour. Gun mounts briefly protruded, swivelled, fired, withdrew and the ports shifted, closed again. All in less than a second. Enough energy was unleashed to burn the face of a planet to a cinder. The commander was pleased to see that his captain had followed his orders and had not held anything back. The chill spider's gunners had a true aim and the drifter spaceship turned a livid blue under the intense assault of energy as its shields tried to get rid of the terrible load they were under. The early stages of any encounter were all about shields. The question was whether any energy had leaked through the shields and caused physical damage to the spaceship. Spotters all over the fleet knew this was what the commander was looking for, and hundreds of buzzer eye sockets were searching the target spaceship for any sign of new physical damage. Even a melted communications antenna would bring a metaphorical smile to their commander's face because he would know that, given time and relentless bombardment, the shields could be breached. Enemy hull quadrant K12-H88B came a call routed directly through to the commander by the buzzer's monitoring fleet communications. The commander adjusted and focused his display. The spaceship jumped in size again and again till it filled the monitor, then jumped in size again till the hull section in the call K12-H88B was in focus. Yes, the commander screeched. By the slick carapace of the Hive Queen, damage and on the first shot. The commander's viewport showed the armour of the alien spaceship marred by a welt that looked like a boil, but a boil that had burst and was shedding debris. The drifter spaceship was already rolling to turn the damaged area away from Chill Spider. The damage was exactly where their scientists had guessed the engines might be, the target given to the captain of Chill Spider. 
Great shooting, he murmured. Great shooting. Inside the drifter spaceship, Nave, Altea and Jay were almost thrown from their feet. They all heard a metallic clang, like a giant had bashed the side of the spaceship with a spanner. What was that? Jay asked. This escape unit is under attack by forces who wish to impede your escape. A voice came wafting from the ceiling somewhere. It sounded like Rort but at the same time, unlike Rort. Escape unit, Altea said. Yes, the voice said. I have been designed to facilitate your escape and to return you to your homes. Designed, Altea said. More importantly, Nave interrupted, you said we were under attack. That is correct, the voice said, unperturbed and mechanical by powerful vessels that seem intent on disabling or destroying this escape unit. The commander watched as Dreadblade swung into position behind the target, joining Chill Spider in the attack. Dreadblade had an entirely different armament, but no less devastating if used correctly. There was a single mass driver running the entire length of its back covered by a tunnel of armour and heat sinks, like the spine of a skinned fish. The muzzle armour folded flat to reveal a moor big enough to land a shuttle in. There was a suggestion of a blur, a hint of a flash, and the muzzle armour closed. A giant wad of mass had been sent hurtling at the drifter spaceship, causing an intense splash of blue to form on its shields. More damage could be seen on the engine armour of the target. The commander squealed in delight. The cowardly fools weren't even fighting back. Chapter 20 The three of them, Nave, Altea and Jay, were shaken again. Another attack, the voice said. We can't keep on taking damage, Nave yelled. We have to do something. Yes, the mechanical voice said. We have to escape the situation and deliver you home. This is crazy, Altea said. Who are you? I am Yort, the voice said. And, Jay asked, why are you keeping us imprisoned? You are not imprisoned, Yort said. The force wall on the entrance to the room is simply to retain atmosphere during airlock operations. Feel free to exit this chamber and wander about the spaceship to your heart's content. When you step through the barrier, it will conform to your contours and let you pass. We're not prisoners, Nave said. That's good. I don't intend to wander about, Altea said but I would like to go someplace where I can see what's going on. Just follow the line, Yort said. A glowing line stitched across the floor as the ship was shaken by another attack. The line went to the energy barrier across the hexagonal doorway and disappeared as it went through. Altea followed it to the energy barrier, stepped into it, and was swallowed up as it slithered around her form as though she were entering a body of water, but one with a vertical surface, not a horizontal one. Nave followed seconds after, followed at a more leisurely pace by Jay. The line led along dimly lit corridors, which also had the hexagonal configuration of the doorway. There were a lot of apertures leading off from the corridors, all hexagonal. Whoever the drifters were, Nave said, they had better eyes than us. Who can see anything in this gloom? If my new sensors are anything to judge by, Jay said, they could see a lot better than your normal human eyes. Altea disappeared round a sharp bend in the corridor, and Nave and the robot both hurried to catch up. They couldn't perceive any hint of motion within the spaceship, or any acceleration or manoeuvring, only the regular impacts of attacks, which felt to Nave as if they were getting worse. Are we actually moving? Nave asked, or are we just lying in their guns? We are moving at upper segment 4 acceleration, 
Yort answered. I do not know what that means, they could hear Altia saying as they caught up to her. It is difficult to translate, Yort explained, its growl of a voice sounding almost apologetic. Your culture does not possess a technology that would enable a direct comparison. The line they were following went through a hexagonal doorway that seemed larger than most of the others. Is this it? Nave asked. This is it, Yort confirmed. They all entered together into a space that opened out to three times the height of the relatively cramped corridor. There were three acceleration couches, designed for our escape, Altia murmured when she saw them. There was also a huge view screen which the couches were orientated towards. The screen was showing some kind of strange gold and bronze pattern that looked like spiderweb strands splitting and joining incessantly at 90 degree angles. Above the screen, there were innumerable technological devices hanging from the ceiling, like a collection of metallic and misshapen bats. To reach each elevated acceleration couch, there was a little set of steps, giving each couch, on its separate pedestal, a commanding view of the space. The bridge, Nave said. The bridge, Yort said. It was unclear from the tone whether the alien intelligence was confirming a guess or just adopting Nave's term. Nave took the central couch. Altia took the couch nearest to the door, and Jay took the couch on the other side. It was only after he had ascended the central couch that Nave noticed it was a little higher than the others. Is this the captain's chair? he asked. Nobody answered because the ship was shaken by the biggest impact yet, making them glad they were safely held by the acceleration couches. Show us what is going on, Altia ordered. The strange abstract spiderweb patterns disappeared from the screen, replaced by a view of a buzzer spaceship. Gun ports rippled open and closed along its flanks, and they were shaken again by a crunching impact. In the open spaces between the couches and the screen, a hologram appeared. It was hard to interpret at first, but then, in a flash, Altia realized what it represented. The blue symbol is this spaceship, she said. The two red symbols are the major threats, with additional swarms of orange lesser threats. The other stuff, the green stuff, is planets, asteroids and such like. Got it, Nave said. There are a lot of lesser threats, Jay said. Their seats were rocked again as incoming fire overloaded and then penetrated their shields, much reduced in power, but enough to throw them around. See that line connecting the enemy ship to ours for an instant, Altea said. That is an attack. But where is our return fire? Nave said, confused. I don't see it. Me neither, Altea said. There is no outgoing fire being rendered in the hologram, and I don't see any impacts on the video feeds of the enemy spaceships over there on the screen. Hello, Jay said. Yort, what is going on? Why aren't we returning fire? This operation was envisaged by my creator as a rescue mission. It was thought, as far as I can guess, the thought processes that went into my design that the mission could be achieved with a high probability of success without returning fire. By the powers, Nave yelled, exasperated. Do we even have guns? Altia asked. The term guns is vague, Yort said evasively. Come on, yelled Nave. Work with us here. I've never met a ship's computer that was happy about taking damage. Just tell us if there are any guns on board. There are offensive systems, Yort said, both beam weapons and missiles. OK, Jay said, line up those beam weapons and let's cut them up like salami. I was not created with the subroutines necessary for offensive action, Yort said. That's just great, Jay growled, the growl made more emphatic by his strange alien voice. I have what looks like some kind of targeting system here, Altia said. Yes, 
Yord said. Every command position is provided with manual controls for firing, navigation, and various other functions. It looks a little complex, Altia said, and the language used in the readouts is a little uh, unfamiliar. Nave knew she was thinking out loud as she attempted the impossible task of figuring out drifter targeting systems, and he didn't want to distract her. But he was so tense he couldn't hold his tongue. Come on, he yelled. By the powers, just pull the cursed trigger. Don't worry about friendly fire, there aren't any friendlies out there. Altia put her fingers onto the console and the hieroglyphs carved there lit up. She felt her interface symbols throbbing on her chest. On the controls, the symbols nearest her fingers glowed the strongest, as if heated from within by volcanic flames, while those furthest away were the dimmest. OK, she said, it's responding. They were rocked by another impact, at least as bone-crushing as the previous one. I don't see any outgoing fire, Jay murmured. Selecting weapon system, Altia said. Their names are more poetic than descriptive, unfortunately. Anything, Nave said. Fire, anything. Here goes with the serpent's sting. There was a strange high-pitched discharge sound and a slight recoil. It felt as though they had gone over a little bump in the road. In the tactical hologram, pencil-thin red lines of force slid towards the target the largest enemy spaceship. The spaceship on the screen reacted immediately, its screens flaring and armour being torn away in loose chunks to expose decks and systems beneath. Flame fountained out of the exposed decks and there were secondary explosions. Yes! Altia hissed in triumph. The target's weapons ports rippled open, undeterred, unleashing powerful beams of energy. But this time, Nave didn't feel the crushing impact of weapons hits and damage. I think we threw them off their aim, Nave whooped. Just keep hitting that button, Jay said. Let's give them a taste of their own medicine. The commander hissed as he saw the drifter spaceship at last return fire. A turret on the spaceship's back that had been lying flat against the hull, inert, suddenly jumped to attention zeroed in on Chill Spider and fired two beams of intense red energy. The shields of the Buzzer spaceship were completely overwhelmed and the damage it took was severe. It was an impressive display of the power of the alien spaceship's weapons. It would be a windfall to be able to disable and board the drifter ship and have those weapons at his disposal so they could be reverse-engineered by the science hives. But capturing the spaceship as a prize was far from a certain outcome. The confrontation was balanced on a knife edge. He could see the damage they had already inflicted, and he judged it to be in or near the regions of the engines, but the spaceship was drawing away. It was a shade faster than his best ships, and the combat had already left most of the swarm behind. Only the Chill Spider and Dreadblade were still in firing range, and they were extending from medium range to long range as he watched. The target was robust, but it was not impervious to damage. Its armour had been breached in several places, and there was now no way it could turn to present an undamaged aspect to its pursuers. Just one or two more good hits, the commander growled. That's all it will take, and that treasure trove of technology will be mine. The drifter spaceship fired again, and Chill Spider took another devastating helping of damage. The commander could see their formation lights flickering, and knew that power disturbances on a scale large enough to cause that were never good news. The Chill Spider had two engines, and the drive plume of the one on the side hit by the drifter spaceship dimmed. The spaceship started to veer off course suddenly presented with the choice between lowering speed or going in big circles as the undamaged engine continued to operate at full force, powering them into a turn that the damaged engine was unable to stop. 
the drifter spaceship had now slipped all of its pursuers apart from the last, the Dreadblade, and the commander could see that the target was extending its FTL drive veins, and their tips were already glowing as they sought to grab hold of the fabric of space and warp it to form a tunnel. We're running out of time, the commander yelled. The captain of the Dreadblade seemed to realise this too. The armour on the spinal mass driver left gaping open to save fractions of seconds in cycling the weapon and increase their rate of fire. The commander saw one more devastating hit on the fleeing target, armour sent flying in rings of dislodged material by the sheer force of the impact, and then it was gone. Destroyed? the commander wondered aloud. The last impact had been huge, but there wasn't enough debris for that. The enemy had achieved warp speed and were now simply gone. The commander slammed his claws into a nearby console, sending sparks flying as the unit disintegrated under the force of his blow. The commander hadn't done that for a long time. It hadn't felt tested like this in a long time. Destroying humans had become routine, a duty and a chore, over the years of service he had given to the buzzer hives, but now that might just be changing. There might just be a new challenge to confront out there. The buzzer commander, the old warrior, smiled. Interesting times, it said. Knave slumped in his command couch. Altea took her fingers off the weapon systems, and Jay slowly turned his head to look at them. I think we've lost them, the robot said. I think you're right, Nave said. Now what? Altea asked. Now, said Yort, you will be returned to your homes, starting with Nave, followed by Altea, and then Jay. Then the mission will be completed, and I will return to a waiting state. Hey, Jay said, how come I come last? The order was determined by my designer, Yort said. How long will it take? Nave asked. Do I have time for a shower? Altea laughed while Jay looked on, slightly confused. Yort ignored any hint of sarcasm in what Nave had said and answered as best it could. There is insufficient information to base an estimate of journey time on, Yort said. First you must provide information about the place that is your home. My home, Nave said, his voice low, was the Galaxy Dog, a dropship carrier that not even its captain loved. What is the location of this spaceship? Yort asked gently. It has been destroyed. But my purpose is to return you home. Then you have a problem, Nave said grimly. I will compute a solution, Yort said. You have time enough to take a shower, to eat and rest. I must consider many factors before I can satisfactorily answer the paradox of how to return you to a home that does not exist. The voice went silent, and the view screen was once again covered in the strange web-like pattern of bronze and gold strands. Nave, Altea, and Jay would be aboard the spaceship for a week before Yort spoke again. Chapter 21 There was a room for each of them, large, alien and majestic, but Nave, Altea and Jay spent a lot of time in a recreation area that they had discovered. It was located at the heart of the spaceship, with four hexagonal doors that allowed quick access to the rest of the spaceship. Some incongruous alien copies of human food synthesizers were located in the room and there were comfortable, upholstered places to sit. It was surreal, after so much action, so much stress, to have nothing to do. Altea decided her first project would be new clothes. She had persuaded the spaceship to produce some within half a day. 
The clothes were all in shades of bronze and gold, but Altea said she'd work on that, try to come up with more colourful designs. She never did, though. She moved on to her next project. Nave couldn't really help her with her projects, so he spent a lot of time wandering the corridors of the spaceship. As he walked, he started building up a mental picture of the ship, and he found it all endlessly fascinating. Nave's favourite area was a place he named the Observation Deck. He could sit on a comfortable couch, one of three in the room, and look out through a big hexagonal window. Compared to the usual view of the heavens, seen from a planet, it was a kaleidoscope of motion. He watched as the stars parallaxed and shifted position. The spaceship often flew through systems which seemed risky to Nave, but what did he know? He was sure Yort knew what he was doing. He watched unperturbed as planets zoomed to fill the window, then receded in less than a second. He also saw the spaceship overtaking flaming comets and detour round the plumes of ejecta sent out by black holes. He was sitting on the observation deck watching space go by when Yort spoke again. Hello, Nave, the ship's computer said, making Nave jump and spill a little of his drink. Hello, he said in reply, tentatively. This is quite a show, Yort, quite a show. Thank you. Where are we going, anyway? Nave asked cautiously. There is no specific destination. Flying like this helps me think, and it is the best way to ensure your security. Fly on, Nave said, and sipped his drink. Fly on. The problem that is occupying my mind is returning you home, the ship's computer said. Oh, sorry about that. You said your home is a spaceship called Galaxy Dog. Yes, that's right. This spaceship has no name. So, if this spaceship were to be called Galaxy Dog, my mission would be complete. You would be returned to a spaceship called Galaxy Dog. Sounds like cheating. I was worried about that too, Yort admitted. But I have checked my task formulations, and it would satisfy my mission parameters. So this spaceship would be my home? Yes, Yort said paused a moment, then said, If you accept. I accept. Then welcome home, to Galaxy Dog. Nave raised his glass and settled back to enjoy the show through the big hexagonal window. Altea was in the lab examining readouts from a selection of devices from around the spaceship, trying to work out what they did. She was having fun, and she found that she didn't want her studies of the spaceship to be interrupted. It was all so alive. The consoles, the displays, living drifter technology, not the dead remnants she was used to dealing with. Altea, Yort said. Yes, she replied, ignoring the fact that he hadn't said a word in days. I need to know where your home is, so you can be returned. But you have to return Nay first. That mission has been accomplished. What? She was shocked. Did we stop? Did Nave leave without saying goodbye? No, we did not stop, and he is in the observation lounge relaxing with a drink. Then in what sense is the mission complete? Nave informed me that his home was a spaceship called Galaxy Dog. Yort said, sounding strangely reticent. This structure is a spaceship, and it has now been named Galaxy Dog, and so Nave is now home. What? It sounds strange, I admit, but I have checked. I don't care what you've checked, Altea yelled. You can't name a magnificent spaceship such as this, something like Galaxy Dog. The ship has been so named, Yort said. Now could you please inform me where you would wish to be delivered, unless, of course, you consider your home to be with Knave. Hardly, 
Altea snorted. My home, I suppose, is with the science ministry. My last station was on Ice Tomb. I'm sorry I don't know the moon's name in your language, but they will have a new post for me now that the buzzers have control of it. Where is this new post? I don't know, Altea said. I must contact them and they'll tell me. How do I arrange the connection? Yort asked. Now, Altea was disappointed that the alien intelligence was so keen to eject her. Now, Yort said. Altea explained how to ping the Tarazet communications net and how to request a connection. She also gave Yort Shavir's address. I am getting no response, Yort said after a pause. The Tarazat communications net only extends within our territories, Altea explained. What is our current position? A hologram representation of the galaxy appeared in the lab. The hologram zoomed in repeatedly, and it was difficult for Altea to keep her orientation across all the changes of scale, but eventually it stopped zooming in and an icon appeared. This is our present position. Yort said. So far, Altea gasped, I don't think we are even in human space anymore. I understand, Yort said. Please indicate a position where we will be able to make a communications connection. The hologram zoomed out again and Altea spent a moment trying to regain her orientation. There, she said at last. We need to go there if we want to contact the science ministry. Understood, Yort said. The journey will take a day or two. Then the machine intelligence fell silent. Altea stayed staring into space for a few minutes. Soon, she would be forced to leave this treasure trove of mysteries and challenges. But she shook herself out of her reverie. There was no time to lose. She went back to her work trying to understand as many of the ship's secrets as she could. You don't want to go back, do you? Nave said, when Altea told him about the conversation. Back to Tarazat. It's my home, Altea said. But, Nave said, then stopped, not sure what he wanted to say. Don't you find it suspicious that Shavir left just before the massive buzzer invasion, for example? She left us there to die. Typical Tarazat government behaviour. She didn't want to go, Altea said. She would have stayed if she could. It was just a coincidence. You may be a genius, Altea, when it comes to engineering and things, Nave said. But I think you might be being a little naive. The likes of Shavir don't ever give a second thought to the likes of us. I'm not sure there is an us, Altea said. I'm very happy at the Ministry. It's you. You have a problem with authority. No, authority has a problem with me. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. Knave looked down. I don't think you'd understand. Not if you haven't been on the receiving end. Knave looked back up, catching her gaze and holding it. OK, he said. We'll play it your way. We'll rendezvous with the Tarazat forces and see what happens. Two days later, Yort made the call. Initially, the call was refused. The Tarazat communications net didn't like something about the signal coming from the Galaxy Dog. But Yort kept modulating and kept trying until the call was put through. Altea waited alone on the observation deck to be connected. Shavir appeared a glowing hologram with an unreal gold and bronze tint. Altea, she exclaimed, you're alive. Yes, Altea smiled. It was a close thing, but I made it. The hologram of Shavir looked around. Her eyes went wide and she turned completely about, twice, trying to take in as much as she could. Where are you calling from? she asked. You're not going to believe this. Altea said, but I'm calling from a functioning drifter spaceship, a warship. By the powers, Shavir said and stared around again. A drifter warship? Yes. Functional? Yes. 
Bring it at once to my location. I will send you the coordinates. Well, Altias said, even more embarrassed, there's a problem with that. The ship does not belong to me or respond to my commands, except in the most limited of ways. It seems to have chosen Knave as its master. Knave? That's the name of the trooper, the one who was marked with drifter hieroglyphs. Ah, yes, Shavir said. I remember. Well, that's not a problem. You outrank him, so just instruct him to deliver the spaceship to me for study. I thought you might want that, Altea said, her discomfort unabated. So I gave him the order. I told him that I would supply the relevant coordinates after speaking with you. Well, Shavir said, becoming uncertain too, more and more aware of the uncertainty in Altea's voice. That's good, isn't it? No. No? He resigned from the Tarazat Navy with an immediate effect and said some things about the Emperor. I won't repeat them here. So you are refusing to deliver the spacecraft? It's more complicated than that. The spacecraft will bring me to any coordinates you choose. It will then deliver me into your custody, and it will depart. It has been programmed with this mission and is loath to deviate from it or waste time. Shavir didn't speak for a long time. Her expression spoke of thunder and bad tidings, but she kept her voice calm as she gave the coordinates. I'll see you soon, Altea said. Shavir said nothing. She took one long look around and then simply cut the connection. She's angry with me, Altea said. Do you know where those coordinates relate to? Yort asked. Yes, Altea said. Can you bring up that hologram of the galaxy again and zoom in on Tarazat space? The hologram appeared and zoomed into the area that Altea had shown Yort was Tarazat territory. She pointed and the map zoomed in again around her finger. It kept zooming until she was pointing at Seat of Reason. I don't have any records of an astral body in that location, Yort said, and none is predicted to have moved to that point. Doesn't surprise me, Altea said absently. It's a habitat, an artificial structure. The science ministry towed a nice big asteroid there and scooped it out. Wait, are you telling me that you have a detailed map of the entire galaxy hidden away in your memory cores? I don't use memory core technology, but yes, and it seems to be a little out of date. The entire galaxy, at this level of detail, how is that possible? Altea, Yort said, changing the subject, are you sure you want to make your home with this woman Shivir? She does not seem to be happy to have you returned. I don't know. Then shall we go to the coordinates to provide you with more information? Yes, that's a good idea. We are underway. It's obviously a trap, Knave said when she told him, and I say we give these coordinates a wide berth. That is not an option, Yort said. My mission is to return you all, including Altea, home. She thinks these coordinates may be her home. It is my duty to take her there, so that she can find out. I can leave you at a safe location in the meantime, if you believe the mission is unacceptably risky. No, Knave said. I'll come along, of course. Why, thank you, Altea said. They were all sitting in the recreation area, seated around a hexagonal table. Each at one side, with a free side between them, nobody sitting together. At the centre of the table, hovering just above the surface, was a hologram of the Science Ministry base, created according to what Altea could remember, meaning it was more than a little rough and inaccurate. This hologram of the base is useless, Knave said. Why don't you go into her mind, like Rort did, with me, and just pull the information out? There is a problem, Yort said. Rort is a more powerful intelligence than me, and I lack many abilities that it possesses. 
We are within Tarazit space, Jay said. We have access to their communications net. Why don't we just hack our way into wherever a good map of the Seat of Reason is kept and download it? Then we can make our plans at our leisure. What plans? Knave snorted. There are three of us, and there will be an armada of Tarazat ships waiting for us, loaded with marines, drones, droids, cyborgs, genetically engineered soldier primates, you name it. They'll have it, and they'll all be pointing their guns at us. I don't believe that, Altia said. It's not Shavir's style. Do you really think she'll be fine with us flying in there? to this seat of reason place, taking up position in a drop-off zone, waving goodbye to you and sailing off on our way, I just don't buy it, Knave said. Look at this thing. It ran rings around a buzzer swarm that had just frightened off the pride of the Tarazat deep space fleet. She's going to want this spaceship. She needs this spaceship to win the Emperor's war for him. Stop bickering, guys, Jay said. The truth is that we don't know what will be waiting for us, and we can't ask Altia to just forget about returning to her loved ones, her family, and her colleagues. So we'll just have to play it by ear. Play it by ear, Nave snorted. That's the plan. Play it by ear. I guess so, Altia said, rose from the table, and left the room. This is difficult for her, Jay said. She's probably got a lot of people waiting for her, unlike you and me. People who give a damn about her and who she loves. Has she mentioned if there is some special guy or girl? No, Knave said. He hadn't considered if Altia might have a sweetheart back home, and the thought that she might, he was surprised to find, was unwelcome. Let's take her home, Jay said and see if they welcome her back with open arms. All right, Knave said, let's play it by ear. But I would feel an awful lot more comfortable if we had some weapons and armour. I've been keeping an eye out on my walks around the ship. I think I know the place pretty well by now, and I think I've seen most of it, but I haven't seen anything that looked like a weapon. Sure, Jay said but would you even know what drifter armour and weapons look like? I guess not. Let me help you, Jay said. Do we have armour and weapons, Yort? We do. Well, all right, Knave said. We might come out of this alive after all. Can we take a look at them? Of course, Yort said. Follow the line. The usual illuminated line appeared in the decking. Nave and Jay both got slowly up from the table and started walking in the direction indicated. They left the recreation area via one of the hexagonal doors and walked along various corridors. I've been to this part of the ship quite a bit, Nave said after a while, but I haven't been able to even guess what all these chambers are for. Could be anything, Jay said. I guess Rort only customised a small section back there for us. Apart from that, the spaceship must be some standard design, but adapted. Sounds reasonable, Knave said. But I didn't see anything but empty rooms down this way. Nothing like the racks back on the original Galaxy Dog. It was just a shitty dropship carrier, but it had rack upon rack of drones, armour and weapons enough to create a formidable fighting force. I would have noticed if there was anything like that down here. Just follow the line, Jay said. Then he produced a strange growling stuttering noise, like a predator animal delighting in a kill. What was that noise? Knave asked. That was me laughing through this strange alien voice box I have now. It's taking some getting used to, and I have no idea how to modulate the sounds it produces better. This is it, Knave said, as the line took them through a smaller than usual hexagonal aperture, a doorway only big enough for one of them to duck through at a time. The walls were bare, apart from symbols and protrusions of the usual abstract and mysterious technological devices. It was all the usual mix of bronze and gold. Like I said, 
Knave exclaimed. Empty. It does look a little empty, Jay said, but there might be some secret compartments, or what have you. I'll go get Altia. She's the only one who can read these symbols. Knave nodded absently as Jay left the room, then went over to the wall furthest from the little hexagonal entrance. He put his hand against the wall and saw a change. A hexagonal pattern was dimly and slowly illuminated by a glowing golden tracery of lines. Knave snatched his hand away and stood back. He had held his hand against the walls of the spaceship numerous times without being met with more than momentary and very local patches of luminescence. This was much bigger than he had seen before. He put his hand back in position and saw the hexagonal pattern appear again. Interesting, he said. He didn't know what to do next. He didn't know what the hexagons meant. He counted them for want of something better to do. There were thirty of them, some slightly larger, some slightly smaller. Yort, he yelled. Yes, the growling tone of the alien computer voice answered. What are these hexagons? You have an interface. The information about how to use this provisioning system is being supplied to you. Is it? Yes. In what form? Sense impressions, the ship's computer said. That is not an entirely accurate translation, but very close. It should help you to comprehend the principle. I'm not sure it does. Knave mumbled. There was a silence. Could you try again to explain to me how this process of provisioning me with sense impressions might work? All right, Yort said. It's the same process we used to take information out of your brain to help us with translations of your language, but in reverse. Oh, Knave said. So I just have to open my mind and the information will come? That is much simplified, but essentially correct. And the information is still coming, Knave said. I can access it now. It is constantly available. You can summon a description of any machine whenever you require. Knave closed his eyes. His arm was already getting tired, but he tried his best to ignore it. He investigated his own mind, trying to find out anything unusual. And there was something, though he wasn't sure if he was imagining it. There was a rushing sensation at his temples. As he concentrated on it and tried to work it out, the rushing sensation intensified, like his brain was on an island of calm between two speeding flows of traffic. The more he concentrated, the closer the flows encroached on the island of calm, until at last they converged and engulfed his brain. He immediately fell unconscious. He came round to find Altea cradling his head. He was lying on the floor, and with his hand no longer in contact with the wall, the hexagonal pattern had disappeared. What happened? Altea asked. Knave saw Jay standing a step or two away, allowing him space, giving him air. I dipped my toe in the drifter information stream, Knave said. I think I almost short-circuited my mind. What are you talking about? I saw some hexagons when I touched that wall. Knave pointed it to the wall, and Jay went over to it and placed his hand against it. The hexagon pattern from before slowly appeared in luminous gold lines. Pretty, Jay said. But I couldn't get the hexagons to do anything else, Knave went on. So I asked Yort. It told me to open my mind and I could access some kind of instruction manual. I opened my mind and ended up flat on my ass. You can't access information, Altea said, via a purely mental connection. That's not possible. It's tantamount to magic. Knave's head was still resting in Altia's lap, and he was in no hurry to move it. It felt real, he told her. These hexagons are real, 
Jay said, but it just seems to be some sort of pattern on the wall. Yort said it was a machine for provisioning. Provisioning? Altia said. That's right, and Yort brought us here when we asked for weapons. Weapons? That's right, Nave said. What do you need weapons for? Altia let his head fall to the floor as she stood up and took a step away from him. Nay felt a little silly lying on the floor now, so he clambered to his feet. Because you told Shavir about my little resignation speech. It seemed sincere, Altia said weakly. I didn't think you meant it to be kept secret. I don't, Nave said. I'm done with Tarazat. What has the Empire ever done for me except make me risk my life and kill people in exchange for food, and terrible food at that? But I'm also under no illusions about how long they will hesitate before blowing me away and taking Galaxy Dog. So you want to fire on Tarazat forces, Altia said. You two were in here looking for weapons. Right, Jay said, then waved at some hieroglyphics. But we couldn't read any of this, so I went to fetch you. And this is when you stumbled on the data stream? Altia asked. Yes, Nave said, his eyes intense. It's right there. Just close your eyes and it will reveal itself to you. Altia and Nave kept arguing, but Jay cut off the input from his optical sensors and looked for the new source of input Nave had told about and found it. It was such a huge bandwidth of information that it actually started to slow him down. Processing power was redirected from less essential operations to help cope with the load. Jay froze in the end, becoming a statue as data kept pouring in from the new channel. Then, three minutes later, he started moving again, went directly over to the wall and touched it, watching as the hexagonal pattern appeared. Then he simply angled his hand to force the bottom of one of the hexagons inward. A depression formed as the metal of the wall deformed to accommodate his fingers giving him enough purchase to pull the hexagon out and open a long, thin drawer. The drawer contained racking, with item after item held snugly in place, side by side. Jay reached in and pulled out one of the items. He held it up to get a good look at it. It looked like some kind of building material. It was just a bronze block with gold inlay looking hardly more complex than a block of wood. It had roughly the dimensions of a data pad, a small one that could be slipped in a pocket, but thicker, more robust looking. Altia and Nave were ignoring him, still arguing. You really plan to shoot Tarazat forces? Altia said, horror in her voice. I don't plan on it, Nave said defensively. I've spent a lot of my life as part of Tarazat forces. But realistically, if it's a choice between them and me, how can you think that the Tarazat government will use violence against us? Altia asked. How can you not? Jay decided it was time to interrupt. This, the robot held it up, is a weapon and now I know how to operate it. How? Nave asked. Place your hand like so, covering these two marks here, and it scans the hand to configure a handle for me. The weapon unfolded into the robot's spidery fingers, forming an open cage to enclose his delicate hand. And then it extrudes a muzzle. The gun carried on with its folding motions of reconfiguration, small plates sliding over and under each other, parts twisting and deforming until a muzzle formed. Now just point and shoot, Jay said, followed by his disturbingly predatory laugh. Throw me one of those, will you? Nave said. I want to see how it works. Jay reached into the drawer, retrieved a block, and tossed it to Nave. Nave caught it and placed his hand in the way Jay had shown him. The weapon reconfigured, but based on Nave's more robust human hand, 
it made a closer approximation to whatever he recognised as a gun. The muzzle was heavier and the grip sturdier. What does it do? Knave asked, hefting it. Is it a blaster or a mass driver or something else? I'm not sure, the robot said. Should we fire one off to find out? Are you nuts? Knave yelled. This is powerful alien technology. For all we know, you might take out half the galaxy dog. Then we make planet fall, Jay suggested, and shoot up the place. Tempting, Knave said. Is there a holster for this in here? Jay peered inside and then looked back at Knave. Doesn't look like it. It'll fit in my pocket. Knave dropped it into his pocket and it had turned back into a small block of seemingly inert metal almost the instant it left his hand. It happened so quickly that it took him by surprise. He slipped his hand into his pocket to pick it up again and it instantly turned into its gun form and nuzzled into his hand. The transformation was much quicker than the first time when it had slowly configured itself to his needs. He dropped it back into his pocket again, marvelling at how quickly and precisely the transformation happened. Ships meeting, Knave said. Ships what? Altia asked, hostility plain to hear in her voice. Meeting, Knave said. We're all here, time is of the essence, and I'm calling a meeting. Let's all go and find a table to sit round. All right, said Jay. He followed Knave to the nearest room with a table, and Altea came reluctantly afterward. They found a hexagonal table, and each sat at one side, each separated by an empty side. Well, out with it, Altea said, almost as soon as they were seated. What's this all about? I'd like to suggest that we wait for a few days before appearing at the seat of reason. We need to know what all this new technology we have access to does. We need to practice using it all a little bit to avoid unpleasant surprises if there is a difference of opinion with Shavia, in case we have to leave in a hurry. Actually, Altia said, I would really like more time here for research. I feel like I'm making breakthroughs every day and I feel like I'm being gotten rid of. It's all too fast. Then just stay, Knave suggested, and we can forget about Tarazat and Shavir. But also I can't just turn my back on humanity, she said, not like you. I understand that, Knave nodded. I've been thinking, Jay said. Why does Altia have to choose? She could study the galaxy dog and be based here as a scientist, but go home and see her folks and the other people she cares about. You know, at the weekend. We can suggest it to Shavir, Knave said. See if we can work out some kind of deal like that. But Shavir isn't the only one we have to think about. There are military types too. Even the Emperor is probably taking an interest. And do either of you really think they are going to be at all okay with this? No, Altia said. Perhaps... It seems sensible to try and come up with some contingency plans. That's what I'm talking about, Knave said. Yort, would you be agreeable to waiting a short time before we make an appearance at the seat of reason? I can agree to a delay of nine days. Nine days, Jay said. That's quite specific. Why nine days? The damage we sustained in our escape was extensive and we are not yet at complete readiness for action. It will take nine days for us to reach complete readiness. That settles it, Jay said. And Yort? Yes. Could you find us a nice uninhabited planet that we can use to familiarize ourselves with these guns and test their capabilities? Computing, Yort said. It will require two hours to arrive at the nearest likely planet. Then let's go, Knave said. There is one thing, Altia said. How are we going to get down to the surface? What do you mean? Knave asked. He looked at Jay. Have you found a shuttle bay in your wanderings of the spaceship? Is that what she's asking? Jay said. 
No, he said, then looked vaguely upwards, as he did when he wanted to talk to Yort. Yort, how do we get down to the planet's surface? There doesn't seem to be a shuttle. A shuttle is not required, Yort explained. The galaxy dog can be brought into the lower atmosphere of a planet, and the crew can then be teleported to any destination within a ten-mile radius of the ship's position. Teleport? Altier shrieked. Are you kidding me? That's preposterous. It's a difficult technology, Yort admitted, and is not to be trusted for long-range jumps. But it is a very good solution for short-range transfers to a planetary surface. By the very powers, Altier said. That is impressive, Jay said. Chapter 22 I don't like the idea of teleportation, Nave said. If they pull me apart and reconstitute me at the other end, how do I know the new me won't be like my evil twin or something? You've been watching too many entertainments, Altea smiled. Now choose a hexagon and stand under it. She had dived into the Drifter information flow and found out everything she could about Drifter teleportation technology. She had led the other two to the teleportation chamber and was now giving them their instructions. Nave looked confused, so she pointed at a cluster of glowing hexagons in the ceiling of the room. The hexagon is up there, Altea pointed. You stand under it here. Jay, you stand here, and I'll stand here. There are enough hexagons for a big landing party, Jay noticed. OK, off we go, Altea said, and she gave a mental command, which was then relayed to Yort through her interface. Suddenly, all three of them were standing in sand. The galaxy dog hung there above them in the sky, resting on its gravitic drives and casting a shadow on the desert sands. You know, Jay said, if that spaceship suddenly got it into its head to fly away, we would be in deep, deep trouble. Altea looked around and nodded. The planet that Yort had found was uninhabited, but it was plain to see that it hadn't always been that way. They had seen the ruins of a planetary society scattered around the planet's surface from orbit. It looked to Altea like some primitive culture had caused a greenhouse effect and wiped itself out. She saw signs that the planet had had a much more pleasant climate, but now it was all deserts and baked mudflats. Let's not try and stay here long, Altea said. It's depressing. I know. Nave said. The desert sand dunes they were standing atop had invaded what looked like it had once been some sort of industrial complex. The dunes were surrounded on three sides by industrial structures and were open to the desert behind. OK, Jay said, it's time to shoot some stuff. I'm going to shoot that tower thing over there. He grabbed his block from a kind of holster that he had designed and attached it to his right leg. The block instantly transformed into a gun and he aimed it at the tower. It had taken them a long time, immersed in the drifter data stream, to discover the secrets of pulling the trigger. It required the hand to be in position, on the grip, but the gun was fired with the mind. All right, Jay said, I'm painting a mental target and I'm firing. There was a high-pitched squeal as some basic underpinning of physics was twisted and distorted and simultaneously there was a muzzle flash, like a little intense prism of energy which appeared a few centimetres from the muzzle of the gun. Then the tower recoiled like it had been hit by a car. A cloud of dust was kicked up as sand that had settled on its upper surfaces was thrown in the air, and there was damage too. The energy projected by the gun, whatever it was, left a twisted and scorched hole in the thick metal about the size of a human torso. Not bad, Jay said. I guess that sort of range and damage is comparable to a mass driver. 
I'd say so, Nave said, but in a much smaller package. The technology is certainly very advanced, Altea said. Have a few more goes, Jay, and then one of us will take a turn to practice. But remember, this equipment is only a contingency. Why don't I just pick something over that way to shoot up, Nave asked. Then we can both get some practice at the same time. Let's be methodical and scientific about this, guys, Altea chided. These are advanced weapons and have to be treated with respect. No problem, Jay said. I'm already starting to feel a little more respect for this thing. For my next shot, I'll aim slightly above the previous impact point. The industrial tower reverberated again, shot after screeching shot accompanied by thundering explosions. Then Altea took a turn, then Nave, then back to Jay, and on and on. They didn't move position much, staying atop the dune, but making sure they stayed in the shadow cast by Galaxy Dog as the sun tracked across the sky. Soon the industrial complex around them was peppered with scorch marks, holes, debris and other damage. It's quite easy to make a big mess very quickly with a weapon as powerful as this, Knave murmured. Nobody saw fit to answer him, each of them silently considering the implications of what he had said. How about we move on to testing the armour, Altea suggested. All right, Knave said but I'm a little confused by the terminology here. Is this armour, or is it an energy shield? He reached into one of the hexagonal crates they had brought with them and picked out a hexagonal piece of metal. What are we calling this again? he asked. An armour badge, Jay reminded him. That symbol on the surface is the symbol for armour, I think. But I agree, Altier admitted. I don't see how something so small could constitute armour. It must most probably project an energy shield. Only one way to find out, Jay said. He reached into a hexagonal crate and pulled out one of the armour badges, just like the one Knave was holding. Then he emptied the rest of the contents of the crate into one of the other crates. He walked across the dunes to the tower he had been using for target practice. It was so full of holes now that its architectural integrity had been compromised and it was leaning slightly to the south. Jay found a likely-looking spot and wedged the crate in between some pipes so it wouldn't topple over. He then held the armour badge loosely against the front of the crate. He had been practising the next part. They all had, where he gave the mental command to tell the badge to protect. The badge responded instantly and adhered snugly to the side of the crate, allowing Jay to let go of it. He walked slowly back over to where the other two were standing. One of his glowing red facial sensors flared bright for a fraction of a second, then went dead for half a second, then came back to life. What was that? Nave asked. Are you okay? Altea asked, though her voice wasn't quite as concerned as Nave's. That, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, was a wink. Jay spun round, drawing his block gun as he spun. His shot was on target, and there was the usual muzzle flash, screeching noise, and thunderous impact. When the dust cleared, they saw that the pipes holding the crate were busted and warped, but the crate was still snugly in place, except it didn't look like a crate, it now looked something like an insect. They looked at each other, then back at the crate, as the insectile armour panels folded slowly away, back down to the original, impossibly small hexagon. With the armour panels folded away, the crate was revealed to view again. Well, by the powers, Nave said, it is armour. Works great against block guns, Altea said. Jay, could you grab Nave's fancy blaster and see how it copes with a shot or two from that? With pleasure, Jay said, letting his block gun fall into the little holster on his leg. Throw me that thing, will you, Nave? What were we just saying about treating weapons with respect? Nave grumbled.
I'm not throwing any blasters anywhere. He went to one of the crates and extracted the blaster he had been issued back on Ice Tomb. He took it over to Jay and presented it to him. Jay took the gun, shouldered it, and fired in one smooth movement. If he had been hoping to catch the alien protective device by surprise, he was destined to be disappointed. When the sand kicked up by the blaster fire had cleared, there was the insectile armor. It waited a few seconds more before folding itself away. Impressive, Altea murmured. We need to analyze the footage we're getting to see just how quick that thing reacts. It seems to be quicker than a blaster, Jay said, which makes it something akin to magic. Let's see how it copes with two attackers, Nave said. You ready, Jay? Sure. They both started firing and then kept on firing, both of them on rapid-fire settings. It took almost half a minute to drain the blaster's capacitor and make it pause to recharge. Knave's block gun was still firing, but he stopped along with Jay, curious to see what damage, if any, they had wrought. What would a fusillade like that do to that fancy armour I first saw you in? Altea asked Knave, while the dust cleared. Just for comparison, half a minute of direct firing like that, if we count the alien pistol here as a mass driver, would have chewed it up pretty good, Knave said. It was hardly a scientific description of the damage he expected to see, but Altea thought she understood. The wearer would be unlikely to survive, she surmised. The dust is clearing. I can see it now, Jay said. Looks a bit beat up. Really, Altea said, I was half expecting it to be invulnerable. But what Jay had said was true. She could now see the armour, and it was missing some armour plates, mostly on the right where most of the fire it had taken was from Knave's alien block gun. But the blaster had left its marks too. She walked over to the unfortunate crate to get a better look. The question is, she said, would a human have survived that, if they'd been wearing this armour? Well, Knave said, following her, a human wouldn't have just stood there. A human would have dived for cover. True, Altea said. She inspected the crate as the armour folded away. It's been scorched and suffered blunt trauma, she said, surveying the damage to the crate with her scientific eye but I don't think this amount of damage would necessarily be fatal. It would sure hurt, Jay said as he came up behind them. Knave laughed. Altea ignored them and drew her block gun from a holster she had created for herself, hidden away unobtrusively under her jacket. Her gun took on pretty much the same configuration as Knave's. Whoa, Knave said. Is that safe to use from this range? The thing does damage like a mass driver. My feeling is that it is, she said, aiming. Feeling? Knave gulped. Altea was surprised because even aiming a weapon at such close range didn't trigger the armour. It seemed to be waiting for her to shoot, almost daring her to shoot. She sent the mental command. There was a muzzle flash, sand flew, there was a huge clang as the armour deployed and took the full force of her shot from point-blank range. She shot again and again and again, sending plates of armour flying, surrounding both her and her target in a cloud of sand. The air reverberated with screeching shots and thundering impacts. After three seconds of firing, there was silence. And when the dust cleared, there was nothing left of the crate and its armour except smoking debris. Altea put her block gun away and turned to look at Nave and Jay. Well, she said, I think we've learned everything we're going to here. Why don't we go back to the spaceship? Altea looked up in the direction of Galaxy Dog and pointed to herself. Then she seemed to go out of focus, while the world around her stayed sharp, and then she was gone. All right, Nave mumbled, signalled to the spaceship, and was teleported away as well. Jay was left standing by the destroyed armour and crate. 
Typical humans, he said to himself. They get bored so easily. He went back to stand on the sand dune, surrounded by open crates and destruction. He drew his block gun and continued practicing. He chose targets at random among the surrounding structures, firing shot after shot. When he finally teleported up, Altea and Nave had both gone to bed, so Jay was alone. He left the teleportation room and went to the bridge. He rarely used his room, as he had no need of it. He wasn't particularly interested in possessions and didn't need sleep. He was more interested in information and he could access that from anywhere on the spaceship. He knew that Nave had pretty much given up on accessing the Drifter information flow, even though he had some kind of aptitude for it. Altea persevered, but she had so many other things vying for her attention that she didn't spend as much time with the data as she wanted to either. It was Jay that spent the most time in the information stream. He sat for hours in his acceleration couch, just letting the information flow through him. It had layers, he discovered, a superficial surface of help menus and instruction manuals and the like. But below those layers were progressively deeper and deeper layers of abstraction and complexity. It wasn't a static thing like a database. It was in constant motion. It flowed, though he had no idea why. He would have to ask Altea if she knew of anything that might explain it. Whatever the reason, it was the flow that made accessing the information difficult and dangerous. He would start by dabbling a mental toe into the flow, discovering a ship's schematic or a tutorial on using the gunnery console. But there were undertoes and rapids even in these shallows. There were hyperlinks that would drag him down to the very deepest layers of complexity and abstraction. Jay dove in, starting with information about the warp drives, simple instructions about how to initiate a maintenance routine. Then he was dragged away to ideas about prioritizing automatic maintenance, then to the different priorities of maintenance versus repair, snatching at information at every turn, then he was being taught about nanotechnology and its use in automatic repairs, then nanoscale organizational theory, then ideas about how order emerges from chaos, and then into dark places he didn't understand. He was immersed in the information now, but no sunlight was penetrating from the surface. It was just symbols and vectors, a forest of semiotics, and then, between the trees of the forest, he saw space, and, inhabiting the space, he saw monsters. They were dark shapes like the creature they had seen on the moon, on Ice Tomb. He swam away from the creatures, following link after link, looking for simplicity, searching for understanding, striving for the superficial surface layers. He emerged. His senses came back online, making him wonder when they had shut off. His head snapped up. He was aware of his surroundings again. If he was human, he would have gasped for air, but instead he slowed down his memory access and processing speeds, dumping heat from his processing core. From his head came the whine of fans and click of heat sinks. Yes, he said. That's a head rush. He accessed his internal system checks and was amazed at the amount of new data that had been written to his memory. I have a lot of new data, he said. Are you speaking to me? Yort asked. No, Jay muttered. But I was just in the data stream. I'm worried I'm going to fill up my memory. I didn't think that was possible. I have a lot of memory. I would advise against trying to save the data stream to your memory, Yort warned. Why? It is infinite, Yort explained. It is a living thing that expands to fill whatever container is provided for it. I don't understand. 
There is no precise translation into your language, Yort said, and the concepts are quite complex. But you have a copy. Not a copy, Yort corrected, a seed. The seed constantly grows and dies to provide the information you need. Could you give me a seed? I could, Jay, gladly, but... Yes? But you could not run the seed. Special architecture is required. A structure the size of this spaceship is a minimum requirement to achieve a mere shadow of the true information flow. At least with our level of technology. More technological advanced cultures may be able to miniaturize the process. Who knows? Are there more advanced cultures? Many, Yort said. And they are much more advanced. I like talking to you, Jay said. You give me the heebie-jeebies. I also enjoy your company, Yort said. Who designed your neural net? It is unusual. The designer was a soldier, Jay said. She was a genius, condemned to work in logistics. Such a waste. They were finally at the coordinates parked within an astronomical unit of the Seat of Reason. They had a really good view of it on the bridge, filling the view screen and floating as a hologram in the centre of the bridge. Then the hologram of the Seat of Reason faded to be replaced by Shavir in glowing holographic form. You've arrived, Shavir said. That's good. Have you managed to persuade the captain to hand over the spaceship he took as a prize? There is a considerable reward, enough to change his life completely. This is the captain, Altia pointed at Nave. I suppose you should be addressing questions like this to him. There are no captains on this ship, Nave said. Well, Shavir said, if you aren't the captain, what should I call you? You can call me by my name, which is Nave. We've been introduced. Yes, I remember. Well, Nave, I don't think it is any secret that we here at the Science Ministry think it would be best for Tarazat if this valuable find was studied by professionals. Don't you agree? The thing is, Nave said, I don't care what is best for Tarazat. I see, Shavir said. Typical. Jay gave Nave a thumbs-up gesture to show his approval, but it looked strange with his long mechanical digits, more like he was giving him the finger. Nave did his best to ignore the robot. Altia, Shavir said, turning her attention back to the flight couch where Altia was sitting. Have you also decided that you don't need Tarazat anymore and that Tarazat doesn't need you? Hardly, Altia said. Would I be here if I didn't think there might be a place for me in Tarazat society? A place? Shavir said. My dear girl, you have made one of the most important discoveries in drifter studies since the drifter object itself was discovered. I can only imagine the data you have been collecting aboard a fully functional artifact of drifter technology. You will most probably get my job as head of the science ministry. Altia turned to look at Nave, her eyes dancing at the praise from her mentor. That does sound good, Altia said. Yeah, great, Nave rolled his eyes. Let's get together, Shavir said. Have a chat, face to face, and see if we can't sort this all out. Bring Nave with you if you like, and I'll see if I can persuade him to take the prize money on offer and retire into a life of leisure. We can even promote him to some honorary rank, admiral perhaps, and give him a medal. The prize money on this spaceship will buy him his own little planetoid where he can live like a king. He'll give in eventually. He'll take the money and run. Then we can share in all the discoveries to be made by examining this marvellous ship. Nobody said anything in reply. So come on over, Shavir said. Whenever you feel ready, I've cleared my diary for the next couple of days. You can use Shuttle Bay 4. 
We're keeping it clear of normal traffic, so you can fly on in whenever you like. Actually, Altia said, we don't have a shuttle. Shavir's eyebrow rose. Well, she said, can't be helped. We can send a little shuttle over for you. Just give us the approach details for whatever shuttle bay the spaceship has and we'll come to you. Altia turned to Nave. Well, I guess, he said, if you trust her and if this is what you want. It is, Altia said. We'll contact you soon, she said to Shavir, with the approach details for a shuttle. Great, Shavir said. See you soon. The line went dead, and the hologram of Shavir was replaced by the hologram of the Seat of Reason. It looked even more mysterious now, the gently tumbling rock with protrusions and accretions of technology. It looked like something that had grown from a bad seed. Nave looked over at Altia, but her thoughts were hard to read. Probably not as gloomy as his own, he guessed. I think that was very successful, Yort said. I have approach vectors for a shuttle already computed. But there is still time to change your mind and stay with us. And, Jay said, there is still time for you to change your mind, Nave. Did you hear what she said about prize money, enough to buy a planet? That's not to be sniffed at. It doesn't interest me, Nave said, and I wouldn't trust them as far as I could spit them. The chances of anybody from the Tarazat government ever voluntarily giving a bunch of cash to the likes of me is vanishingly remote. Send the details, Altia said. Well, okay, Nave said. Where are they going to be docking? They'll be docking at the forward bay, Yort said. They all knew where that was now, almost instinctively. They had all dabbled in the streams of drifter data that the interface gave them access to, and however overwhelming that data was, however much it felt like a blur and that they weren't learning anything, they somehow knew more and more about drifter technology, including the layout and functions of the Galaxy Dog. That's a good choice as any, Jay said. There is a shuttle launch from the asteroid, Yort said. The view on the giant screen zoomed in, and they saw a sleek little spaceship moving out into space on gravitic drives. Shuttle my ass, Nave said. That's a gunship, and not a small one. It looks like a Zenta 50, something like that. I've been moved on them. They can hold two teams of special forces in power armour. I'm having difficulty building up a picture of the layout and occupants of the craft, Yort said. Shielded from sensors, Jay said. Why didn't she just send a little grav car? Altia asked. I've never travelled to the seat of reason on a shuttle like that. The question was left hanging in the air. They were all wondering if Shavir had already broken their agreement in some way, but... It had to be admitted that the craft they were watching did fit the broadest interpretation of a shuttle. It might not have been a comfortable and inviting grav car, but it was more than capable of ferrying people to and from the space station. How long before they reach us? Jay asked. They will arrive in the docking bay in ten minutes, Yort said. This is just great, Nave said. He reached into a pocket and found his armour badge. He pushed it to his chest as directly over his heart as he could manage and gave it the mental instruction to protect him. He felt it adhere reassuringly to his skin. It's amazing how quickly you get used to this technology, Nave said. You said it, Jay said, pushing an armour badge to his chest and drawing his block gun. Wait! Altia said, we don't know for sure that there are soldiers aboard that transport. It's not a transport, Nave said, it's a gunship. The docking bay was bare, like the rest of the technology of the ship, 
But now that it was powering up to receive a visitor, it was scrawled over in gold lines, mostly following the usual hexagonal pattern, but including other elements too. They were not in the bay, but nearby, observing via a view screen. We can wait here and see what emerges, Altia said. That just seems sensible, but I'm sure it's an unnecessary precaution. The shuttle is nearing us, Yort said. If we are going to allow them access to this spaceship, then now would be the time to open the door. Just a minute, Yort, Nave said. Rort was always very pleased to do stuff for whoever asked. Is it going to be the same way with you? No, my designer included only instructions to aid you three. I will not do anything to aid these newcomers unless you tell me to. The door turned out to be a huge hexagonal section of the spaceship's nose. The hexagon split into triangles, and then each triangle retracted to allow access to the bay. The gunship was gliding towards the opening on gravitic engines, and Nave could see a big mass driver in the nose and blasters along the wings. It didn't actually need the wings because it was never intended to enter an atmosphere, so the wings, stubby and malicious, were added to the design only as another place to put weapons. The gunship slid into the bay, extended a surprisingly delicate-looking undercarriage and settled in the centre of the space, dominating it. I've got a feeling that these might be the kind of guests that it is difficult to get rid of, Jay said. The main compartment of the gunship was slung below the wings and cockpit, like a distended belly. The belly ruptured as a large circular airlock popped open and a ramp was extended. Nave knew that the ramp was heavy and wide, easily capable of supporting two heavy drones exiting or entering at the same time. What he saw descending the ramp was possibly worse. They were special forces, wearing the most advanced armour cradling the most advanced weaponry and with a huge wealth of training and experience. Suddenly, his block gun and armour badge felt a little silly in comparison with the dark armour they were wearing, making each of them a towering and ominous presence. There were four of them, coming down the ramp. One of them projected a hologram from a device mounted on the shoulder of their suit. Shavir or at least her glowing hologram, flickered into existence among them. She took a good look around, then started speaking in no particular direction, hardly bothering to raise her voice, confident that her words would be heard. Altea, dear, she said, we're here to pick you up. Just pop down here to the shuttle bay and we'll head out. It'll be good to be among civilization again, won't it? I've changed my mind, Altea whispered to Nave and Jay. I'm not going down to the shuttle bay. I'm not going with them. I don't believe there is a place for me any more with the science ministry. Just make them go away. Nave looked at Jay, who looked back at Nave. You have to talk to them, Jay said. Patch me through, Yort, Nave said, then to the soldiers in the shuttle bay and their hologram leader. There's been a change of plan. We won't be able to accompany you today. Return to your craft and leave this place. We will contact you if and when we change our minds. The reaction from the docking bay was immediate. The hologram of Shavir faded, a resigned scowl on her face, and the gunship opened up with the mass driver in its nose and the blasters in its wings. How long will these doors hold? Nave asked. Seconds only, Yort said. I recommend that you persuade your guests not to fire their weapons. I'll persuade them, Altia said, drawing her block gun and heading in the direction of the docking bay. Nave and Jay followed immediately. Finally, Nave said. 
They were all jogging through the corridors, heading for the docking bay, and as they ran, they all yelled out instructions as ideas occurred to them. Close the exterior doors, Nave yelled. Get us out of here, Altia yelled. Go to warp as soon as you can, Jay yelled. Bay doors critical, Yort said. We're there, Altia said, raising her block gun to her preferred firing stance. They had reached the corridor that led into the bay. The doors were closed, but there were already holes in them, areas of molten metal and numerous dents and scratches. Then there was some movement through one of the holes, something small moving fast. It was only when Jay blasted it that Knave realised it was some kind of drone. Move, he said to Jay, pushing him behind some kind of giant pipe. Jay went where Knave pointed without hesitation. I hope this pipe isn't full of something flammable, he mumbled. And you, he said to Altia, other side of the door. She frowned, but she repositioned as he indicated, and Knave moved to stand beside her. More black shapes entered the corridor, small and fast, coming flying through the hole in the door, and Knave felt something like a slick of oil spread over him. What the he thought, and that thought was instantly transmitted to Jay, Altia, and Yort. He didn't know how he knew they heard his thought, but he knew they had. He could see Jay in front of him, and he could see the armour badge unfolding across the robot's chest. He could see Altia too, beside him in his peripheral vision, her armour unfurling around her to transform her into an elegant insectile queen. The armour even engulfed the gun she was holding out in front of her, leaving just a hole for the muzzle. Time has slowed for me, Jay said, but Knave hadn't heard his voice with his ears. He heard it with his mind. Me too, Altia said. Look at those grenades bursting against the wall. We are experiencing some extreme time dilation effects here. I can see the fireball of each grenade slowly spreading and the shrapnel flying. I don't get the feeling those grenades are a threat, Knave said. Then one of the troopers came bursting through the door, a new presence that Knave felt as a threat in a way he hadn't with the grenade. The trooper's reflexes had been tweaked. But no human, no matter the tweaks to their nervous system, could match the speed Knave and the others was capable of, taking advantage of the time dilation. The figure was already bringing its weapon on target as it jumped, the muzzle tracking towards Jay, after the figure in armour realised that the three of them had moved from the positions reported by the drone. Jay fired his block gun, hitting the figure's armour at the neck ring, forcing the wearer to stumble. The figure staggered to the far wall and slumped against it, rifle falling from armoured fingers. The other invaders were next in the sights of the block guns, and they were sitting ducks. They weren't able to compete with the sheer speed of Knave, Altia and Jay. Knave went through the same hole in the door that the hostile had appeared through, and found three surprised Special Forces operatives. He dodged to the right and shot one of them before they were even over their surprise. Then came Altia and Jay. By the time Jay was clambering through the hole, the hostiles had started firing, sending him staggering back into the corridor. You OK, Jay? Knave asked over their telepathic link. Still functioning, Jay replied. Oh shit, the one out here is still alive. I just got shot again. Ouch! And again! Nave and Altia had their adversaries in a crossfire and had soon gunned the remaining two down. But the last one managed to get a shot off that hit Nave full in the face. His head snapped back, his ears started ringing and everything went black. Shit, Nave's down! he heard Altia say over the telepathic link. But even though he could hear her, he couldn't answer. He didn't know why. Perhaps he was dreaming or unconscious. Stop messing around and get in here, Jay, he heard her yelling. Coming, he heard Jay answer. Clearly he had emerged victorious from his fight with the hostile out in the corridor.
Chapter 23 We have a problem, Reason said. I have lost contact with the Secure Lab structure. The entire structure? Yes, Reason said, sounding perplexed, and I am not currently able to isolate the cause of the problem. This could not have come at a worse time, Shavia said. She pointed at a wall of monitors in front of her. Each one showed the action in the shuttle bay on the alien spaceship from a different angle, from above, from the nose of the gunship, from the armor cameras of the Tarazet marines. I am sorry, Reason said, but I thought you should know immediately. Get me fellow, Shavia ordered. A hologram of her deputy appeared with them. What is happening at the secure complex? Shavia asked, dispensing with any pleasantries. The secure wards, fellow said. I don't know. My work hasn't taken me there in two days. Two days? Shavia was aghast. Take a detachment of marines and go investigate. I want a status report on every Z-human. As you command, fellow said. Her hologram flickered out, and Shavir could turn her attention back to the video from the shuttle bay. There were three insectile warriors, and they moved and reacted far quicker than any human. They had attacked her marines very vigorously. She had to admit that. But then one had been hit in the head, and her marines had been able to seek cover as the insects attempted to reach their fallen comrade and drag him out. Now a sort of stalemate had developed, where her marines fired from cover among the landing gear of the gunship, and the insects fired back using what was left of the landing bay door for cover. Shavir knew a little about military encounters, and she knew that a situation like that could last for hours until the stalemate was broken, which was all right with her. It gave her time to think. She had the Z-Human technology and the alien spaceship within her grasp, but both were showing signs of wanting to slip through her fingers. She had to be smart if she was going to end the day with both prizes. The most puzzling thing was the insects. She suspected that the insectile aspect of the three warriors was because of their armour, but what shape were they underneath? She wondered if Altir was one of the insect warriors, fighting alongside that brigand of hers, Knave. Altir was a very smart young lady, but if she thought she could hang on to a prize like the alien spaceship, against the might of the Tarazet deep space fleet, she was very much mistaken. And then, the alien spaceship was gone. All the video feeds were cut off, and the spaceship disappeared from the central video screen which had been showing it hanging in space. Where did it go? Shavir asked. It's accelerating fast, Reason said. Reacquiring. The spaceship was centred in the middle screen again, its drives glowing, but the feeds from inside the docking bay didn't come back. Get me the Admiral, Shavir barked. A hologram slowly materialised in the centre of the room. It was an older man, corpulent and wrinkled. He had a wide nose and flared nostrils. His hooded eyes, Shavir knew, hid a fierce intelligence, and he had an admirable lust for power. He opened his mouth to speak, but Shavir didn't give him the opportunity. How far away are you, Admiral? she interrupted. We're at maximum speed. That's not what I asked. Two minutes, the Admiral said. Are you seeing these images? Are you getting the telemetry? Yes, the Admiral said. We have the target craft in our sights. Can you catch it before it hits warp? Yes, the Admiral said confidently. It is faster even than we thought, but this trap is going to work. Suddenly, confusingly, Fellow was standing beside the Admiral. Shavir knew that to interrupt her meeting with the Admiral, it must be something important. Thank you, Admiral, Shavir said, and good luck. She killed the connection, and the Admiral, looking peeved at being dismissed so summarily, faded away. Fellow took a step forward. Shavir, you told me to gather the squad of marines, she said. Yes, Shavir said. 
to investigate the problem in the secure unit? Why was the woman going over this again? Shavir wondered. She was no simpleton. There are no marines, Felu said, her face concerned and confused. I don't understand, Shavir said. I'll send you a feed, Felu said. Shavir looked to her wall of monitors where numerous views could be seen of the passages and halls used by the marines. They were mostly bare rock, with the necessary equipment, bulkheads, light fittings, showers, sleep bunks, decontamination sprayers, hologram projectors, and innumerable other technological systems embedded in the rock. It was very spartan and dirty in comparison with the antiseptic white cladding of the science areas, and it was empty. There were no marines noisily hanging out in the rec room, nobody in the gym, and nobody practicing on the firing range. It's strange, Fellow said. The local systems show the marines being detailed team by team to the secure unit. Where did those orders come from? Shavir asked because they certainly didn't come from me. The orders originate, Fellow said, from the secure unit. Her face, slightly blue in the degraded hologram, looked confused. But, Fellow continued, nobody based in the secure unit has the authority to give those orders. We've been compromised, Shavir said. She paused for a second, considering her options. The seat of reason was immobile. However bad the situation got, it could be contained and recovered. The spaceship was escaping at extreme velocity. The spaceship took precedence, and the Zed humans would have to go on the back burner. All right, Shavir said. We'll have to investigate that more fully, but right now we've got an escaping spaceship to catch. Meet me at my personal launch. Shavir cut the connection and, without another word, walked from the room. She stalked through the short corridors to the docking bay that held her personal launch, the Raven, and a boarding ramp was extended for her as she entered the bay. She walked up the ramp and noticed that Fellow had come scampering round the corner and caught up with her. She went straight to the bridge, followed by her deputy. Raven, she called. Yes, Shavir, the ship's computer answered. Get us off this rock. The ship rocked gently as its gravitic drives engaged, levitating it through the giant airlock of the docking bay and out into space. Has the fleet arrived? Shavir asked. Yes, Shavir, Raven said. They have been in the system for some seconds now and are setting up a cordon to prevent the alien spaceship from jumping to warp speed. Excellent, Shavir said. The bridge of the Raven was large, and there was a lot of unused space with only two command couches. The couches were orientated towards a large window, surrounded by screens and holograms all showing units of the Tarazet Deep Space Fleet, or the alien spaceship itself. Take a seat, Shavir said to Felu. There was nothing to be seen through the window itself, as the hunt was happening much too far away. Get me reason, Shavir said. At once, Raven said. Almost immediately, a different voice could be heard, the voice of reason. I see you have decided to evacuate, Shavir, it said. Just a precaution, Shavir assured the base AI. It seems that you have an infestation in your innards. The base commander did warn you that the Zed subjects were an unknown quantity and could pose a hazard if brought within the seat of reason for study. We have no time for this, Shavir cut off reason. How many drones do you have available? Drones are not usually deployed within the seat of reason, the AI replied. There is usually no need. I'm aware of that, Shavir said. But the circumstances would seem unusual, would they not? You don't even know what is happening within your own secure centre. The AI didn't answer. Fellow shifted uncomfortably in her acceleration couch. What I propose, Shavir said, is sending a phalanx of drones down into the secure unit to see what's happening. I assume it is something unsavoury. I understand, the AI said. 
You will not be controlling the drones. The drones will be piloted remotely from here by Felu. We don't know how badly your systems have been compromised, and the less we rely on them, the better. The drones will be in action in minutes. Do not try to stop us. Shavir terminated the connection. Raven, she said, how many drones can you round up for us? There are five drones on the surface of the asteroid on routine patrol. That will be ample, Shavir said. Designate a lead drone and turn over operations to Fellow at her station. But I've never piloted a drone, Fellow said. It's all automated, Shavir chided her. Just tell it where to go, and if it asks for authorization to shoot, you say yes. Fellow looked aghast. Can you handle that? Shavir asked her. Fellow nodded weakly. Holographic screens and touch surfaces started to appear in the air around her. The largest of the screens said a friendly hello and promised to have her piloting her drone in under five minutes. Fellow gulped. Shavir at last turned her attention to the raven's main screen, the largest screen directly above the bridge main window. It showed the alien spaceship, its shields glittering as it sustained heavy fire. Shavir was surprised, but pleased, to see that the drifter ship wasn't returning fire. What's going on? she said to herself. Mortigan was wondering what was going on too. He was a technician in charge of environment systems on the Cutlass. The Cutlass was a corvette assigned to hold position near the Seat of Reason, in case the enemy spaceship decided to attack it. Nobody thought this was a likely outcome, and the Cutlass and all ship's crew were fully expecting to sit out the action without being involved in any way. In fact, instead of a tense space battle, things were very much normal aboard ship. Mortigan wasn't at all surprised to have to deal with the shuttle from the space station below. He watched it circle through the docking bay airlock, the only docking bay on the Cutlass, and was pleased that the automated systems worked perfectly. It was a slightly unusual shuttle, not one of the designs used by the battle group Cutlass was usually assigned to, and that could sometimes cause problems but the bay's systems seemed to be adjusting smoothly. It all looked so smooth, as he watched absently on a monitor, that he was surprised to be contacted by the shuttle complaining of a malfunction. A coolant hose wasn't attaching properly, they said. That seems unlikely, Mortigan mumbled. Coolant is one of the simplest systems in the bay. He went on down to the docking bay, putting on an environment suit as he went. He cycled through the interior airlock and walked up to the shuttle. The crew was still inside. They hadn't even bothered to come out and do a manual inspection. Typical, Mortigan grunted. He suspected that the hose had attached, but their systems hadn't recognised it. Hello in there, he hailed the shuttle. He was standing within a few metres of the little spaceship and he thought he could see movement in the cockpit. Hello, he said again. Again there was no answer. He took a couple of steps to get closer and squinted through the bridge windows. Definitely there was movement. If their communications were out, the shuttle might have worse trouble than Mortigan had thought. Just extend the access ramp, Mortigan yelled into his communicator. If you can hear me. The shuttle's cargo bay doors opened and an access ramp extended. Mortigan walked up directly into a cargo hold. The lighting seemed to be faulty, so he sent a handshake to the computer running the little spaceship and a request for schematics so he could go to the nearest systems hub and run some diagnostics. Nothing came back. I guess I'll just have to poke around until I find something, he mumbled to himself. He operated some controls on the wrist of his environment suit to deploy a flashlight from his backpack. It was mounted on a snake-like arm of articulated metal and was programmed with a simple routine to point where his eyes were looking. The faceplate of his environment suit 
monitored the position of his eyes and provided the information to the flashlight. Once deployed, it switched on and projected quite a powerful beam of light. Mortigan couldn't quite work out what he was looking at to begin with. He had been expecting an empty hold and was trying to decide where a good place to start looking for a system node would be, near the door or further away, so he wasn't at all prepared for what he actually saw. He saw teeth, he saw claws, he saw horrible grey skin, patches of it the colour of deck plating, and he saw technology, grafted messily among the flesh. It was the last thing he saw. Altea had almost reached Nave when she was driven back by the intensity of fire coming from the hostiles. Jay was being driven inexorably back too, just like her. As she was forced to seek cover behind a section of mangled docking bay door, she saw Nave snatched and dragged up the ramp into the gunship. With two members of the team dragging Nave and not firing, Altea and Jay were able to emerge again hitting the two remaining Tarazet marines that had been left to guard the ramp and were now also about to embark the gunship. Block gunfire sent them to the floor of the bay, smoking holes in their armour. Altea saw a small set of vanes deploy around the grav engine plates, the heat sinks. She immediately knew what it meant. The gunship was about to take off, whether the ramp was still deployed or not. She ran forward, yelling as she went. Come on, Jay, she yelled. We have to get to Nave before that ramp retracts. Everything was moving extremely slowly, or so it seemed to her, an effect of the time dilation provided by her super-advanced armour. But her advantage in speed was mostly reflexes. It wasn't much use in a foot race. Altea ran as hard as she could, realising that the armour she was wearing didn't have actuators and wasn't helping her at all. Perhaps the original wearers were so strong that they didn't need the help, but Altea with her human muscles was never going to catch the gunship. It was already clearing the airlock before Altea had run halfway across the docking bay. The realisation dawned on her that there was just no way she was going to make it, the distance between her and the gunship just kept on opening up, and worse, the nose turret was slowly tracking to point at her as the gunship backed out. She felt an impact in her side as Jay shoved her down to the floor of the bay. The shot from the massive mass driver in the gunship nose tore over their heads and gouged a huge divot of metal out of the bay wall. Roll, came a mental command. She was vaguely aware that it didn't originate in her own mind, but came from the AI brain of Jay, but she was just past caring about such feats of magic. She just rolled to the side, scrambled to her feet, and ran for some cover. Powers, she cursed. We lost him. No, we didn't, Jay said. Yort, transport him out of there. Attempting transport now, came Yort's voice. Attempting, Altea said, as her armour folded away. She watched dispassionately as Jay's armour underwent the same transformation. The panels of armour split apart and folded one after another until nothing was left but a small hexagonal badge on his chest. Time suddenly sped up. What had seemed glacial was now racing like a heartbeat. The target vessel is moving too unpredictably to achieve a successful teleportation. It is also accelerating fast and will soon be out of range, Yort said. Chase it! Disable its engines! Altea yelled. Make the teleport! I am not authorised for fire control, Yort reminded them. One of the crew will be required on the bridge for those duties. Also, attempting to shadow the gunship will mean we will be flying predictably, and this will expose us to increased enemy fire. The damage we sustain will be considerably worse. I'm on my way to the bridge, Altea said. Somebody has to do some shooting around here. As Altea ran for the bridge, she was almost thrown from her feet a couple of times. 
Yort hadn't been kidding when he said they would be exposed to more damage by chasing the gunship. Altia reviewed what she had learnt about the Galaxy Dog's weaponry. They had spent numerous hours in asteroid fields, firing weapon spreads and experimenting with different armaments. She knew the bigger guns on board would reduce the gunship to a small cloud of debris in a single shot, which would not be great for a successful teleport. She needed something with pinpoint accuracy, with enough punch to stop the gunship, but not so much that it was reduced to a cloud of exotic particles. The needle guns, she muttered, as she came round the corner onto the bridge and vaulted into her command position. She settled into the acceleration couch on its pedestal, surrounded by her monitors and control surfaces. The Galaxy Dog was flying too predictable a flight path, matching as best it could the movements of the gunship. It was taking an horrendous amount of incoming fire, entire surfaces were becoming denuded of armour, the raw structure of the spaceship exposed. Yort was flying the Galaxy Dog efficiently and well, turning damaged areas away from the worst fire, concentrating shields above bare patches, but it couldn't go on for long. They would soon run out of luck and be hit square by an energy beam or a rod of accelerated mass that couldn't be deflected or dissipated enough, and they would be undone. Come on, Altea, Jay yelled as he ran onto the bridge. Shoot! Altea fired the needle guns again and again, tearing away heat sinks and communications arrays from around the engines of the gunship, but not disabling the drives. Almost, Altea said. The bridge shook as they took more incoming fire, but Altea tried her best to ignore it, to concentrate on her prey, to line up her next shot. Gotcha, Altea said as she saw the shot tear into the small spaceship's thrusters, their shields powerless to stop them. The gunship was left floating predictably, unable to jink and swerve. Teleport lock achieved, Yort said, transferring. Nave is aboard ship. They felt a lurch as the Galaxy Dog was able to resume its own unpredictable flight plan. Altea jumped from her position and ran through the corridors to the teleportation chamber. Nave was slumped on the floor. She ran to him and checked his pulse, found it still beating, but he didn't look good. His face was swollen, his eyes blackened, and there were cuts on his arms. They looked fresh. She guessed the marines on the gunship had been trying to cut his armour away, and if they had marked his flesh, they had obviously been using very powerful lasers. Nave opened his bruised eyes. Welcome to the land of the living, Altea said. Nice to be back, Nave murmured weakly. Let's get you to sickbay, Altea said gently, though I'm not sure where it is yet. You'll be the first customer. No thanks, I'm not sleeping while the ship gets blown up by the cursed Terrazet deep space fleet. Nave struggled to his feet and headed for the bridge. Altea accompanied him, making sure to stay close in case he stumbled. Altea reached the bridge first and climbed back into her acceleration couch. She took over the big guns and left the medium armament to Jay. On her monitor, Shavir watched, transfixed. She saw the interior of the gunship, a team of marines, and the centre of the screen was empty. The insectile armour was gone. It had blurred, shimmered, and now it just wasn't there anymore. Teleportation, she whispered. Was that teleportation? That is absolutely impossible. Raven, get me the Admiral. We must have that ship at all costs. Back on Galaxy Dog, the sheer numbers of the enemy was starting to tell. There's no way through, Jay said. There are just too many of them. We're taking a lot of damage, Altea said. Nave came onto the bridge, clambering slowly up into his chair. We keep fighting, he said. Something will pop loose, it always does. We just have to keep fighting and keep our eyes open. Well, Altea said, 
If you're fit for duty, you might as well make yourself useful. Power up the needle guns and see if you can take out some of the smaller hostiles. I'm on it, Knave growled. There were a number of smaller hostiles, Knave saw, all nestled within the minimum range of the big guns, where Altea couldn't target them with the main armament, and even Jay on the medium guns couldn't reach. They were staying close, like a shoal of fish, and taking any opportunity they could when Galaxy Dog's shields fell to pepper the flanks of the bronze warship with fire. Usually, they minimised it, but they were doing real damage when they got the timing right. We'll have to do something about that, Knave said, and splayed his fingers out across the hieroglyphs of his fire control console. He only understood the bare bones of the system, little more than which hieroglyph was target and which was fire, but it was enough. He touched the targeting hieroglyph and felt a force like a monkey's fist grab his brain and squeeze. The pressure was connected to a strange alien symbol that appeared in front of his eyes, strange but recognisable as crosshairs. He used a combination of thought and twitching movements of his fingers to centre the alien gun sights of his needle weapons on one of the spaceships of the Tarazet fleet and then pressed the trigger button. On the flanks of Galaxy Dog, a battery of small turrets emerged from their bays and waved left and right, up and down, as they followed Knave's commands. Then, as the target was acquired, streamers of wafer-thin metal were projected at the target. Their impact force was almost pure velocity, and they tore at the target spaceship like a hailstorm. The target was a gunboat probably with a crew of four or five, if it even had a crew. Knave hoped it didn't. He hated Tarazet, but not the people actually doing the fighting, people like him. The hailstorm of metal needles tore the spaceship in half, smashing the two parts away in different directions and creating a cloud of debris. It was a small victory, just a drop in the ocean in comparison to the forces they were facing. Knave glanced at a tactical display, looking for the next target, and noticed something strange, near the seat of reason. Do you see that? he said. See what? Altea and Jay said in unison. There, Knave said. That spaceship is out of position. How do you know? Jay asked suspiciously. Trust me, Knave said. I've seen enough near-orbit deployments to know what they look like. The vessels in orbit don't usually bunch up like that. It's putting too many eggs in one basket. Means you can lose two ships to ground-based cannon instead of one. I think you're right, Altea said. And by bunching up, they've left a gap. There are fewer spaceships in the cordon at that point there. We'll only get one chance to try and break through their lines. We may as well make our attempt there. Put a long-range scanner view of the spaceship on main screen, Yort. The spaceship that was out of position appeared in the view screen, and something was clearly wrong. Its thrusters were lighting erratically as it followed a complex course. I can see the name, Knave said. Cutlass. All right, let's make a heading for the Cutlass. Did you hear that, Yort? Jay said. Computing route, Yort answered. If we have to ram the cutlass, Knave said, is that a course you can follow, Yort? That would be offensive manoeuvring, Yort said. I would expect that the manoeuvre would fail, based on my design and programming, possibly without warning and at an inopportune moment. I was thinking that might be the case, Knave said. Transfer manual control of navigation to me. Are you nuts? Altea asked. Knave took control of navigation and was immediately assailed by what seemed to be a sea of numbers, vectors and symbols, all exploding in his mind. He pulled his hands from the helm control and grabbed his head. It felt like he had hit it on a low metal ceiling. Youch! he grunted. What in the powers was that? That was the helm control interface, Yort told him. Your mind failed to, um, encompass it. 
I was never any good at encompassing, Knave groaned, holding his head. Can you simplify it a little, so it will fit in my noggin? Computing, Yort said. A simpler interface has now been designed. It will select for you as default. Thank you, Knave interrupted and forced his hands back down on the helm controls. He felt another flood of information, but this time it was manageable. A sphere appeared in his mind's eye, with the galaxy dog at the centre. The enemy were arrayed all around, and they were closing in. With the distance between the enemy spaceships closing all the time, the anomalous position of Cutlass was even more obvious. Knave could see an escape route. He stared at it and saw that the symbol for the galaxy dog was now moving toward it. I can feel you in my mind, Altia said. I can see what you see. More telepathy. More magic. I'm in here too, Jay said, and my guess would be a sophisticated neural network with non-local components. That's just a fancy way of saying magic, Altia said. I'm talking with you, but I'm not moving my mouth. This is magic. Whatever, Jay said. See these two spaceships? Two spaceships lit up in the tactical displays they all now had in their mind's eye. I see them, Altia said. It looks like they're trying to close our gap, Knave said. So, Jay said, we have to kill them before they do. Altia, you take the big one and I'll take the other one. No, Altia said. We should concentrate our fire, take out one ship at a time. Our shields are low and armour compromised. We have to reduce the fire we are taking as quickly as possible. OK, Jay said. Just start shooting. Knave watched the icons slowly dance, the galaxy dog nearing the gap while the enemy repositioned to close it. There were innumerable lines tracing from Galaxy Dog to one of the enemies, the target picked out by Altea, but there were many more coming the other way. Knave concentrated on some of the most worrying clumps of incoming missiles, and Galaxy Dog started to dance, trying its best to move its massive bulk out of the way of incoming fire, trying not to be at the positions likely selected by enemy targeting computers. We're taking less damage, Altea gasped. Thanks to my fancy flying, Knave whooped. Yes, Yort said. Your instincts are a valuable randomizing factor to add into our evasion routines. You must keep focused, keep concentrating on reaching your target location and evading enemy fire. No problem, Knave said. We'll do. The Cutlass wasn't even firing anymore, which was good because, if it had been, they might already have been dead. They were closing in on the gap, but there were still two adversaries firing from close range. The Galaxy Dog icon started flashing red. I'm not exactly sure what that means, Knave said, but I'm pretty sure it's not good. I can read those warning symbols, Altea said, and trust me, they're not. We are at vanishingly close range now, Altea said. I'm slaving the needle guns to the other weapons. And I'm going to open a window and throw my shoe at it, Jay said. Knave saw the enemy icon go red and start flashing. And as he watched it, the icon unpacked and he was treated to a camera view of the spaceship, splitting at the guts and losing armour like a lizard shedding its skin. The lights across the hull flickered and died, as did the guns. Our goal isn't to destroy it, just silence its guns, Altea said. Of course, Knave said. Nobody has anything against the poor souls on board. OK, Jay said. Switch targets to the other one. The impacts that had been exploding and detonating across the huge slabs of armour of the spaceship in the view screen stopped as the Galaxy Dog's guns moved on to new targets. The Tarazet Navy spaceship was left hanging in space, dark. Knave stared at it. Snap out of it, Altea yelled. We'll have your hull clear in a jiffy, Knave, and we're going to need you to fly through it. The other spaceship went dark, 
and Nave accelerated for the gap in the cordon that had been torn open. There was no need for fancy evasive flying anymore, just a straight run until they got the jump to warp travel calculated. Nave watched the cutlass as they left it behind. He wondered what had happened, a helm malfunction or engine problem perhaps, but then he saw it move towards its nearest neighbour. We're through the wall of spaceships, Altier yelled. Pedal to the metal, Nave, get us out of here. This was a bad idea, I'm so sorry, I really didn't believe Shavir would try to kill us. People, Jay muttered darkly. You live and learn, Nave said, and it was your shooting that extricated us from this trap. Some fancy shooting. The stars visible on the view screen were parallaxing so fast they looked like fireflies. Warp speed achieved, Yort said. How is the damage? Jay asked. The icon representing Galaxy Dog in their tactical display was still flashing red. Damage levels are critical, Yort said. We cannot survive another battle. We must find somewhere safe to effect repairs. Then let's go and find a place to hole up, Nave said. Yort, can you take over Helm? Just put as much distance as you can between us and any pursuers. Helm is now under my control, Yort said. They all three relaxed away from their stations, getting stiffly up from their acceleration couches. Nave was in the worst shape, almost stumbling as he descended from his platform but they were all beat up. Chase them, Shavir yelled. But there is a problem with the cutlass, the Admiral said. I don't care, Shavir said. We have to secure that spaceship. If there is even a chance that it drops out of warp, we have to be there to take it as our prize. It was severely damaged, the Admiral conceded. Then he turned to his second in command. Give the order, Commander. Pursue the target into warp space. The entire Tarazet fleet accelerated along the same vector as their target. If the spaceship maintained its top speed, they would surely lose it. But if it faltered, they would overhaul it and capture it. It seemed at first that the entire fleet had followed their prey, but, in fact, three spaceships had been left behind the Cutlass and the two dark spaceships. Shuttles emerged from Cutlass, searching the remains for survivors, and even non-survivors, as long as there was sufficient remaining of them. The Cutlass waited for their shuttles to return, and once the scavengers had finished picking clean the bones of the two wrecks, they returned to their mothership, and Cutlass then accelerated away at warp speed. The End